Hi guys, my name is Anil Kulkarni and welcome to this course Modern Python 101 Thinking and Types. Now, if you wanted to learn Python, if you are a complete beginner or if you have been struggling to learn Python for a time, then this course is for you. Let me share my journey of learning Python. It took me a pretty long time to understand Python rather many months or rather a couple of years to understand Python. And finally, when I started to learn more about Python, I could understand that I, I was struggling to learn Python because I was not able to think in types. You know, Python is a dynamically typed language. So sometimes you are at loss to understand what goes where and where we have to use a particular variable or a data type or a data structure. Also, one of the most confusing part was understanding classes and instances. I really struggled to understand what, what differentiates a class from an instance, what is the instance variable, and why do you need a class, basically. That was the most fundamental question that I was asking myself. And now I think I have the answer for that, that I'll be, that I'll be telling you inside the course. So this course is obviously designed for the people who are totally new to Python or if you have or if you are struggling to learn Python for a while now. Now throughout this course, I'll be taking you through a small journey. We will start by thinking in types and we will end in thinking in layers. So thinking is in layers is like an architectural pattern. I will I will help you to understand what goes behind creating a production level application. And at the end, we would be creating a very small and easy game called as Save Zorton. Now in this game, we are going to have a fight between the Avengers and Thanos. It's a very simple game, but it's going to be challenging for your brain. There are many, many concepts that we'll be covering throughout this game. And at the end of, the, of this course, you will really start appreciating the beauty of Python and how we can start uh, thinking in types and how we can differentiate between layers. You know, you have different layers such as your logic layer, the API, the private and the client. I will take you all of these things. And by the end of this course, you will be somewhat at a, um, I would not say an expert, but I would say somewhat better than a beginner and uh, towards an intermediate Python developer. And obviously, after this after this course, you need to do a lot of practice in order to polish your skills. But this course will help you to reach that level where you can start thinking on your own and develop your skills as a Python developer. Now, obviously, this course is entirely free and uh, I really hope to see you inside the course. That's it for me and I will see you in the next video. Bye. Hi and welcome to this course Modern Python 101. I'm so happy to see you inside this course. Before we can go ahead and write Python, we need to do a couple of things. The first thing is obviously we need to install Python and we also need to set up our development environment. But before that, I would like you to meet my friend Lewis. Now Lewis is going to help us throughout this course for learning Python. Before you can do anything else, I want you to go ahead and download all of the source code for this entire tutorial. What I want you to do is just go to this link github.com slash octalium slash modern python 101. And this is where you can find the entire source code for this entire tutorial. You can just click on code and just click on download zip to download all of the files in a zip format. Or if you are using GitHub, you can simply use this link to, to clone the repo. After you have downloaded all of the files, this is how it's going to look. So let me open up my readme and just let me open up in my preview mode. Okay, so this is how all of the files and the folders would look like. Now, please keep in mind that on my machine, I could have a couple of more additional folders just for the sake of helping me uh, throughout the tutorial. But overall, this is how it's going to look in your machine as well. At any point in the future, if you want to compare your code with mine, you can simply click on this folder. For example, if you just click on this folder type system, you can see there are a couple of files which I have already written. For example, just click on this file variables and you can see all of the code is right over here. 
If you want to see the sequence in which we are going to learn all of these files, then you can simply click on README and here you can find the sequence. For example, in this one, the first file would be your variables. The second one would be variable rules, which is right over here and so on. Well, that's it for this video. In the next video, we are going to download and install Python on your machine. Before installing Python, I thought it would be a very nice idea to give you a small tour of Python. For this, I want you to open up your favorite web browser and I want you to search for Python online compiler and uh, I want you to click on this link. This is for uh, repelit.com and as you can see, we have a working Python environment ready for us. So right on this line, I want to print out modern Python 101. So just replace hello world with modern Python 101 and just click on the run. So as you can see, we have the output of modern Python 101. Let's try one more simple example. And this time I want to print out my name and my name is Octalium. On this line, instead of printing modern Python, I want to print out my name. That's it. Just hit the run button one more time. And you can see we have the output of Octalium. As you can see, writing Python is as simple as writing your plain English. And from the next video, we will see how to install Python and how to set up our development environment. You can just go to the website python.org. From here, let me just uh, zoom in first. Okay. From here, just go to downloads. And uh, as you can see, since I'm using Mac OS, so, that, so that's why it's showing as Mac. If you're working on Windows, most probably it will show you on Windows. And at the time of recording, the latest version is 3.10.5. So I just want you to click on this and it will start the download. You just have to install Python just as you would install any other program. Just click on this. It will open up a installer dialog. So just click on continue, continue. Okay, agreement, I agree and uh, install. Now, since I already have Python installed, I won't be installing. But in your case, if you don't have Python installed, just go ahead and click install. After the installation is done, I want you to open up your terminal. If you're working on Windows, just make sure you open up your PowerShell. And uh, let me just try to zoom inside this as well. So once you have your terminal open, I want you to type Python hyphen and capital V. So as you can see, uh, it's showing the Python installed version. In my case, it is 3.10.5. Just make sure you have a version which is more than 3.10. 3.9 will not work because I will be showing you a couple of new features which have been introduced in the version 3.10. And if you're watching this video in the future, you don't have to worry because all of the functionality that I'm going to show in this tutorial, all of those things are going to work in the future as well. The next thing that I want you to do is install Visual Studio Code. So I want you to go to this website code.visualstudio.com and I want you to download Visual Studio Code and install it. So just click on this. Since I'm using a Mac, it's showing Mac. If you are using Windows, make sure uh, you click on the right button. So just click on this. It will again uh, download the installer and you just have to install Visual Studio Code as you would install any other program. After installing Visual Studio Code, I want you to open it up. So this is my Visual Studio Code. On the left, you can see there is a small bar and I want you to click on extensions. Let me take it up right over here. And I want you to search for Python. The first thing that pops out right over here, this is the Python extension by Microsoft. I want you to click on install. Now I do have a couple of more extra dependencies. Uh, these are optional, but I would highly recommend you to install all of those. So just open up your terminal. If you're working on Windows, open up your PowerShell. And uh, there's a command which is called as pip. 
now pip actually ships with python i want you to type pip install ipython mypy and black and just hit enter so these are a couple of extra dependencies that i would like you to install now since i have already installed it's showing me as uh, already satisfied but in your case it will go ahead and install all of the dependencies and that's it now we can start writing python code on our machine if you have some doubts then you can open up this readme file so this is the code that we downloaded from github so inside my folder number one introduction just click on readme and you can see i have provided the links for everything uh, there are a couple of more optional dependencies for example this one code runner uh, this one we would see in some of the future videos and uh, if you want to have the exact same theme like mine so you can use this theme i'm using a theme which is called as pitch black theme uh, now if you are working on a mac and if you have issues while typing this command so suppose you are you are typing python slash v and if you're not getting this output then just make sure to watch the next video where we would see how to rectify it sometimes on a mac you may not get the desired output suppose you are typing python slash and v if you're not getting this output then maybe you can try typing python 3 hyphen and v uh, now this is because mac already comes with a pre-installed python but most of the times it is not going to be the latest version you can use this syntax python 3 v all the time and if you want to use pip then also you need to type pip 3 and then you can say pip 3 i want to install my ipython mypy and black this is also going to work but typing python 3 and pip 3 all, all the while becomes slightly boring so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up an alias for setting up an alias. First thing that I want you to do is I want you to go to your home directory. You can go to your home directory by typing CD and that's it. Let me clear up my terminal by typing control and L. Now if you type LS dash AL, that means I want to list all of my files and folders inside my current directory. And I also want to see some of my hidden files as well. So as you can see, it's a pretty long list, but the file that I'm interested in is this one. It's called as .zshrc. That's the file where we will set up an alias. I want you to go ahead and open up that file inside your code editor. You can open up the same file inside Visual Studio Code by typing code followed by the name of the file don't forget to put the dot before and now just press enter if you're not able to open up this file from your terminal then inside your visual studio code i want you to type shift command and p that will open up a new window and i simply want you to type code and you can see the pop-up shell command install code command in the path i want you to click that and after clicking that you can simply close and open up your terminal once again and uh, let me just zoom inside and now you can say i want to open up my dot zshrc file inside my code editor just hit enter for now just ignore all of the stuff which i have inside my zshrc that's because I'm using a lot of fancy setup. The thing that I want you to add inside your ZSHRC are just these two lines. So what we are doing is we are just setting up an alias. That means whenever we are typing Python inside our terminal, at that time, we actually mean to type Python 3. And the same thing goes with pip. Whenever we are typing pip, I want my system to invoke pip3 instead. So this is what our alias is going to do. Just save your zshrc file. Again, go back to your terminal. I again want you to close and open up your terminal one more time. Again, let me zoom inside it. And now this time, if you're typing Python hyphen and V, 
it should give you the right output. Now that we have Python installed on our system, it's time to write our very first Hello World program. But before we can write our Hello World program, I would like you to create our very own directory structure so that we can organize all of the code in a much better way. So for that, I would like you to open up your, your finder or if you're on a Windows, just open up any window and navigate to, to the place where you want to create the folder so i'm just going inside my home directory and here i'm going to create a folder by the name of modern python 101 you can create this folder wherever you want after this i'm just going to open up my visual studio code and i'm going to drag this folder inside my visual studio code okay so here we are here I'm going to create one more folder and I'm going to name it as 01 introduction. Let me spell it right. And inside this folder, let's create our very first Python program. So let's create a file inside of this. And I want you to name the file as hello world.py. Always make sure that we have the extension as .py. So .py stands for a Python file. And right now what we are going to do is we are simply going to print hello world to our terminal. A couple of lectures ago, we have seen how to do it online by using a Python online compiler. But in this video, let's try to do it on our local machine. Let me just collapse my sidebar. The first thing that I want you to write here is an inbuilt function by the name of print. So basically what we are trying to do is we want to tell Python, hey Python, I want you to print hello world and that's it. Now I want you to open up your terminal and uh, inside this terminal, let, let us see how we can uh, execute this file. I'm inside my directory of modern Python 101. From here, I want to go to my newly created folder 01 introduction. And once inside this folder, I can simply run my file by typing Python followed by the name of the file and just press enter. And here you can see we have the right output of hello world. If you want to change this from hello world to hello Octalium, let's do it. Let us save the file. Again, go back to the terminal let me clear up my terminal. Let us try running the file by typing Python followed by the file name one more time. And we have the desired output of hello Octalium. Now typing Python and hello world.py all the time becomes a little boring. In order to automate this task, we are going to install one more extension. And uh, this time the name of the extension is called as code runner. So I want you to go to your extensions tab and I want you to search for code runner. This is the plugin. Make sure you install this plugin. Once we have this plugin in place, we can simply run the file. I'll just show you how to do it. Let me close my terminal. Let me close all of this. So once we have the plugin installed, you can simply click on this play icon right over here and that's going to execute your file. So as you can see, the code runner extension actually executed my file and I have the output of hello world on the screen. So this video was just to give you a small feel of writing Python on our local machine. From the next videos, Python is going to get much more interesting and we will start to learn all of the basic fundamentals of Python. Now let's actually start learning Python. And the first concept that we are going to learn in Python is all about understanding variables. But before we can understand variables, we need to go on a picnic with Lewis. Yes, let's go on a picnic and then let's see what variables is all about. So Lewis is planning for a picnic and he is going to pack a slice of pizza in his Tupperware. You don't want to go hungry on a picnic, do you? Lewis also wants to pack some of his clothes inside a bag and also a bottle of water. Now let's try to visualize this concept a little more technically. So you can imagine your Tupperware bag and bottles to be your containers. And what these containers are going to hold is this slice of pizza, clothes and water. 
So you can imagine all of these things to be values. So the containers are going to hold all of the values. Now let's try to see all of these things in the world of Python. So here we have three containers, Tupperware, bag and bottle. And we have three values, slice of pizza, clothes and water. So essentially what's happening is your containers are just like your variables because your variables are going to hold some data. You can translate this concept in Python by typing like this. On the left, you can see Tupperware is a variable and the variable of Tupperware is holding a value of slice of pizzas. This equal to is also called as the assignment operator. That means we are assigning the value on the right to the variable on the left. And the same thing goes with bag and bottle as well. Now it's time for us to create some more variables. So I'm inside my folder number two, type system. So this is the code that we downloaded from GitHub. And this is the folder that we created. Remember we've created a folder called as Modern Python 101. So this is where I am. Here I want to create one more folder and I'm going to name it as 02 type system. And inside of this, I want you to create one more file by the name of variables.py. And this is where we are going to create some of our variables. Here is the scenario. Lewis wants to go for a party and he has three items with him. He has balloons, he has some crackers and he has some hats, but he has only a single box. So let's see what he's going to do. Let's create a variable called as box. Here we are going to create our variable called as box and let us assign the value of balloons to the variable of box. Please remember to put this inverted commas because this is the value that has been assigned to our variable of box. On the next line, we simply want to print out our variable. So as you already know, we can simply say, hey Python, I want you to print out my variable and the name of my variable is box. That's it. Just save a file and let's try to run the file. Now there are two ways of running the file. If we have code runner installed, you can simply click on this and this is going to run your file. And here you can see we have the output of balloons or you can also run the file from a terminal. In order to run the file from the terminal, first we need to go inside the right folder. As you can see right now, I am inside the folder modern python 101 and I need to navigate inside my folder, which is 02 type system. Once inside this folder, you can run the file by typing python followed by the name of the file. In my case, the name of the file is simply variables.py and hit enter. So as you can see, we have the output of balloons. Let me put up a small comment right over here. All of these lines that you can see over here, which starts with a hash sign, this actually means a comment. And these lines are actually going to be ignored by Python while executing your file. Now just suppose Lewis wants to take crackers instead of balloons. So let's see how we can reassign the value to our variable. Let me put up a comment. And here we can simply reassign by saying that for the variable of box, I want to reassign the value to a new one and the new value is going to be called as crackers. Let me get the spelling right and we can again try to print it out. So let's try to print out the box one more time. Let me run the file and here we have the output. So you can see the first output is balloon and this output is coming from, uh, from right over here from line number seven. And on the next line, I have the output of crackers. This output is coming from this line, line number 11. At line number 11, the variable of box no longer holds the value of balloons because we have reassigned the value on our line number 10. The new value that the variable of box holds right now is just crackers. Now for the last time, if Lewis wants to change his mind and this time he wants to take hats so let's see how we can reassign the value for the last time. Let me put up some comments before we can do that. So for the last time, we are going to reassign the value of box. And this time the new value is going to be hats. 
and as usual we simply want to print out the value inside our variable so we can say hey python i want you to print my variable of box that's it just save your file and try to run it for the last time so as you can see we have the output of hats and uh, sorry we can see the output of hats now this output is coming from our line number 15 the current value that our variable of box is holding is hats the previous values of crackers and balloons all of these values are now replaced and the only existing value inside the box variable is hats till now we have seen how to work and create variables now let's have a look at what's happening behind the scenes so this were the variables that we created last time we created just one variable called as box but we assign the value of balloons crackers and hats to the same variable now let's see what's happening behind the scene and how python is treating all of these variables just imagine this is the memory of your pc and let's see now how python is going to handle your variables in practical terms how python handles the memory would be very different in a practical scenario but right now, just have a look at this. I have simplified things so that it's much more easy for us to understand. So just imagine all of the green area is the memory of your PC. Now let's see what's happening. Python would read all of your source code. And as soon as it comes across this line, box is equal to balloons. What Python is going to do is, Python is going to create a variable called as box inside the memory. And Python would look at the right hand side and it's going to find balloons so it's going to assign the value of balloons to the box and all of these things are happening inside the memory so on the next line when you are trying to print out box you get the output as balloons but what happens when python goes to the next line that is this one where you are reassigning the value of box to crackers at that time the value of balloons is actually taken out and a new value of crackers is being assigned to the box. So after your line number six, this is how your box is actually going to look like. So box is going to hold just the value of crackers. That's why on line number seven, when we are trying to print out the value of box, we get the value of crackers. Now the same thing is going to continue on the next line as well. When Python comes across this line, box is equal to hats, it's going to remove the value of crackers inside the memory and it's going to assign a new value of hats and box would be equal to hats inside the memory and that's the output that we're getting from line number 10. Till now we have a much better understanding of variables and this time we are going to see what you don't have to do while creating a variable. You can't just arbitrarily name your variable. There are certain rules for declaring your variables and that is what I'm going to talk in this video. This is the code from GitHub and I want you to click on this file variable rules. I don't want you to waste your time just watching me type. So I'm just going to copy this file from my GitHub folder to my modern Python 101 folder. And let me just paste it right inside my 02 type system. So here is the file. And now let me try to explain what's happening. The first thing that we are going to talk is something about declaration styles there are different styles in which you can declare a variable the first style that you can see over here this is called as camel case the first alphabet would be in small case and the next words would start with the alphabet so this is called as camel case the next is your pascal case in pascal case as you can see all of the words they would start with the capital alphabet the next one, as you can see right over here, on line number 11, this is called as snake case. On line number 12, this is also a variable, but this is used to declare a constant. I'll be talking about constants in the future. This is also a valid variable. And normally you would use the syntax with an underscore whenever you want to declare a private variable. I'll be explaining what is a private variable as well in the future. This is also a valid variable where you can have a number at the back and you can mix your numbers with your snake case or your camel case or pascal case or any other case that you want. 
So till now, what I've done is I have declared a couple of variables and let's try to print them out and see how they look on our terminal. Let me just run the file and uh, oh, let me first try and clear my terminal. Now let me go back to the file and let me run it once again. So here we can see we can use different variable styles to get our output. Now let's have a look at the different rules for not declaring a variable. As you can see on line number 29, you cannot declare a variable which starts with the number. If I just uncomment this file, it's going to show me an error. Similarly on line number 30, let me just comment this back. So similarly on 30, if we have a hyphen, it's not going to work. If we have some special characters like a comma, it's not going to work. If you use a dollar sign at the front, it's also not going to work. And if your variables has a space in between, so that too is not going to work. So whenever you are creating or declaring variables, always keep these things in mind. When it comes to your style, you just have to be consistent in whatever style that you are choosing. As a normal convention, whenever we want to declare any variables or the name of the functions, we would use snake case. But that's just the convention, it's not required. And whenever you want to declare the name of a class, at that time we would be using the Pascal case. And whenever we want to declare a constant, at that time we would use everything in uppercase. Now we have been making very good progress with our variables. We have seen how to assign values to our variables. But we have seen how to assign only a single type of value to our variables. We can see over here balloons, crackers and hats. All of these data types are called as strings. So whenever you are working with your Python programming, you always have to work with some sort of a data. And this data can be classified into different categories. The first category that we are going to see is something called as a primitive data type. So what do I mean by a primitive data type? It simply means that these data types are already present inside Python. The first data type we have already worked with, it's called as a string. And you can see it's always inside a quote. For declaring a string, you can use double quotes or you can use a single quote. Both of them are valid syntax. The next one is called as an integer. So you can see we have whole numbers. So 45 is a kind of integer. The next one would be a float. Whenever you have some decimal places, it's called as a float inside Python. And the last one is called as a Boolean. Boolean can have only two types. Either it can be true or it can be a false. Now let's go back to our code editor and create some of this basic primitive data types. So let's create a new file inside my folder 02 type system. I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to name it as primitive data types dot py. Let me add some comments as well. Now let's start creating our variables. First, let us create a variable for holding our string and uh, I'm going to call it as my string. That's it. So my string is my variable and it's going to hold the value of Lewis. Let me spell it right. The next variable would be my integer, my int. For short, it's going to be 45. Next one would be my float. It would be 3.14. The next one would be my bool. It stands for my Boolean data. And this time I am going to assign it the value of true. Make sure you always use the T with a capital T. And that's it. We have declared our variables and we have assigned the variables with the primitive data types. Now let's try to print one by one. So I want to say first I want to print my, my string. Let me just copy and paste it now. The next thing that I want to print would be my integer. Next, let me print out my float. And the last, I want to print out my Boolean value. Just save the file and let me run the file inside my terminal. And here we have the output. Lewis 45, 3.14 and true. The last thing that I want to discuss in this video is about your styling. For example, you can see right over here, 
single quotes is also a valid string and if you use double quotes it's also a valid string so which style should you use basically you can use any style but you have to make sure that you are consistent throughout your code base in order to avoid such situations when you're working in a large team the python community has come up with some of the style formatters and one of the style formatter is called as black so if you remember at the beginning we have installed a couple of optional dependencies and one of the dependency was called as black if you have not installed then you can simply open up the terminal let me clear all of this and you can install the dependency by simply typing pip install and black and this will install the optional dependency black is a code formatter and we are going to use black to format our code so that it is consistent throughout the first thing that i want you to do is i want you to open up the settings for visual studio code on a Mac, you can do that by typing command and a comma. I think on a Windows, it should be control and a comma. So this is my settings file and I want you to type save. And the first option that I can see over here is called as format on save. I want you to select this. Now again, go back, search for black. So here you can see the first option, Python formatting black path make sure you have black right over here and that's it just close your settings file and uh, let me save this file it's saying that format auto pape is not installed install no i don't want to use that one i want to use black so i'm just going to click on this one use black and that's it now if i come back to this and if i put a single quotes now just watch what happens when I save my file. It automatically formats from a single quote to a double quote. Black is a really useful utility and we would be using black so that all of our styling is similar. Since we know a little bit more about strings, let's try and see how we can output the string in our desired format. This is also called as string formatting. Let me create a new file inside my folder and I'm going to name the file as stringformatting.py. Let me put up a comment at the top. What I want to show in this video is how we can have a desired string output. Don't worry if the concept sounds a little strange, it will get cleared in just a couple of seconds. Suppose I want to print a statement saying that hello and followed by a variable and that variable can hold a name. For example, you can say hello Lewis or you can say hello Chico or some other name. So let me first create a variable called as name and let me assign it a value of Lewis. Now let's see how to format this string and get an output as hello Lewis. Let me collapse my sidebar and here I can say print and I can put my quotes. But before my quotes, I need to add one more alphabet called as F. That means I want to have a formatted string. And here I can say hello. And I want to print the name over here. So I'm going to use curly brackets. And inside the curly brackets, I can place my variable so I can say name. Let's save the file and try to run it. And here we have we have the output as hello Lewis. There is one more format of doing this. We can simply say print and then we can say hello. You can put a comma followed by the variable that you want to print. So I can say name. Just save a file and let me run it one more time. So as you can see, we have the same output. But normally you will see me using a formatted string. So let me just take out the second example. I'm not going to use this kind of syntax. Now let's see how we can output a string saying that Lewis is dash and dash years old and dash and dash has to be filled by a variable. So I can create a variable called as age and I can say age is 13 and here I want to print Lewis is 13 years old. So I can use a print statement. Again, I'm going to use a formatted string. So F and quotes. Then inside my curly brackets, the first 
variable that I want to print is the name. So name goes over here. So Lewis is then I, I want to place the age right over here is 13 years old. That's it. Just save your file and try to run it one more time. And we have the output Lewis is 13 years old. Let's do a couple of more practice over here. Suppose Lewis has a dog and then let me spell it right. And the name of the dog is Chico. And this time we want to print out Lewis has a dog named Chico. So you can say print again your formatted string, your curly brackets, your placeholder for your name. So Lewis has a dog named and the dog variable goes right over here and that's it let us try to run the file and we have the output lewis has a dog named chico let's do it for the last time suppose lewis also has a cat and the name of the cat is coco so let me copy and paste this line and i can say lewis has a cat name and the variable of cat will go right over here let me save the file and let me run it for the last time and here we have the output lewis has a cat named coco we are making really good progress but this time i want to make a program that would have a bug inside it so let me create a file inside my folder and i'm going to name the file as my first bug.py bug actually means that we have some sort of an undesired behavior in our program so let me put up some comments okay now let's get started with this one let's create a variable called as box and let's assign the value of balloons to it and let me print out a formatted statement saying that box contains and the variable of box goes right over here let me just run this file and we have the output that the box contains balloons now just watch closely what happens i can also say box is equal to 10. now this really doesn't make any sense why would i want to store 10 inside balloons balloons is a string 10 is an integer but if you try to print this, we are going to get an output. Let me copy and paste this line from here. Just blow this. Let me save it and let me try to run the program. And we have the output box contains 10. And this is because Python is a dynamically typed language. And this was the point where I really struggled when I was learning Python. But you don't have to worry about this. You can easily solve this problem by thinking in types. In this video, I'm going to introduce to you a concept which is called as type hinting. Let me put up a comment. So what type hinting really means is we always want to associate a type with our variables. And this will really help us to create robust programs and to take care of all of the bugs before we can actually run the program. Now let's start thinking in types. Let's create a variable called as food and let us assign it a value of milk now i want to tell python that food should always contain the value of a string it cannot contain any other value and the way to do it is by using a type hint you can write a type hint right over here let me take it a little up you can add a type hint right over here so after the name of the variable just put a colon then we can say this variable has to be of the type of a string and just you can write str so str means food variable is of the type of a string and that's it and let us print out a statement saying that let us do a formatted string you can say lewis is going to drink and inside the curly brackets we can say food and uh, just save it and run your file and we have the output Lewis is going to drink milk. We can reassign the variable food from milk to eggs. And then we can say 
Lewis is going to eat. Let me save the file and let me try to run it. And we have the output Lewis is going to eat eggs. Now this time if I say food is equal to false. Let me just copy and paste this line. So let me just paste it right over here. Save the file and let me run it for the last time. But what's this? We still have the output. It's saying that Lewis is going to eat false. False doesn't make any sense over here. So this is what we call as a bug. This is an undesired behavior. We don't want to assign false to our food. The way to take care of this is by using one more plugin which is called as MyPy. First thing, we need to install MyPy. I hope you installed MyPy in the beginning where I was discussing about the optional dependencies. If not, you can just open up your terminal. Let me clear all of this. And you can install MyPy by saying pip install follow, followed by MyPy. And that's it. After installing MyPy, I want you to open up the settings. Again, you can open up the settings by, by pressing command and comma on a Mac. It should be control and comma on Windows. And here I want you to type MyPy. And I want you to click on this Python linting MyPy enabled. Just click on this one. And that's it. Now you can see the code editor is highlighting false and it's saying that we have some sort of an issue over here. If you just hover over false, it's going to say incompatible types in assignment. Expression has type bool, variable has type string. What it means is variable has the type of str. So if you refer the line number 20, we have assigned the type of string to our variable. That's what this error is trying to tell us. We have declared the variable as string, but in the expression, we are trying to assign it a value of boolean. That's why it's not going to work. Or rather, it's going to work because Python isn't dynamically typed language. But at least in your code editor, it's going to show you that something is wrong. So you can see on the top as well, it's showing an error right over here as well. But if you save the file and if you try to run the file one more time, it's going to execute. You can see we are executing our Python program. So this is the thing with Python. Python is a dynamically typed language and it's not going to enforce the data types on the runtime. That is why to prevent such kind of bugs, we are going to use MyPy and we are going to use type hinting everywhere. Let's try to do some more practice with our primitive data types. So let's create one more program right over here. And uh, let me create a file and the name of the file is just practice.py. Let me put up some comments as usual and let me collapse my sidebar. Now this, as you can see, triple quotes, these are also a valid comment. And normally you would use triple quotes whenever you want to write some kind of a documentation inside the string. But the thing about this triple quotes is you can also create strings and you can also do a string formatting by using triple quotes. We are going to see an example of this right in this video. Here is the situation. Lewis wants to open up a pizza shop and he needs to write a program for accepting orders. Now, this is a very important tip. Before you always start coding, first you always and always need to visualize. Now, let's just try to visualize our pizza shop and let us try to think what all variables we would require. The first and the most obvious is we would require a variable for customer. That's the place where we would save the customer data. The second variable could be a pizza base. Maybe you would like to have a thin base or a base filled with cheese or whatever you prefer. The next variable could be for storing the pizza size. Maybe it's like a 12 inch pizza or maybe it's like a 14 or a 16 inch pizza. So we would require a variable for storing the size as well. If it is a pizza, it also needs to have some kind of a topping. So we would need one more variable for topping, one more for cheese and one more for the price. So this is how you would first visualize the entire program and only after visualizing your program, you would start coding. 
I will come to this concept a little later in detail but right now let's get going and let's create some of the variables. Let us create the first variable called as customer. The type of the customer is going to be a string so let us try write str and the name of the customer would be cc. Let me put c as capital. The next variable would be for my pizza base so I can say my pizza base Again, the type is going to be string. This time I want to have a thin base. The next one would be for my pizza size. Now, I want my pizza size to be an integer. Suppose I want to eat a 12 inch pizza. So that's what this is going to indicate. The next one would be for my topping. Topping has to be a string. And I want to have some toppings of olives. The next one, let us create a boolean saying that extra cheese. And let us create the typing in. So the extra cheese variable is going to be of the type of bool. So the customer can say yes, they want false if they don't want. In case they want extra cheese, then we can say true. Otherwise, it's going to be false. The last one is going to be price. Now since price is going to contain decimal values, so we can say price is going to be a float. And we can say this is for $8.99. Just save it. And now let's try to print all of these values in our terminal. Let me put up one more comment over here. Now since this program is for accepting pizza orders, let's try to write print statements that would make some sense. So the first one I can say received order from followed by the name of the customer. Let me save it. The next line we can print some of the pizza details. So we can say print again for the formatted string and then we can say the pizza base would be the pizza base then we can say size is going to be pizza size in inches followed by toppings and I can write toppings over here save this now let us try to print if the customer wants extra cheese or not so we can again say is extra cheese required and let us put the value right over here extra cheese and the last thing we want to print is going to be the price so we can say bill amount is going to be the price so I can put the price right over here let me run the program and here we have the output received order from CC. Let me take this a little down and and now we can start comparing. So you can see we have declared the name of the customer as CC. That's what we have right over here. The base of the pizza is thin. So thin is what we want. The size is 12 and the topping is olives. Do we require extra cheese? Yes, we require and the total amount is $8.99. Let us have a look at one more alternative syntax of using formatted string. Let me put up a comment right over here. Now this time I am going to construct an entire string which will hold all of these values. In order to save all of this data, let me create a new variable by the name of order details is going to be of the type of string. And now this is the interesting part. We can create a formatted string outside the print statement as well. So I can say F and I can put my comma right over here. But I'm going to use triple quotes because I want to create my string which is going to be in multiple lines. So if you just compare your output, you can see we have multiple lines. On the first line we have the statement for received order, the next line has uh, the pizza details and so on. 
So I want my string to be multi-line. That's the reason why I'm using triple quotes right over here. Now between these triple quotes, let's start adding our values. Now this is pretty simple. I just have to copy from above. Let me just paste this inside. The same thing for this as well. Please note that I'm not copying the inverted commas because I already have them outside. Let me put this line, this one as well, and this as well. So what we have essentially done from line number 34 to line number 39 is we have created an entire string and we have saved that string to a variable and the name of the variable is called as order details. On the next line, we can simply print out the order details. So we can say simply print my order details. And that's it. Let's try to run this file. And we have the output. Let me just comment all of this for a moment so that the output is much more clear. Let me clear my terminal. Again, go back and let me try to run the file. So now you can see our formatted string is also working. Let us have a look at one more very simple alternative. We just saw that we can create a multi-line string by using triple quotes and assign that string to a variable. But let us ask the question, do we really require a variable? Maybe not. We can simply print out the entire statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm just copying all of this formatted string. Let me copy all of this. Let me go down. Let me write print. And inside my print function, I'm just going to paste everything as it is. That's it. Let me just save the file and let me run it. And as you can see, we have the desired output. You can use any of the string formatting style. There is no right and wrong method in this one. Welcome to a new section. This section is all about decisions, decisions and more decisions. And we are going to learn how to take decisions by the use of flow control mechanisms. That means there are multiple flow control statements such as if and else, while, while and do and some other statements. So we will have a look at all of these control flow statements. First thing that I want you to do is go back to your code editor and let's create a new folder right over here. Let me name it as 03 flow control. And uh, the first file that I'm going to create over here is called as driving license.py. Let me put up a comment as usual. Now let's see what's happening. Lewis wants to drive a car and he wants to know if he can apply for a driving license or not. So first let me declare a variable called as age is going to be of the type of integer and let me assign a value of 30 into it. The first flow control statement that I am going to introduce in this video is the if and else statement. Suppose the legal driving age in your country is 16. So right now we can create a very simple if and else blocks. We can say if the age is less than 16. In that scenario, I want to print out you are not eligible for a license. But what happens if you are more than 16? In that case, you are eligible for license. So on the next line, we can simply say else. So that means you are actually more than 16 years old. And let me copy and paste it right over here. Here I can say you are eligible for a license. Let's have a look at what's exactly happening. Python is going to read your file from top to the bottom. On line number six, it is going to create a new variable called as age and it is going to assign the value of 13 to it. 
when python comes to line number 12 it's going to try to evaluate this statement right over here let's see what's happening in the statement my age is 13 13 is less than 16 so this condition on line number 12 is true and since this condition is true python is going to print whatever which is inside the if block you can see the line number 13 is indented towards the right so this is a tab space so that means this line belongs to the if blog. So Python is simply going to print out you are not eligible for a license. And after printing this blog, Python is actually going to skip the else part because it's not the case with us. And Python will go to line number 16 where it will exit from the program. Let me just save the file and let me try to run it. So as you can see, we have the output, you are not eligible for a license. Now let's try to imagine what happens after a couple of years. So after a couple of years, the age would be 19. Now let me copy and paste the exact same flow control statement and let me put it right over here. Let me save it and let me try to run the file. So the second time we get the output, you are eligible for a license. And this is the case because on line number 21, you can see now Lewis is 19 years old. Let's go back to our code. One thing that I want you to understand is it's not necessary to have an else block. We can simply write an if block. So let me put up a comment and let me just copy and paste this block right over here let me comment this let me comment all of this so the only thing we have in our file right now is this variable age which we declared as 13 on line number 6 and we reassign the value on line number 21 and we have this if and else block now i am going to take out the else block and I'm going to left indent this line. So that means we don't have an else block in this condition. This is just the if block and this is the next line. Let's see what's happening. Let me save the file and try to run the file one more time. Ah, so in this case, I'm getting the output. You are eligible for a license. Now let's see what's exactly happening. When Python comes to this line, line number 32, it's again going to evaluate this statement. In our case, the age is 19. So 19 is not less than 16. And since this condition will evaluate to false, Python is going to skip the if block. And since we are going to skip the if block, Python is not going to print this line. It will simply move to the next line. On the next line that is on line number 35, we are simply going to print out you are eligible for a license and that's what we get on our terminal you can check the terminal one more time let me let me clear up all of these things let me run the file one more time and that's it you have the output of you are eligible for a license you can also chain multiple if and else blocks let me show you an example for that now suppose after too many years, Lewis is 100 years old. Let me just go and copy the code from above. So let me just copy this one and put it right over here. And let me uncomment all of this. Here we can start chaining our if and else blocks. So on the next line, I can say else and if. In Python, we write it as E L I F that means else and if so the next condition that I want to check is my age greater than 100 in that case I want to print out you are too old to get a license let me comment this one now let me try to run the file oh but what is this we are getting an output saying that you are eligible for a license but that's not what we want we want to print out you are too old to get a license and we have a small bug 
and that bug is exactly on line number 45. We are saying that if the age is greater than 100, but right now our age is 100. So in order to make this statement true, we have to say if the age is more than or equal to 100. Now let's save it and let us try to run the file one more time. And this time we have a proper output saying that you are too old to get a license. Till now we have seen very simple if and else blocks. Let's try to expand our knowledge. And this time let me create a new file by the name of alienlicense.py. Here is the situation. Lewis desperately wants to drive a car and he hears that in a planet called as Zorton, there is no age limit for getting a license. So let's see how we can address this situation. Let us create a couple of variables. The first one would be for age of the type of integer, age is 13. The next one for a planet, planet, the type would be string. And let me assign it to Earth initially. Let me introduce to you a little more complex statements by using AND and OR statements. So let's start writing our compound if and else blocks along with AND and OR. The first case would be if the age is less than 16 and the planet is Earth. In that case, I simply want to print out that you are not eligible for a license on earth here you can see i have double equal to that simply means that this is a comparison operator we are just trying to compare if the value inside the variable planet is equal to earth or not now let's move on to the next block for the else statement here we can say else if the age is greater than 16 and if the planet is again Earth, in that case, I want to print out that you are eligible for a license on Earth. But what happens if both of these values are false? What happens if the planet is Zorton? Or what happens if the age is less than 16, but you are trying to apply for a license on Zorton? Let's try to create one more condition over here. Let us write an if and else block right over here. So we can say else if, if the age is less than 16 and if the planet is Zorton. In that case, I want to print out, you can apply for a Zortonian license because it's valid in the planet Zorton. Let me save the file and let me try running it and let us see what output we are getting. So I'm getting the output that you are not eligible for a license on Earth. So let's get back to the code and let us evaluate what's exactly happening. Let us begin with evaluating all of the if and else block. Let's start with this one on line number 13. Let me put up a comment over here. So this is how the evaluation is taking place. Python is going to compare, is the age less than 16? Yes, my age is 13, 13 is less than 16. So the first statement is going to evaluate to true. So that comes right over here. The next operator that we have is and, so and comes right over here. Now Python will go to the last statement. It's going to compare, is planet equal to Earth? So as you can see on land number seven, we have assigned the value of earth to planet. Hence, this statement also evaluates to true. Earth is equal to earth. So that's why we have a true over here. And since we have two trues, this entire statement on land number 13 evaluates to true. So we can print out you are not eligible for a license on earth. And right after this, let me put up one more comment just to explain what's happening. And since this if statement on line number 13 evaluates to true, the execution is going to stop right at this point. Python is not going to go to the next else and if block. Python will directly jump to line number 22 and it will exit from our program. 
so that's what is exactly happening so let me put up some more comments right over here execution does not reach over here the same thing for this one as well let's do a small exercise on line number 14 we have tried to evaluate the statement let us try to evaluate the statements on line number 18 and line number 21 as well let me put up a comment right over here now let's try to evaluate this statement my current age is 13 as you can see on line number 6 we have assigned the age as 13 so the first statement age is 13 13 is greater than 16 no it's not so we have false right over here the next operator is and so and comes right over here the next statement is planet equal to earth yes my planet is equal to earth so we have a true but in this case we have one false and one true so this statement is going to evaluate to false let's see what's happening on line number 22 let me put up a comment right over here as well so as you can see the age is 13 13 is less than 16 so we have a true condition over here now the planet the planet currently is earth and earth is not equal to zotan so we have false over here one true and one false is always going to give you a false statement we can actually try to improve our logic at this time by introducing an or statement remember in zotan even if you are less than 16 you are still eligible for a license so we don't have to check this condition at all we can simply say if you are age 16 or if the planet is zotan in that case you can apply for a zotanian license in this case the evaluation would be different my age is less than 16 it's true and right here instead of and we have an or condition the next is planet is equal to zotan so that's again going to be false true or false now this time whenever we have an or condition and we have one true and one false it's always going to evaluate to true since we have an or statement the true wins over the false but since the first block is executing we are not going to execute this block and just for your reference let me put all of the and and or tables right over here so these are all of the and and or scenarios but you can do much better if you are in confusion just open up your terminal and i want you to open up the ipython shell remember we have installed ipython at the beginning of the series if you have not installed you can simply install by typing pip install ipython what happens is python actually comes with a shell you can simply type python this takes you inside a python shell and here you can start writing python commands for example i can say 1 plus 2 and i get the output of 3 you can exit this shell by typing Control and D. Now IPython is a slightly better version of this and it's slightly more interactive, so I prefer to use IPython shell. Just type IPython and go inside the shell. Let me clear up the terminal. And whenever you are confused what statement evaluates to what, you can simply type right over here. Here you can type what happens if I have one condition which is true and the next condition which is also a true we get a true but what happens if i have one true and one false condition we have a false what happens if i have one true or false then also we get a true what happens if i have a false and also a false we get a false let us try to evaluate one last condition what happens if i have a false and false in that case it also evaluates to false so you can always come back to this ipython shell and see how the statements are being evaluated now suppose lewis migrates to zotan 
then let's see what's happening let me put up a command now lewis is no longer staying on earth he's staying in zorton let me copy and paste all of this and put it right over here i'm not going to change any of the logic let me just run the file as usual and let us see what output we are getting oh first i need to exit this you can exit this by pressing ctrl and d yes i want to exit let me clear up my terminal go back to the file let me save it one more time and let me try running it it looks like we have a small bug and i exactly know what we did wrong at this point we did not reassign the value of planet to zorton that's what we need to do so we can say my planet now is zorton that's it just save your file and let us try to run the file one more time now we have the desired output you can apply for a zortonian license now let's try to see how the statements are being evaluated so let's see what's happening on line number 48 this statement planet equal to earth this time it's going to evaluate as false true and false is going to evaluate to a false and so we are not going to execute this block let's go to the new block age is greater than 16 no it's false planet equal to earth no it's false because we are staying in zorton false and false we have a false so python will go to the last condition age is less than 16 true planet equal to zorton yeah it's also true true or a true equals to true and that's the reason why we have this output as you can apply for a zortinian license let's try to see the next concept in the flow control mechanism and this time i'm going to introduce you a new concept which is called as looping we can iterate over things that is called as looping and we can iterate by using a for loop let me create a new file as usual and let me show what i'm talking about here i am going to create a new file and i am going to name it as print my name dot pi and let me put up a comment so this is the situation this time now since lewis is staying in zorton he has to do things in a zortonian way in zorton they don't print your name on a single line they want to print each and every character of your name on a different line so let's see how we can do that First, let me create a variable for name and let me assign the type as string. The name is Lewis. And this time, let me introduce you one more concept, which is called as the for loop. And we are going to use the for loop to iterate over all of the characters in Lewis. Iterate simply means that we want to go from one alphabet to another throughout this string. Creating a for loop is very simple. We can simply say for character inside my name. I simply want to print out the character. Let me put up a comment right over here. So on each iteration, we are just going to print a character. Let me save the file and let me try running it. Here we have the output. We have each and every character on a new line and we are doing this by using a very simple for loop now let's see what's happening inside each of the iteration here we are saying for character in name first time the character is l you can see right over here we get the output of l right over here as well the next character is o u i n s so on each iteration we are printing a single character on new line let's try to move on and learn one more concept for flow control mechanisms this time i'm going to show you the while loop for this as usual let me create a new file and let me name it as guessplanet.py and this time this is the situation now since louis has migrated to zorton his friends from earth they are a little curious to know where he is so louis decides to write a program that will make his friends guess the name of the planet 
For this simple program, I am going to create three variables. First variable would be as a boolean, so I can say correct guess. This would be an boolean. Initially, let me assign it the value of false. The next boolean for guess. So this is the place where we would be storing all of the guesses that his friends are going to make. Initially, it's simply going to be a blank string and that's it. The next one for the planet. So I can say planet of the type of string. This is going to be Zorton. Let us have a look at the first alternative. The first thing that we want to do right over here is we want to create a loop and we want his friends to keep on guessing till the time they get the planet right. First, let us see how we can get the input from his friends. The way to get an input is by using another inbuilt function by the name of input. So we can say input and I can write a prompt over here. Lewis says that can you guess my planet and I want to save the input inside my variable of guess. So I'm just going to the left. The input has to be saved inside my variable of guess. So my guess comes towards the left. Let me save this and let us try to run this and see what's happening. Let me also print out the guess on the next line. Now let's try to run this file and see what's happening. So as you can see, I'm getting the prompt. Lewis says, can you guess my planet? Let me write as Mars and we have the output. Now this output of Mars is coming from this line, from line number 15. If you are having some issues while running this file from the code runner, then what you can do is I want you to open up your settings. Let me collapse my terminal. Here I want you to write code runner. And let us scroll a little down. I want you to go a little more down and I want you to check this option run in terminal. So make sure that this option is checked or what you can do is you can simply use the Python command. Let's try to navigate inside the folder. Now this time the folder was 03. So you can go inside this folder and you can say, Hey Python, I want you to run my program, which is called as guest planet. And we have the prompt and this time it can be Pluto and we have the output of Pluto. Let's get back to our program. Here we can create our if and else block. So we can say if the guess is equal to my current planet, then I want to print out right guess Lewis is at Zorton. Else we can say that I want to print out Lewis says it's a wrong choice. I want you to try again. Let me save this and let us try to run this one more time. Suppose my planet is Mercury and we get the output. Lewis says wrong choice. Try again. Let me clear up my terminal and let me try this program one more time. This time I am going to write as Zorton. What's this? We still have the output saying that it's a wrong choice, but that's not the case. We have written Zorton. The issue is this, that we have written Zorton with a Z, which is in the small case, but we have saved planet with a Z, which is in the upper case. The point that I want to convey is all of the strings are going to be case sensitive inside Python. Your uppercase Z is not equal to your lowercase Z. Let us see how we can handle this situation. We can go back to our if block right here and we can actually convert from capital Z to a lower Z. In fact, we are going to convert the entire string to a lowercase string and you can do that by using an inbuilt function. Now this function works only with strings and since we have two strings, guess and planet, we can use that function right over here. So we can simply say guess, I simply want to lower it. 
and after this i want you to put brackets so this means i want to invoke the function of lua i will come to functions a little future in the series but right now just go with the flow so what this statement is doing is it's going to take the guess and it is going to convert it from whatever case it may be to an lower case we want to do the same thing for planet as well so here we can say lower along with the brackets just save it and now let's try running this file let me write zotten with a smaller case z and this time we have the output right guess lewis is at zotten now let's try to improve the logic even more we don't want to exit this program we want to ask his friends to keep on guessing till the time they get the guess right and we can do this by wrapping all of our logic inside a while block so let's see how to do that on line number 16 let me make some space and uh, here i can say while my correct guess is not true so that means till the time we don't get a correct guess i simply want to keep on looping so let me put a colon over here and after this i want to indent all of this if and else blocks one tab space inside so now if and else blocks belong to the while loop let me save it and let me try to run the file but we have a small bug let me run the file first and then you will understand what's wrong with it so here it goes it's asking me for the name of the planet i am writing mars so what this it's keep on looping something's wrong with our program let me stop it by pressing control and c the issue is we are just keeping on looping the first thing python will go on line number 18 it's going to see is my mars equal to my zotten it's not so it will go to the next line it says that lewis says wrong choice try again so this is what we are getting and since our while condition is not true as you can see on line number 6 do we have a correct guess false and that's the reason why python will again go back to line number 18 it's going to see mars is equal to zotten no so it's again going to go on the line number 21 and print out lewis says wrong choice try again the way to come out of this while loop is we need to have a circuit breaking mechanism that's why i have created this variable called as correct guess so right over here after line number 19 since we have a correct guess this time let us reassign the value of correct guess to true now let's try running this file oh let me clear up my terminal now let's try the file one more time so it's saying that can you guess my planet let me say as mars oh no we again have a issue let's see what's wrong this time now the issue is we are not asking for a new input after we get a wrong guess that's why we never have a correct guess in order to correct this let me take this line let me cut it out and i want to paste it right over here let me indent so we have a proper variable we don't require this print statement now let me take it out and let us see if we can have a running program let me put the input as pluto is saying wrong choice now this time it is again asking me for an input and is actually waiting for my input let me write mars no it's not going to work earth no it's not going to work let me write zotten and that's it we have the right guess let me add some comments so that it's much more easy for us to understand what's happening the first comment goes right over here so on line number 16 we are just asking the users for their input the next thing that we are doing which is right over here we are just lower casing all of the strings so that we have a much more correct comparison 
Then as a circuit breaking mechanism, we are setting the correct guess variable to true. So this is what is happening right over here. Inside the else block, if the condition is false, then we are going to print the statement. And just to give it a small cosmetic touch, I'm going to put a line just below this. Just save your file and let me try running this file for one more time. So my first planet would be Mercury. We have a very nice output saying that wrong choice and then we have a line below it. Now this time it's going to be Zorton with a lowercase z and we have the right output. There is one more alternative way. We don't need to declare this variable all the time. We can simply work directly with the while loop. Let me put up a comment and then let me show how it works. Let me copy and paste everything from above. So let me just copy this. Let me go right over here. Let me paste it. I also want to comment all of this. Once inside the while loop, we have one more alternative which can act like our circuit breaker. Here on line number 33, I can simply say while true. This means that I always want you to start the while loop because true is always true. And on line number 40, instead of saying correct guess is equal to true, I can say break. So that means as soon as we have a condition which is right, I simply want to break out of the while loop. Let me save it and let me run it and see if it is working or not. Okay, so my first planet would be Earth. Wrong choice. The next planet is Zorton and that's the right choice. Let's try to learn the next flow control statement. And this time we are going to learn the match statement so let me open up my sidebar and let me create a new file by the name of matchcolor.py and let me put up a comment. So this is what we want to do. While traveling to Zorton, Lewis, he has packed a lot of stuff and we want to check if he has anything that matches our favorite color. And we are going to do this by using a match operator. Now please keep in mind that match is a brand new operator which was introduced in the version 3.10. So in case if you have any version below 3.10, it's not going to work. So please make sure you have any version 3.10 or higher. Here what we can do is we can create a variable called as my favorite color and we can ask the user for an input. So we can say input and here we can say enter your favorite color what's wrong with this spelling okay so enter your favorite color now let's try to print the favorite color let's try to run this file and let's see if it's working or not so it's asking me for my favorite color i say it's black and i have the right output now let's see how the match operator is going to work. We can write that I want to match on my favorite color. And the first case would be in case if I get the input as black, in that case, I want to print out a statement saying something like Lewis has a black t-shirt. Now suppose the user input is the red then maybe in that case i want to print something like lewis has a red car suppose my favorite color is yellow the code the colons has to be outside the quotes and i want to print out lewis as yellow shoes now in case the favorite color is green in that case i want to print out lewis has a green hat 
but what happens if we don't get a match so in that case we can write like this case followed by an underscore so that means the default case would be this one in case we don't get the favorite color right over here we can simply print out that Lewis has nothing in and let me put my color right over here followed by the word of color just save it let me save the file and let me try to run it one more time let me give the input of green it's working let me try to run the program one more time this time again green but you can see we are getting the output as Lewis has nothing in the green color. Now this is again because I have entered green where G is capital. While inside the match operator, you can see I am using a lowercase g. And you already know that strings are case sensitive inside Python. Let us tackle this issue and it's going to be a very simple thing. We can either write over here, I want to match my favorite color and I want to lowercase it first and then I want to match or we can say on this line I want to say that my favorite color should be equal to my favorite color but in the lowercase or even better what we can do is we can write it right over here dot lower and let me take out this line and that's it if you're wondering why I don't have a type annotation right over here and the reason is just hover over input and if you read the documentation it's saying that the output is of the type of a string we will look at the syntax when we learn a little bit more about functions your mypy plugin is smart enough to infer that the variable favorite color is of the type of a string and since your favorite color is a string, we can apply the lower method on our string. You can always write the type over here and it's not going to hurt. So this is also a valid syntax. Let me run the file for the last time and let us check what's happening. Now this time I'm going to say red with a capital R. Now it's a match, Lewis has a red car. Till now we have learned a lot and I think it's time for us to start writing our game. So what I've done in the background, I've created a file by the name of game save Zotan underscore one. You can see on the tab right over here as well. And I've added a couple of comments. Let us see now what we are supposed to do inside this game. Now, as we remember, Lewis is staying at Zotan, but this time Zotan is under attack. Thanos has arrived and he is going to attack Zorton. Now fortunately, Lewis can call his Avenger friends from Earth. So he has made a call. Avengers has received his call and they are going to send four of the Avengers to save Zorton. The four Avengers who are going to save Zorton are Iron Man, Black Widow, Spider-Man and Hulk. Each of the Avengers have their own attacking power and they have to fight with Thanos in order to save Zorton. But we have a couple of conditions. Avengers can only attack in pairs. So that means at each given point of time, a single Avenger cannot attack Thanos because Thanos is much more powerful. So Avengers have to team up in pairs of two and they have to attack Thanos. And while doing all of this, Avengers only have three chances to kill Thanos Otherwise, Thanos will kill the Avengers and we will lose the game. Sounds interesting, isn't it? But the first thing that I want you to do is not write the code. Yes, you heard me right. I don't want you to write the code first. First, I want you to understand what we have to do and then you can start writing code. In order to understand better, I want to introduce to you a very simple concept which is called as VOC DTP. It's a very simple concept that I've come up with and the entire concept is divided into two parts. So as you can see, the first part is VOC. The second part is DTP. So the first part simply means to visualize, outline and code. 
The next part would be debug, test and polish. For now, we would be concentrating on the first part, visualize, outline and code. So as a programmer, always remember first you always and always need to visualize before you can code. You don't have to write code immediately. So let's start to visualize what's going to happen inside our game. Since it's a game, we already have some characters. So let's try to visualize the different characters that we have. We have two main categories. One category is for the superheroes and the next category is for the super villains. We have a specific list for the superheroes and those are Iron Man, Black Widow, Spider-Man and Hulk. And for the super villains, right now we have only a single super villain and his name is Thanos. So this is where we just simply try to visualize how the game would look like. And now we know the characters. In the next step, let's try to outline how these characters would look like and how they would work. So coming to the next point of outline, since we have characters, all of the characters should have some properties. They should also have some constraints and we should also have some sort of a logic. I have already specified that our Avengers have a fire or an attack power. But if we have an attack power, then we would also require life. And having a property of life would make our job much more simple and we can implement a very simple logic for the game. Now this game also comes with a couple of constraints that we can't forget. The constraints are the first one that we saw, Avengers can only attack in pairs. So at a given time, only two Avengers can attack. A single Avenger cannot attack and more than two Avengers also cannot attack. And Avengers only have three chances of defeating Thanos. So this is where we are just trying to outline how our characters are going to look like. The last and the most important part is, can we come up with some kind of logic where we can simulate the attack? Now let's go back to our code editor and let us see how we can translate all of these things in our step number three. So as you can see, the step number three is to actually code. In step number three, what we are going to do is, we are just going to translate all of these things to a logic and that logic would be coded with Python. Now let's start with declaring our variables. If you refer our outline, we have a property and the properties are for your fire or attack power and one for the life. So let's go right over here and let us start creating some of our variables. So we can say the attack power of Iron Man. So I can say Iron Man attack power and just suppose it to be 250. Now let's start thinking in types. Now since it's a power, I have to do some sort of calculations. So it must be either in integer or in float. For the sake of simplicity, I'm keeping it as integer. The next thing that I want you to remember is, since this is an attack power, we are not going to change the attack power in the future. So no matter even if we are losing or we are winning the game, the attack power of Iron Man is always going to be 250. So just as a stylistic preference, I want to name my variable everything in uppercase. So this would denote that I want to have a constant instead of a variable. Now, what do I mean by constant? A constant simply means there is some value which we don't want to change. And that is what we are indicating by writing everything in the uppercase. Now, if you just hover over our variable, you can see on the left, we have constant. So that means our code editor knows that this is a constant, but we can go further and we can improve our typing. For this, I'm going to import and use something from an additional package. Now, what is a package? Package is basically some code that the developers of Python have written and they have put all of this code inside a library, which is called as the standard library. So what I'm going to do is, I want to say, I want to go to my typing package. So this package lives inside the Python standard library. 
Please remember that standard library is already built into Python. So from the package of typing, I want to import finally and we can wrap this integer inside finally. Now it's very clear that iron man attack power it's not just a variable it's a constant and we don't want to change the value of the constant throughout our program let us repeat the same thing for black widow spider man and hulk as well the next superhero would be our black widow and she has a power of 180 the next one would be spider man spider man has an attack power of 190 the last superhero would be hulk and hulk since he is the biggest guy, he has an attack power of 300. Let me put up some commands right over here. So this is where we are declaring our constants. And on the top, let me put up one more command. So this is the stuff that we are importing. Now let's go back to our outline just to figure it out what we are supposed to do next. We have defined the attack power. Now we also need the life. So let me go to the next line. And here I am going to define the life of Thanos and the life of Thanos is 1500 as you can see I don't want the life of Thanos to be a constant I want it to be a variable that's why I'm declaring everything in small case and my mypy is smart enough to infer that Thanos is of the type of integer or if you want to be explicit you can always type int right over here the reason why I don't want it to be constant would get much more clear when we implement the logic for the game. Now let's go back to our outline and here you can see we have a couple of constraints. The first constraint is Avengers can only attack in pairs. So let us go back to our game and I want the game users the ability to choose our pairs. In order to give this ability, I am going to create one more variable called as choices and let me assign it the value of 0. Again, I don't need to annotate as integer because my pie would be smart enough to infer that my choices variable would always be an integer. After this, let us create a couple of if and else blocks and let us start creating our pairs for our Avengers. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to create pairs in line. So what I mean, the first pair would be Iron Man and Black Widow. The second pair would be Black Widow and Spider-Man. The third pair would be Spider-Man and Hulk. And the fourth pair would be Iron Man and Hulk. But you're free to make the pairs in whatever choice you want. So here we can say if my choice is one, in that case, I simply want to print out that Iron Man and Black Widow are attacking Thanos. The next choice would be choice number two. And this time I want to print out Black Widow and Spider-Man are attacking Thanos. Next choice would be three. And this time Spider-Man and Hulk are attacking Thanos. And the last one, if the choice is number four, then Hulk and Iron Man are attacking Thanos. While doing all of this, let us not forget that we want to ask the user for the choice of the Avengers. So let us implement that logic and I want to implement that logic before our if and else blocks. So here I can, since we want to ask the user for the input, we need an input block. And let us display a prompt message saying that enter your pair number. We want to assign the input back to our variable of choice. So choice goes on the left and let me save my program. But as you can see, we have a small bug. So if you just try to hover, you can see that we have an error saying that incompatible types in assignment, expression has type of string, variable has type of integer. So this was what I was telling you about. Variable has the type of integer. Our variable of choice, as you can see on line number 29, we have declared a variable called as choice. And the type of this variable is an integer. But if you hover on input and if you read the documentation, it is actually giving us a string. So this is where when you start thinking in types, it's going to help you to avoid a lot of bugs.
To address this bug, it's a very simple solution. We simply want to convert the string to an integer. And the way to do that is by using a cast. Let me just show you how it is done. So I'm going to wrap all of this inside my brackets. And I want to cast all of this into an integer. So what this means is my input is going to give me a string and I want to convert that string into an integer right over here. Now our types are going to match. On the left, it's also an integer and on the right, it's also an integer. Let me save my program and let me try to run it. Suppose I want my pair number two. You can see Black Widow and Spider-Man are attacking Thanos. Let me try to run the file one more time. Let me go by pair number four. Hulk and Iron Man are attacking Thanos. So we have some basic logic in place. This time, let us display a nice message to the user informing them of all of the pairs which are there inside the game. So before I ask the input, I want to display a nice message. For this, I'm going to create a new variable called as message and I'm going to assign some string value to it. So let me create a variable called as message and I'm going to assign some value to it. And this is the value. So please note that I'm creating a multi-line string by using triple quotes. And just before we can show the choices, I want to print out the message. Let us do that right over here. So we can say print and my message. Let me save the file and let's try to run it. And this time we have a very nice message and we can see all of the pairs who can attack Thanos. This time let us go with the pair number three and we get the output that Spider-Man and Hulk are attacking Thanos. Let me clear up my terminal and let us go back to our code. Now, since this message is never going to change, I can actually make it as a constant. So let me change from the lowercase to the uppercase and here as well. So we have a message in a form of a constant. Let me put up a comment right over here saying that this is going to be one of my helper message and I can utilize this message multiple times whenever I want throughout my program. Now the next part would be since we have multiple chances of attacking Thanos, we need some kind of a loop and inside the loop, we can keep on attacking Thanos for at least three times. In order to simulate this loop situation, I'm going to use a while loop so I can just come down over here and just before my print message, I can say while true and let me indent sorry it has to be while not white and let me indent all of this thing one tab space inside so all of this belongs to the while loop now now let's see since we have a while loop we also need some kind of a circuit breaking mechanism in order to exit now let's go back to our outline and see how we can do that one of the constant is that we only have three chances of attacking thanos another constant is if we have already lost or we have already won, then we can simply break out and we don't have to play again. So we are going to combine this logic together and come up with a very simple circuit breaking mechanism. So let me go back to my code. Now inside my while loop, we need to have some sort of circuit breaking mechanism. So let me put up a comment. Either we can break out whenever we win or we can break out whenever we lose. So let's write our logic right over here. But before writing the logic, we need to create one more variable and that variable is going to hold our number of attacks. As you can see the constants, we have three chances for an attack. So let's save that data inside one variable. Let me go to the top and declare a variable right over here. So this is called as attack numbers and I'm going to assign it a value of zero initially. Let us go back to the while loop and let us write our winning or our losing conditions. First, let us see the winning condition. So we can say if the life of Thanos is less than or equal to zero, that means we have won. But we need to add one more condition right over here. The second constant 
and that constant would be if my number of attacks is also less than or equal to 3. Only in this case I am going to win, otherwise I am going to lose and I am going to print some kind of a message over here. So right now let me just put up a comment that this is for the, for the win. For the else block that means if we have lost, so we can say if my attack numbers are greater than or equal to 3, oh, this has to be else and if. Now in case my attack numbers are more than or equal to 3, in that case I am actually going to lose. Now before I forget, we need to add the break statements to actually break out of the while loop. So let me add them right away. The next thing that we need to do is we want to display a nice winning or a nice losing message. So what I have done is I have already written a nice message which I am going to paste it right over here just above the message. So the first one would be my winning message and it's going to be you successfully saved Zorton along with a couple of emojis. And since this is a constant, all of this is capital and this is final str. If you want it, you can write this. If you don't want, you can take it out and mypy is smart enough to infer that it's a constant of the type of string. The next message would be our losing message. So I'm just saying that Thanos killed Avengers and captured Zorton. The reason why I have all of this separately in a constant or in a variable is because in future, if you don't like these emojis, you can simply take them out and you don't have to change all of the logic that you write below. You have to just change one constant or one variable and it's going to reflect throughout your code. It makes our code much more manageable. Let me put back my emojis. I just love them and uh, go back to our if and else block. Let me remove this and I can say here I want to print my win message and here I want to print my lose message. Sorry, it's going to be lost message. Let me save my file. Now let us go back to our outline and let us see what we need to do next. Now we have to do the most important part that is how to actually simulate the attack. And fortunately for us, this is the most simplest part. Let's see how we can do that. Suppose you are using the first pair right over here. In this case, what's happening is Iron Man and Black Widow, they are going to attack Thanos. And if we just scroll up, Iron Man has a power of 250, Black Widow has a power of 180, and Thanos has a life of 1500. So when Iron Man and Black Widow are attacking Thanos, we simply want to minus the attack power from the life of Thanos. And since we have two Avengers who are attacking Thanos, we have to reduce the value by 250 and 180 from 1500. And that is how we simulate an attack. So let's go down over here and let us implement that logic. So we can say that my new Thanos life would be my current Thanos life minus my Iron Man attack power and also minus the Black Widow attack power and that's it. And after doing this, we also want to increment the number of attacks since we already have done one attack. So we can say my current attack number would be my attack number plus one. So initially, if you see the attack number is zero and whenever we have an actual attack, we are going to increment it by one. And remember, we have a constant right on line number 49 that we cannot have more than three attacks. If we have more than three attacks, then we are going to lose the game. Let us do the same thing for our choice number two, three and four as well. Let me just copy this. Let me paste over here. And before the attack, I have to say that my Thanos life would, would be my Thanos life minus Black Widow attack power minus the Spider-Man attack power. Let me go to the new line right over here. 
again the same thing let me copy here as well and uh, then here my Thanos life would be my Thanos life minus Spider-Man attack power minus Hulk attack power let us go to the last choice and here we can say again the same thing Thanos life would be Thanos life minus Hulk attack power minus Iron Man attack power here is my Iron Man save it and that's it I think we are good to go and we can try out our game so let's give it a try let me take this up a little bit so the first thing is we have a nice message saying that we have the following pairs for the first pair I want to go with the first one Iron Man and Black Widow so I just press 1 and enter so I get the message that Iron Man and Black Widow are attacking Thanos now it's asking me for the second pair now I can say I want to go with Black Widow and Spider-Man so I enter my choice number two again we get a message saying that Black Widow and Spider-Man are attacking Thanos and it is asking me for my third pair let me go with Hulk and Iron Man so I can type four and that's it and unfortunately we have lost the game Thanos has killed Avengers and he has captured Zoltan. Let us play the game one more time. This time I'm going to choose my pair number four, Hulk and Iron Man, and my pair number one, and again my pair number four. And that's amazing. Finally, we have been able to save Zoltan. You can see the message right over here. And this brings us to the end of section number three. Just take a break, have some nice snacks or coffee and I will see you in the next section. Welcome to a brand new section. This section is all about data structures. Data structures is just a common name for how we can group our data together. And the first data structure that we are going to see is called as a list. Now since Lewis has migrated to Zorton, he has been making a lot of progress. And in Zorton, people greet each other by saying Zola. So Lewis wants to write a simple program where he can greet all of his friends by saying Zola followed by the name of the friend. You can do this by using multiple print statements, but that is not a very effective approach. What if you have hundreds or thousands of friends? Then you can imagine that using a print statement for each and every friend would get too tedious. Instead, Python offers a much better solution and that is called as a list. So what we are going to do is we are going to create a list and after that we are simply going to look through the list and print a greeting message to each one of his friend. Let's see how to do this. Behind the scenes I have created a new folder called as 04 data structures and I am working in this file called as friends.py. So let's get started with this one. Let us create a variable called as friends. Oh, let me get the spelling right. Now this friends is going to be a list. For creating a list, you have to use open and closing square brackets. And inside this, you have to insert all of your elements. Suppose the first friend is CC. And then we have a bunch of other friends, Roko, Chico and Nico. So this is what a list in Python looks like. Now let's see how we can add the type hints to this one. Now obviously this is a list. So what we can do is here we can simply say that friends is a list and after that let us try and specify what kind of data that our list would be holding. And if you see all of our data types are strings. So what we can do is we can simply tell that this list is going to be a list of strings. The next point that I want to tell you is all the lists in python they always start with the index number of zero so let me put a comment and then let me try to explain what's happening so this is how your list will look inside the memory on index number zero it will have cc on index number one it will have roko on index number two chico and so on always remember that list will always start with the index number of zero and this is common across all of the programming languages, not only in Python. The next point that I want to share is, if you see the length, our length is four. That means we have four elements inside the list. So this is the first element, second, third, and fourth. 
So the length of our list would be 4, but the index number would be up till 3. Let's print out the friends and see how they look like. So let me print the friends right over here and let me run this file. So these are the friends. We have friends right over here. Now let's create a very simple for loop and greet all of his friends. So let me start by putting some comments. Let me take this a little up and we can use a very simple for loop. So we can say for friend in my list of friends for every friend i simply want to print out a greeting message saying that zola followed by the name of my friend let us run this file so here we have the output zola cc zola roco and so on let's see what lewis wants to do next so lewis simply wants to count his number of friends so remember i just told you that the length of this list would be 4 and we can find that out by using an inbuilt function which is also called as length. Let me show you right over here. Let's print out friends length and inside the curly brackets I can find the length by using the inbuilt function called as length len and let us pass our list to it. Just save and run your file and here we have friend's length is 4 and that is what we were expecting. Let's see what Lewis is doing next. Oh, he had a fight with Nico and he wants to unfriend him. Now let's see how we can take Nico out of our list. So we can see Nico. Nico is the last element inside our list and we can remove him by using an inbuilt function which is called as pop. Let me show you how it is to be done. So I can say I want to unfriend and I can say from my list of friends, I simply want to pop the last value. Now, since Nico is the last element, we can use this method to remove an element from the list. Let us print out the friend that we have just unfriended. So we can just say unfriend and let me put my curlies and let me put unfriend over here. Let me also copy and paste our friends. And let's see how our list is looking right now. So let me just paste it right over here. Just save it and try to run your file. And here we have it. We have unfriended Nico. And this is how our current list of friends looks like. Let us go back and let us see what Lewis is up to this time. So Lewis has made a new friend by the name of Zico. So let us see how we can add Zico to our list. We can add Zico by using another inbuilt function by the name of append. Let's see how to do that. So here I can say in my list of friends, I want to append one more element and that element is called as Zico. Let us copy this line and paste the new list. Let me save it. Let me try to run my file. And here you can see we have Zico at the back. One more thing you must have noticed that I am not assigning a variable for this operation. So for example, I am not doing something like this. The reason is if you just hover over append, you can read the documentation. This function returns none. That's why I am not assigning it back to my list of friends. But at the same time, if you hover over pop, now this method of pop is actually returning back a string. That's why I'm using a new variable on the left to collect that data. But for this, we can't do the same. Now let's see what Lewis is up to. So let me go down right over here and let me paste a new comments. This time Lewis wants to know who is his third friend inside the list. Let us check it out. Let me open up my terminal. So this is how our latest list looks like. So CC is the first friend, Roko is the second one and Chico is a third friend. So let's see how we can get this value from our list. And we can do that by using our indexes. So just remember, let me scroll a little up. Our list, it has a set of indexes and always remember that the index is going to start from zero. Now let's see how we can get the third value from our list. So here I can simply print out from my list of friends, 
I simply want the friend who is on the index number 2. Now remember we are using 2 because our index starts at 0. Let me put a comment. So let me save this file and let us try to run this file. And here we have the output Chico is the third friend inside the list. Let us go back. This time Luis again had a fight. But this time he had a fight with Roko and we need to remove Roko from our list as well. Let me scroll to our list. If you see Roko is inside our list at index number 1. So let me show you how we can do this. So let us go down. Here I can say from my list of friends I simply want to remove Roko. That's it. Let me copy this line and paste it over here and let us try running this file. So this is our new list. We have CC, Chico and Zico. We have successfully removed Roko from our list. Let's see what Luis is up to next. And it seems like Luis and Roko have become friends again. So let's see how we can add Roko back to our list. Remember that Roko was at index number one. So we want to insert Roko back to its original index. So let me show you how it is to be done. So here I can say in my list of friends, I want to insert at index number one, the element of Roko. And let me try to print out the list one more time. That's it. Just see, run your file. And this is the new list. We have Roko back at index number one inside the friends list. Let's go back and let's see what Luis wants to do next. So this time Luis wants to confirm if Roko is in the friends list or not. And we can do this by using our if and in syntax. So what we can say right over here is if Roko in my list of friends, then I simply want to print out yay Roko is in the friend list or else I can print out some other message. So let me save the file and let us try to run this one. Now since Roko is inside the list, we get the output that yay Roko is in the friends list. Let us go back. Let's see what's happening next. So this time Luis patches up with Nico as well. And this time Nico has become his number one friend. So we want to add Nico back to our list of friends. But since Nico is his number one friend right now, we want to add Nico at the beginning of the list. So we can do this by using the same syntax right over here. We can use the same syntax and let's see how to do this. So we can say in my list of friends, I want to insert at index number zero, the element of Nico. And let us print our list of friends as well. So let me go down, let me paste and let us run this file and here you can see we have Nico as the first element inside our list. Let us go back. So this time Lewis wants to sort his friends in alphabetical order and luckily it's very simple. We simply have to say friends I simply want to sort it. Let me copy and paste the list of friends and let us run this file and here we have the output. You can see all of the names are sorted alphabetically. So CC Chico comes first, Nico, Roko and finally we have Zico. Let us go back. So this time Lewis doesn't really like this ordering and he wants to reverse the order. Luckily this too is very simple. Let me just copy this and let me paste it right over here. And instead of sort, I simply have to say I want to not remove, I want to reverse. That's it. And let us run this file. And this time we have the new list. And you can see the first element is Zico and the last element is CC. Let's see what's happening next. And this time Luis again had a fight with Nico. And we again need to remove Nico from our list. But before removing Nico, let us have a look at our list. So this is how our list is currently looking like. And Nico is the third element or you can say the index number of Nico is 2. 
So keeping this in mind, let us go back and see how we can remove Nico from the list. Earlier I have shown you two different methods of removing elements. One was this one of remove and the first one was with the pop method. Let me show you one more method again by using pop. Let me copy all of this and let us go down. Now since Nico is at index number 2, what I can do is I can tell Python that I want to pop an element from an index number 2. Let us save and let us run this file for the last time. And here we have it. We have unfriended Nico and this is our updated list. The next data structure that we are going to learn is called as a tuple. Behind the scenes I have created a new file which is called as subjects.py and let's see what's going to happen. Let me collapse my sidebar. Now it's time for Lewis to go to school and he has to choose his subjects. But his school wants to make sure that once a student chooses their subjects, they won't be able to change it. So let's see how we can do this. And the way to do this is by using a tuple. So you can imagine tuple to be like a stricter brother of list. Once you create a tuple, you can't change or modify it. So let's see how to create a tuple. So let's say that we want to create a tuple by the name of subjects. And the way to create a tuple is by using the round brackets. And inside of this round brackets, we have to add our elements. Suppose the first subject would be maths. The next could be science. Then we can say history. Now remember that similar to our list, our tuples will also start with index number zero. That means the index number for maths is zero. For science, it would be one and for history, it would be two. Let us see how to add typing for this one. So here I can say that subjects is obviously a tuple. And the way to define its type is we have to put our square brackets. And since tuples are strict, we have to define the data type for each and every element. So for example, in this tuple, we have three elements and the types are string and string. So here we can say that the first element is a string, the second is a string as well, and the third is a string as well. Suppose we had one more element. So if I say that we have one more element as 13, now the data type of 13 is an integer. So what we would have to do is after this, we would have to say that my fourth element is of the type of integer. So make sure whenever you are creating a tuple, you write the data type of all the elements inside the tuple. Let me take it out. This is not required for our example right now. Let me also put up a comment. So saying that the index number for maths is zero for science is one and history is two. Let's see what we can do next. So let me take it a little up. So this time Lewis wants to count his number of subjects and you can do that by using the inbuilt function called as length. So we can use a simple print statement and we can say that number of subjects then inside of our curly brackets we can use the inbuilt function called as length and let us just pass our tuple inside so we can say subjects. Let us run and see the output. And here we can see that the number of subjects is three. Let us go back. The next thing that Lewis has to do is Lewis has to sign up for all of the subjects. So let us create a very simple loop. And by using the loop, we can sign up for all of the different subjects. You can use your regular for loops to iterate over the tuple. So here it goes. We can say for my subject in my tuple of subjects for each iteration i can simply print out a statement saying that lewis is signing up for let me get my spelling right this to be signing up for and inside the curly brackets we simply have to say for my subject let us run and let us see the output so here it is lewis is signing up for maths and then for science and the last one is history. Let us go back. So this time Lewis wants to see which is his 
second subject and we can do that by using our index so as i just mentioned tuples also have indexes so the second subject would have an index of one so let us try and print it out here i can simply say that i want to print out from my tuple of subjects the subject at my index number one also let me put up a comment saying that since the tuple starts from index zero we are using one let us see the output so you can see the second subject is science let us go back and this time let us see what's happening so this time the school wants lewis to take another three subjects to get his full credits now what happens is once you create a tuple you can't add different elements to a tuple for example when we saw list we could append elements to the list but you can't do for the tuple then what can you do well you can add two different tuples and create a new tuple let me show you how it is to be done so suppose the additional subjects which he has to take would be a new tuple and we can say that the new subjects are english python and physics on the next line we can create a new tuple called as my total subjects and we can simply add our tuple of subjects plus our additional subjects so now we have a new tuple which has all of the subjects together we can also try and print it out so here let me just say that my all subjects would be my tuple of total subjects let us run it and here we have the output you can see we have english python and physics at the back and also we have maths science and history so this is our newly created tuple let us go back and let's see what's happening this time now it's obvious that out of all of the subjects lewis loves python and he wants to make sure that python is inside his list of subjects so we can check for an element inside a tuple by using our if and else blocks so let us see how to do that so here we can simply say that if python is in my tuple of total subjects if this is true then i simply want to print out yay lewis is going to learn python if not so we can say else we can print out oh no no python for lewis so let us save this file and let us try to run this file for the last time and here we have the output now since python is inside our tuple we get the output of yay lewis is going to learn python now let's try to learn about dictionaries dictionaries are of mapping type that means the dictionary are going to map a key to a value so let us see what's going to happen right now behind the scenes i've created a file called as marks.py and i'm working in this one so let me collapse my sidebar and let us see what's happening now this time lewis has given his exam and he has received his marks so let us see how it looks like so we can create a dictionary and call it as marks the way to declare a dictionary is by using your curly brackets and inside of this curly brackets let us give the key and the value pairs suppose the first subject is maths so we can say maths and he scored maybe 80 marks in his maths so this is how your key and value pairs look like on the left of the colon we have a key and on the right we have a value let us give a couple of more key and value pairs suppose the next subject was science and suppose he fared 82 marks in science and let me add a couple of more subjects as well so this is his score and on the next line let us print out all of these subjects so we can say with my formatted string my marks and let us say marks let me save the file and let us try running this one and here is the output so this is the dictionary that we just created now let us go back and see what's happening next let me put some comments right over here so this time lewis wants to check all of the subjects now remember inside our dictionary the keys are our subjects so let us see how we can just get the keys out of our dictionary 
The way to do that is very simple. Let's also use a for loop to print out the keys. So we can say for my subject in my dictionary of marks, I want to get all of the keys and for each iteration, we simply want to print out the subject. Let us run this file and see the output. So here is our output. We have all of the keys inside our dictionary. Now let us go back and let's see what's going to happen next. So this time Lewis wants to check all of his marks. Now again, remember that the marks are the values. So anything on the right is the value. And this time we want to get only the marks out of our dictionary. So let us do that. And the way to do that is similar to something like this. So let me show you how it is to be done. So we can say for my score in my dictionary of marks, I want to get only the values. And for each iteration, I just want to print out my score. Let me save the file and let me try to run this file. And here we have the output. Here you can see we have all of our score. Let us go back. Let us see what Lewis wants to do next. So let me take a little up. This time Lewis wants to check out all of the subjects and marks together. That means we simply have to print out our key and value pairs. So let us see how we can do that. Again, let us use our for loop to print out the key and values. So we can say for now, since the keys is for the subjects, let us call subject and on the right we have score. So we can say score in my dictionary of marks. I want to get all of the items. Now this method is going to return our key and values, which we are capturing right over here. And for each iteration, let us print out our key and value pairs. So here I can say that my subject and here we can say the score and we can say the score is out of 100. Just let me save it and let us try running this file. And here we have the output maths. Lewis scored 80 out of 100, science was 82, history was 78 and so on. Now let us go back and see what we have to do next. And this time Lewis wants to check if he has passed in all of the subjects or not. And the passing marks are 50. So let us see how we can do this. We can do this by using our for loop and our if and else blocks. So let me show you how it is to be done. So here we can say for my subject and my score in my marks dot items for each iteration i want to check if my score is greater than or equal to 50 only in that case i can print out that subject and i can say pass else if the score is less than 50 that means he has failed and so we can print out the name of the subject so we can say the subject and we can say failed let me save it and let me try to run this file so let's see how he has done in his exam maths is a pass science is a pass oh but what's this english is a fail so let's see what's going to happen next let us go back to our file so let me take it a little up and let me put some comments so Lewis thinks that there was some kind of a totaling mistake for his English paper and he is asking for a revaluation. And after the revaluation, the new marks are 70. So let us see how we can update the values in our dictionary. So this time what we want to do is let me show the dictionary. So this time we want to update the marks of English from 35 to 70. So let us see how we can do that. So let me go down and here I can say that from my dictionary of marks, I want to go to my key of English and I want to assign the new value of 70. So this is how you can update the values inside your dictionary. On the next line, we can print out the value. We can say something like this, Lewis scored inside the curly brackets, we can say the marks of English in English. 
so let me just save this and let me try to run this file so here we have the output saying that Lewis scored 70 in English now here what we are doing is this syntax we are just retrieving the value from our dictionary so this syntax means that from my dictionary of marks I want to get the value for the key of English let us see what is happening next now this time Lewis also took an exam for geography and he scored 78 marks so this time what we have to do is we have to create a new key and a new value this time remember we don't have geography inside our dictionary of marks and we have to create one right now so what we can say is for my dictionary of marks i want to create a new key for my geography and i want to assign the value of 78 to it and lewis also wants to check if he has passed in all of his subjects or not so let me go up and I just have to copy all of this and let me paste it right over here. So here is the output and it looks like Lewis has passed in all of his subjects. And you can also see we have the output for geography as well. Now let us go back. So let's see what's happening this time. So this time his friends on Zorton, they want to know how much Lewis scored in Python. So let us see how we can retrieve the values from our dictionary. So let me show you the first alternative. Let us create a new variable called as our Python score and we can retrieve a value by using the syntax. So we want to say that go to my dictionary of marks and I want you to get the value for the key of Python and that's how you retrieve the value. But this syntax has a couple of limitations, which I'll explain it shortly. But first, let us print out these values. Let us print out the marks in Python. So we can say Lewis scored the Python score in Python. Let us run this file. And here we have the output saying that Lewis scored 98 in Python. Now let me show you one more alternative method. Let us go down and let me put one more comment and here again we can say that the python score and this time we can use one more alternate syntax so what we can say that from my dictionary of marks i want to get the values for my key of python and on the next line let us print out the same statement so let me copy from here and let me paste it right over here and let us run our file so this time you can see we again have the output. Now let us go back and let's see what's happening next. So let us see what's happening this time. And this time his friends from Earth, they want to know how much Lewis scored in Java. So what we can do, we can create a variable called as Java score. And we can say from a dictionary of marks, I want to get the value for my key of java and on the next line let me try and print it out so what i can say that i want to print out lewis code java score in java let me save and let me run this file and this time you can see that we have an error and the error is called as key error now this is because our dictionary does not have a key called as java so this is one of the limitations of using this syntax right over here let me put up a comment saying that this syntax will throw an error now let's see a better way of getting the values from our dictionary and that is by using the get method that we just saw on the next line let me paste some comments and i want to comment this out because this is always going to fail so let us go down right over here let me take everything up so here let me create one more variable called as our java score and let us use the get syntax so what we can say is from my dictionary of marks i want you to get the value for the key called as java let me save this and this time let us try to print out this same sentence so i can just copy and let me paste it right over here let us run this file and see the output so this time we get the output of Lewis scored none in Java. 
So let us go back and let us see what's happening. Now this method of get returns a none if it can't find the value. And that's what is happening right over here. One thing that I forgot to show is how to use the typing for this one. So let us go up and let me show you how to write the type hints for our dictionary. So this variable of marks, this is a dictionary. So we can say this is our dictionary. And inside the brackets, we also have to mention the types for our keys and values. So here we can say that since all of the keys are string, so the key is going to be of the type of string and the values are integers. So we can just say int and that's it. Now let us go down and let us see what's happening. So here on the line 108, this get method is going to return none or if it finds a value it is going to return our score which is of the type of integer now let us use our if and else blocks to print something meaningful so here we can say that if my java score is none that means if we can't find the value then we can simply print out saying that lewis did not study java and else we want to print out this statement so let me take it inside my else block and let us try to run this file and here it is we have the output of lewis did not study java now let us go back the last thing that i wanted to show you is how to delete some elements or how to delete the key and value pairs from our dictionary now suppose we want to delete the key and value pair for english then we can say that I want to delete from my dictionary of marks English. So this is how the syntax goes. Let me remove the extra quotes. Now let us print our marks one more time. So I can say marks and let us print out the marks right over here. Let me run this file. So this is how our dictionary is looking. And you can see we have deleted English from our dictionary as well. The last thing that I wanted to mention for this one is the lookups in dictionary are extremely fast. What do I mean by lookup? So on line number 108, we are getting the value from our dictionary. So this is a lookup. When we were working with our list or tuples, we were using indexing. But for a dictionary, we always use the key to get the data. And this is the reason why lookups in dictionary are extremely fast and we would be using dictionaries and lists in our final project as well so make sure you go through them a couple of times and understand what's exactly happening there is one last thing that i wanted to show you so if you open up the code from the github so this is the code from github inside my folder 04 data structures this is the file which i'm referring to it is called as dictionary now let me collapse my sidebar so here I have one more sample dictionary called as pizza and you can see the structure is very interesting. The first key value pairs we have integer as the key and string as the value. For the next one we have a float as our key. The next one is even more interesting we have a tuple as the key and the last one we have a boolean value as a key. Now the interesting part is this is a valid syntax. So let me copy all of this and let me paste all of these things inside my ipython shell. So here it is. Let me paste it right over here and let us try to print out our pizza. So you can see we have a valid output. So what happens is you can use any data type for a key as long as it is immutable. So our strings are immutable, integers are immutable, floats, booleans are also immutable. And we also saw that our tuples are immutable as well. So you can use all of these data types as your keys. The way to retrieve the data is similar. So let me give you some small examples. So here we can say from my dictionary of pizza, I want to get the value for the key of 10. And here we have the output. The same thing can go for our float as well. So we can say 8.99. And here we have the value. You can do the same thing for our tuple as well. Let me copy this tuple. And here I can say from my dictionary of pizza, I want to get 
the value from the key and this time the key is a tuple so let me paste it right over here and you can see we have the right output but before you make such a dictionary i want you to wait and think do you think that this is going to be a developer friendly dictionary i would rather think not i just wanted to show you that you can create such dictionaries and all of this is valid syntax now let us have a look at the next data structure and this data structure is all about being unique the name of this data structure is called as a set for this video i have created a new file called as teach.py and uh, let's get working with this one so let's see what's happening this time lewis wants to show some of his english magic to zortans but zortans they can't understand what's happening and they want to see each alphabet separately that means they want to understand each unique alphabets so let's see what's going to happen next so suppose we have a magic word called as abracadabra now let's see how we can get the unique alphabets from our string so on the next line let us create one more variable called as unique alphabets and in order to get unique alphabets from this string we have to create a set and the way to create a set is by using the cast which is called as set and let us pass our variable magic words to this one now if you hover over the variable unique alphabets you can see the type is set and the set is of the type of a string so let's write that over here so this is a set and the data type is for the string let us print out our unique alphabets so here we can say i simply want to print out my unique alphabets let me save it and let us try to run this file and here we have all of the unique alphabets so let me take this a little up so inside our word of abracadabra the alphabets of c d a b and r all of this alphabets are unique let us go back let's try one more time and this time let us use a sentence so we can create a sentence like this the big blue sky and the big blue ocean and let us see the unique alphabets so i can reuse my variable of unique alphabets and this time let us create a set from our sentence and let me copy and paste this line right over here let us run the file and this time we have an output so all of this alphabets are unique inside our sentence but what happens if we want to check the unique words instead of the characters let us see how to do that the first thing that we would need to do is we would want to convert our sentence into a list of words so let us see how to do that first let me create a variable called as my word list and we can simply split our sentence by using an inbuilt function by the name of split so we can say that i want to split my sentence now if you see the type of sentence is a string right so on a string you have a method called as split so this is going to return a list of all of the words inside the sentence let us try to print it out on the next line so let me say my word list is my variable of word list let us try to run this file so here you can see we have the list of all of the words inside the sentence so the next step is to actually create a set out of our words list and once we create a set then we can know all of the unique words inside our sentence so let's do that let me put up comment saying that we need to extract the unique words let us create a variable called as unique words and we simply need to create a set out of our word list let us try to print it out so here i can say my unique words and uh, the variable of unique words let us try to run this file so here you can see the unique words are big ocean blue sky the and and 
Also one more thing that I want you to note that at the beginning and at the end we have the curly brackets. So you can see right over here. For the beginning we have a curly bracket and at the last we have a curly bracket. So this symbolizes a set. In the dictionary we had key and value pairs inside curly brackets. But for a set we only have values. So let us go back. So this time Zortans they are really impressed and they want to see if we can add a couple of more words to our set. So let's see how we can try and update our set. So what we can do is let us take the existing set for our unique words and we can say that we want to update with the new values and here we need to pass an iterable. That means you can pass a list or a tuple or any other data structure which is iterable. So let me paste some values right over here. So let us see if we can update with the new values of big, blue and sky. Let me copy this line and let me paste it right over here and let me try to run this file. Now if you see nothing is happening. This line and the line before that they are exactly the same. Now what's happening? Now since set is all about being unique, we can't add the existing values to the set. If you go back to our code, big, blue and sky, these words are already existing inside our set. So nothing is happening. Let me put up a comment. If you try to update your set with existing values, nothing is going to happen. Now let us try to update with some other words which are not there inside the set. So I can say my unique words. I want to update with the new values and this time I want to pass the value of green and grass. Let me copy this, paste it right over here. Now let us try to run our file and this time you can see we have the words of green and grass inside our set. Let us go back and let us see what's happening next. Let me put some comment right over here saying that something does happen. Now what happens is Zortans they don't like the word of grass. Now let's see how we can remove the word of grass from our set. So we can simply say that from my list of unique words I want to remove and I want to remove the element of grass and again let me copy and paste all of this and let us save and let us run our file. And you can see that this time we have removed the word of grass from our set. Let us go back. Now I just wanted to let you know that you can do a lot of other operations on sets such as your union and intersections and so on. But I would not be covering all of those inside this tutorials. Now let us see how we can use data structures for our game. So behind the scenes I have created a new file called as game saves order 2 and this is the file and i have also pasted a couple of comments right over here so this time what is happening is the war is just getting more intensified this time the army of thanos is also arriving and since it's going to be a very intense fight our program will automatically choose superhero and the super villain and our avengers have exactly three chances to defeat thanos now this time since we have already seen data structures we are going to create a nice data structure for our characters but first let me go to my old file inside my folder number 03 and let us copy a couple of things from here so let me copy from here till my lost message let me go back let me collapse my sidebar and let me paste it right over here so this is our current file now let's get started. This time we are going to define a nice structure for our characters. You have seen that our character has an attack power and Thanos had life. But this time our super villains are also going to attack our super heroes. So all of the characters will have a property of life as well. So let us see how we can do all of these things. Let me create a constant and let me call it as Iron Man and the most ideal data structure would be a dictionary. Now since with dictionary we can have the key and value pairs, it makes much more sense to use a dictionary right over here. 
the first key would be for the name of the character so in this case the name is iron man the next key could be for the attack power so i can say my attack power the value is of the type of an integer and the attack power of iron man is 250 the last key and value pair would be for the life so you can say i want to have a key for my life let's give him a life of say thousand now let us see how we can define the types for this one now obviously iron man is a dictionary now if you see the structure of our dictionary all of the keys are strings but for the values sometimes we have a string and sometimes we have an integer so let us see how we can define the types over here since all of the types the keys are going to be string so we can say the key is of the type of a string and the value we can say it's either going to be a string or it is going to be an integer so this is how you define the types for our iron man now since this is going to be a constant we can wrap all of these things inside final so let me do that let me put my brackets and let me say final but what happens is typing all of these things again and again becomes so boring so what we can do is we can use a small trick and that trick is called as in typing alias so what i can do is let me just cut out all of these things and here let me create a new variable called as character and i can define the type right over here so what i'm doing on line number 20 is i'm defining a new variable called as character and i'm assigning the type to it so what i can do on line number 22 is i can simply say that iron man is a constant of the type of character so this is going to save us a lot of typing let me put up some comments over here now let us go down and let's create some more superheroes so let me just paste it right over here so what i have done is i have created three more superheroes one is black widow spider-man and hulk and i have also assigned values to each of our superhero let me put a comment right over here so this is for our superheroes similarly let us also do for our super villains so let me put a comment right over here so i can say that let us define a super villain called as thanos the type would be final and we can say character right over here and let's create our dictionary so we can say the name is thanos the attack power is 1500 and life is 1500 similarly let me create some other super villains as well so i've created a couple of more super villains one is red skull and the last one is proxima now since we have a structure for our character we don't need all of these things so let me take it out the next thing is let us create a list of all of our superheroes and all of our super villains so let me put up a comment and let us create a list for our superheroes and we can say this is going to be a list so i can put my square brackets the first is our iron man next is black widow next is spider man and last is the hulk now let us see how we can define the typing for this one so superheroes is a list and the type is of the character let us go down and let us create one more for our super villains as well so i can say that my villains is again going to be a list of my character and let us create a list right over here the first is our thanos then is for the red skull and last is for proxima let us go down and uh, let me put up a comment right over here that choices and attack numbers all of this are our helper variables let me take this out and let me take this out as well that's not required now let us go down and let us see how we can implement the actual attack the last time we had used a while loop this time i want to show you a for loop and i also wanted to show you a new keyword that keyword is called as range so first let me type and then i will try and explain what's happening 
so i can create a for loop saying that for attack in my range of 3 now let me try to explain what's happening if you remember we have a constraint that avengers can attack only three times and that's what i'm doing right over here let me open up my ipython shell and let me try to explain over there so range is an inbuilt keyword inside python so we are typing as for my number in my range of three i simply want to print out my number let's see what kind of output we are getting so we get the output of 0 1 and 2 and after we get 2 our for loop is going to stop so that means our loop ran for three times this was the first this was the second and this was the third time so this is where i am trying to implement our constant of maximum three attacks so here our for loop will run for exactly three times and then it will exit let's see what we can do next now since this is a very intense fight our program has to choose a superhero and a super villain randomly so let's see how we can do that first let me put up a comment and here again i want to show you one more function which is built into python and that is called as random integers so what's going to happen is for each iteration of our for loop we want to choose a superhero and a super villain and remember our superheroes and super villains are lists and lists have indexes right so for iron man the index number would be zero for black widow the index number would be one spider-man would be index number two and hulk would be index number three so what we are going to do is we are just going to generate a random index number and we are going to take that superhero out of our list of superheroes and similarly for our villains as well but before we can generate a random integer first we need to import that functionality so here i can say from my package of random i want to import something which is called as random int let us go down and let us see how to use this let me go to my ipython shell and let me give you a small demo right over here here i can say from random i want to import my random integer and let us try and see the output of random int and let us pass the values of 0 to 10 so this time we get an 8 let us try running it one more time this time we have a 3 this time we have a 7 so you see that we can randomly generate different numbers so let's see how to use this inside our program so here i can say that for each iteration of the for loop i want to generate a random integer and my starting index would be 3 and my last index would be 3 now let's see why i'm writing 3 over here the first time we want to generate a random integer for our hero so let me create a variable called as hero index and assign the value right over here now let's see what's happening if you see our list of superheroes we have four elements that means the length is four but the index number is three that is why i'm writing three right over here let us generate a random integer for our villain as well so let me create a variable called as villain index and i can use the same function random integer i want to start at zero and at the max i want to have two that's because the length of villains is three now let's see what we can do next so what we are doing on line number 54 and 55 is we are just generating a random integer number the next thing is we can use that integer number to get a superhero from our list so let's see how to do that so let me put up a comment saying that we have a couple of more helper variables and i can say that i want to get my current superhero from my list of superheroes and the index number is the randomly generated number which we have stored in the variable of hero index so that means on line number 54 we are just generating an index number and on line number 57 we are using that index number to get a superhero from our list of superheroes let us do the same thing for our villain as well so here i can say that my 
current villain would be from my list of villains from the index of my villain index let us try to print out the values and see what's happening so here i can say i want to print out my current superhero and i want to print out my current super villain let us run this file so here is the output for the first iteration we have iron man and proxima for the second iteration we have black widow and red skull for the third iteration we have iron man and thanos so you see for each time we have a different pair who is going to attack each other and that's what we want so let us go back to our program let us display a nice message right over here so let us say i want to print using my formatted string the first thing i want to display is my attack numbers i can say my attack and uh, let us also display the names of our superhero and our super villain who are going to fight so i can say inside my curly brackets that my superhero and let us also get the name now remember that current superhero is a dictionary and we can get the values by using our key and value syntax so i can say that i want to get the value of my key of name and then we can say that is going to fight with here we can display the name of our super villain so i can say my current villain and i want to retrieve the value from my key of name let me save it let us take out this line it's not required now and let me try and run this file so this time we have an output for the first attack we have black widow who is going to fight with red skull the next time we have black widow again and she is going to fight with thanos the last time spider-man is going to fight with thanos what we can do right over here is instead of displaying zero we can start from one so let me go back and here i can say attack plus of one let me save it and let me try to run the file so this time we have a much better output let us go back so here before we can attack we also need to calculate the total life so what's happening is for each iteration of our for loop we have a superhero and we also have a villain so we need to calculate the life of our superheroes as well as our super villains for that we would need two more variables so let me go right over here and create two new variables right over here so the first one would be for our hero life and initially give it a value of zero the next one is for our villain life again let us set it to a value of zero now we don't require this variables because remember we are using the function of range so we can simply take them out it's not required let me take it up let me save my file and let us go down right over here let me put up a comment saying that first we need to add the life for each iteration so i can say for my life and for each iteration what i want to do is this is my life of hero and i want to add the life of my current hero to my hero life for each iteration so i can say my hero life plus my current hero and from my current hero i want to get the value of his life let us do the same thing for the life of villains as well so i can say my villain life is equal to my villain life plus my current villain and i want to get the value for life now what we can do is we can also use our shorthand syntax that means we can take this out and here we can say plus equal to so this means the exact same thing let me do it for the villain life as well so let me take it out plus equal to now you see that we have an error right over here but for now just ignore this error all of these errors will go away when we implement these characters by using classes now let's see how to implement the actual attack so let me put up a comment now what is going to happen is our villain is going to attack the hero so what we need to do is we need to minus the attacking power of the villain from the life of the hero so let us do that right over here so i can say that my hero life would be my hero life and minus i want to have the attacking power of my villain so i can say my current villain 
I want to get the attack power. We can use our shorthand syntax right over here as well. So here I can take this out and I can say minus equal to. Let us do the same thing for the villain life as well. So here I can say my villain life minus equal to the current superhero and I want to get the attacking power of my superhero. Now let's see what to do next. So this attack is going to happen for three times and after the attack is done, we need to see if we are winning or we are losing. So once we are out of the for loop, let us print a nice separating line. So let me put up a comment and let us print a nice separating line. So I can say equal to multiplied by 70. So what this is going to do is it is simply going to repeat the string of equal to 70 times. Next, let me take it a little up and uh, let me put up a comment. So this time we want to check if we are winning or if we are losing. And the logic for this is very simple. If the life of the heroes is greater than or equal to the life of the villains, that means the Avengers have won. So let us do that right over here. So we can say if the hero life is greater than or equal to the villain life, then we simply want to print our win message else that means we have lost so let us print out the lost message that's it let me save my file and let me try running this amazing we have a nice output so here you can see that we attacked three times the first time spider-man attacked proxima the second time again spider-man attacked red skull and the third time black widow attacked red skull but unfortunately, Thanos killed Avengers and he has captured Zorton. Let us try playing one more time. So let me play one more time. Okay, so this time we have saved. It's so amazing. Welcome to the last video in this section. Now this is an extra video and I want you to come back to this video after you learn about classes. I am putting this video right over here just for the sake of completeness. In this video, we are going to learn about enums. So behind the scenes, I have created a file called as choices and let us see what's going to happen. Now enums are the perfect data structures whenever you want to create multiple choices or varieties. So let's see how to do that. The first thing is we need to import enum. So we can say from my package of enum, I want to import enum and let us import auto also so i'll explain what is it all about suppose you wanted to create choices for different pizza sizes so let us see how to do that so i can say my class of my pizza size now this inherits from my class of enum let me put up some documentation and here we can say that my first choice would be for a small size and we can assign it a value of eight the next choice could be medium it could be at 10 inches then we have one more for large it could be 12 so what this simply means is we have created an enum of pizza size and we have three choices small medium and large now let us see how to work with this enum so let me go down let us create a variable of choice and suppose the choice of the pizza size could be medium so we can say from my enum of pizza size i simply want the medium value let us print out the value on the next line so i can say print and i can say one order four now in order to get the value we can say from my enum of choice i want to get the value and then i can write inch pizza so let me save this and let me run this file and we have the output one order for a 10 inch pizza so let us go back let us create one more enum for colors of a t-shirt so i can make a class and the class is for color this also inherits from my enum let me write some documentation this is for my t-shirt varieties and here i can say that my first choice is red and i can give it a value of red the next could be blue and green let us also try to print out the values so let me go right over here and let me copy this line let me go down let me paste it right over here and here we can say one order for my colors 
suppose we want to have green dot we can get the value right over here and uh, this becomes my t-shirt that's it just save and run your file and here we have the output one order for a green t-shirt let us go back let us create one more enum there may be times where you don't require a value let me show you one example let me create a class called as role we can inherit from enum now suppose you want to create different roles for your staff it could be a associate it could be a supervisor and so on and you don't want to assign values to them but what we can do is we can automatically give them values let us see how to do that suppose the first rule is for an associate we can assign it a value by using our imported function called as auto now remember on on line number eight we are importing auto and that's what we are going to use right over here so what this auto is going to do is the first time it is going to assign the value as one the next time it is going to assign the value of two so suppose we have one more role for a supervisor and we assign it to auto so this time the value of supervisor would be set to two suppose we have one more role for the manager now this time the value of manager would be three let us try and print it out so i can say print from my enum of role i want you to go to my manager and i want you to print the value let us run this file and here you can see that the value of manager is automatically set to three welcome to a brand new section this section is all about functions till now we have used inbuilt functions such as print and in this section we are going to learn how to create our own functions but before we can create our own functions i wanted to talk a little bit about functions the main goal of a function is for your data processing you have some sort of an input this input goes inside your function your function processes the data and finally we would like to have some sort of an output so this is your ideal function you take an input you process it and you give back an output but in real life it's not so simple so let's try learning more about functions so let us go back to our code editor behind the scenes i have created a folder called as 05 functions and this is the file called as greater.py let us see what's going to happen right now so this is a very simple program for greeting and the people in zorton they greet each other by saying zola and Lewis wants to write a program where he can greet his friends in Zola. So let's define a function. And the way to define a function is by using the keyword called as def followed by the name of the function. So we can say the name of my function is greeter. And this function accepts one argument. And we can call that argument as anything. In this case, I'm going to call that argument as name and then you put your colons and inside of this you have to write the body or the logic of the function you can also write some sort of a documentation and you can do that by using your triple quotes so you can say that this function greets zorton let us go to the next line and let us print out a greeting message so what we can do is we can simply print out a message we can use our formatted string and then we can say zola followed by the name now let us see how we can define the types for this function we can say that this function of greeter accepts one argument and we can define the type right over here so we can say my argument has to be the type of a string and since this function returns nothing so we can say that this function is going to return none let's create one more function called as main so you can say this is my main function this function does not accept any arguments and this function returns nothing here we can create a list of all of the friends so i can create a variable called as friends and let me assign some values to it so these are all of the list of the friends and we want to greet all of these friends we can create a very simple for loop and using the for loop we can call this function let me show how it is to be done 
but before that let me add the types for this as well so friends is a list and the data type is a string on the next line we can say that for my friend in my list of friends for each iteration i simply want to invoke the function of greeter and pass a name so what we can say right over here is for each iteration i want to call the function of greeter and i simply want to pass the friend each time now the reason why we have created a main function is just by sake of convention we always like our programs to start with a function which is named as main now let us see how to use this function you need to invoke or you need to call this function in order for our program to run so on the next line we can invoke our main function and the way to invoke is by just writing main along with the brackets so whenever you write the brackets that means that you want to invoke the function if you just write like this it means an assignment but if you want to run that means you want to put the brackets so let me save this and let me try to run this file and here we have the output so we have zola cc zola roco and so on we just saw how to write a function and in this video i will show you how we can write a slightly better version of our greeter function first let us go back to our diagram now in an ideal world we would like to take one input and we would also like to give back an output but let us have a look at this function called as greeter we are taking an input but we are not returning an output so let us see how we can create a better version of this so behind the scenes i have created a file called as betagreeter.py and let us get started with this one let us go back to this file and let me copy all of these things so let me copy right from here let me go back to this file and let me paste everything right over here let me collapse my sidebar and this time let us try and return something so instead of just printing zola followed by the name we can actually return this value so let me take out the print statement the bracket as well and here i can say that i want to return my new string so what this function is going to do is it is accepting one argument and it is transforming that string into a greeting message and we are returning that string as well now since this function is returning a value we also need to change the type over here and the type is string so what happens is when we were using the print function we were causing something which is called as a side effect but this function is a more pure function it takes one input and it gives back one output now it is the responsibility of the caller function of how to handle the return data let me tell you let me show you what i mean by it but first let me write some comments so let me go right over here and put me some comments saying that the caller function is responsible for the return data and here i can say that this function transform the original string to something useful and let us change the documentation as well so this function is going to return a greeting message now let us go down and let us see what's happening on line number 25 we are invoking the function of greeter and our main function is responsible for calling this function that means conceptually you can call the main function as your caller function that means main is calling greeter and now it is the responsibility of your caller function that means it is the responsibility of your main function of how to handle the return values now this pattern is very useful what if you wanted to check for the return values you can check for the return values and you can do something with it let us have a small example right over here let me put up some comments over here now suppose luis finds chico to be cute so what we can do is we can say for each iteration if chico is in the output of my function of greeter so greeter and friend now remember our function of greeter is returning back a string and if that string contains chico then we can print out something like this so here we can say that friend 
is queued or else we can simply print out the message as it is so here we can simply print our greeter and friend so what's happening is for each iteration our function of greeter is returning back some values and that value is zola followed by the name of the friend so for the first iteration the return value is zola cc the second time is zola roco and the third time is chico and so on but since the function of greeter is returning us data we can handle that data in multiple ways so first let me run this file and then let me try and explain you again one more time so here we have the output that chico is queued so what's happening on line number 27 is let me open up my ipython shell so here i can say if chico in zola chico then we have the answer as true if we say something like this Lewis in Zora Chico, the answer is false. And that is what we are doing on this line. Suppose the output of this function is Zora Chico. That time we simply want to print out a message saying that Chico is queued. So basically what we are trying to do is our caller function is handling the response of greeter in multiple ways. Let's have some more practice with our functions. For this video, behind the scenes, I have created a file called as wait.py and let us see what's happening. Now since Lewis is staying in Zorton, gravity works differently over there. And this time we want to calculate how much you weight in Zorton. And this is the formula to convert the Earth's weight to Zorton's weight. Let me go down over here and let us define a function which is called as calculate weight this will accept one argument which we can call as weight we can define the type as a float because your weight can have decimal values so let me write the type as a float and this function will also return the float value inside the body of the function we can have one single return statement and we can say that i want to return and here we can calculate the weight by using the formula so we can say the weight plus of 32 divided by 8 now let us try and print out the weight so let me write a very simple print statement we can use our formatted strings so we can say u weigh and inside the curly brackets let us invoke the function so i can say calculate weight and for example let's pass 60 kgs and then we can say kgs on zorton let us save this and let us try running this program so here we have the output saying that you weigh 11.5 kgs on zorton let us go back i wanted to show you one small trick what happens if we want to display exactly two decimal places or three decimal places and so on the way to do that is right over here so here we can say that i want to display my two decimal places for the float just save your file and try running it for the last time and here we have the output so you can see we have two decimal places let us have a look at the next example this time I am working on this file called as fly.py and let's see what's happening this time. Now we just saw that gravity in Zorton is much less as compared to earth. So what happens is if you weigh 15 kgs or less then you can actually fly on Zorton. So what Lewis wants to do is Lewis wants to see which of his friends can fly. So let's see how to work with this one. And there is one very important concept which is called as single responsibility principle. And let us see what do I mean by this principle in this video. So as a convention, let us create our main function first and from there we will create functions as we require them. So let me define my main function. So I can say my define and main. This function does not take anything and it returns none. So I can write none over here. 
Now inside of this function, let us create the friends of Lewis. So let me create my dictionary of friends and let me assign some values to it. So here we can see that we have a couple of values. CC is being 54, Roco is being 88 and so on. Let us also write the types for this one. So friends is my dictionary. The keys are strings and the values are integers. What we can do over here is instead of just declaring integers, we can also write a float. So in case if we have a decimal value in the future, we can easily handle it if we declare it as a float. Next, let us create a function called as flying friends and see which of the friends can fly. So I can say my function of flying friends and we just have to pass the dictionary of friends. Now let us go up and let us start creating our functions. So as you can see, there is one small constraint and that constraint is you have to weigh 15 kgs in order to fly. So what we can do is we can create a constant. So let me call the constant as maximum flying weight and we can assign it a value of 15. Let us also define the type for this one. So since this is a constant, it has to be declared as final. But before we can write final, we need to import it. So here I can say that from typing, I want to import final. And here we can use the keyword of final. So our maximum flying weight is a final. And the type we can define it to be a float as well. Now let us go down and let us create the function for flying friends. So here we can say that define flying friends. This takes one argument. Let us call that argument as friends. And, and as you can see on line number 28, we are passing the argument of friends. And the type of friends is this one. It's dictionary string and float. So let me copy this right from here. And let me go back to my line number 18. So we can define the type right over here. So this friends is going to be a dictionary and this function is not going to return anything. So I can just write none. Let me also write some documentation for this function. So what this function is going to do is this function is going to display all of the flying and non flying friends. Now remember that this function is creating a side effect. This function is not going to return anything. That's why we can say that this function creates a side effect. Now let us go down and let us define the body of this function. So here what we can do is we can use a for loop to iterate over the friends and see which of the friends can fly or not. So I can say for the name and earth weight in the dictionary of friends. We want to get all of the items. Now remember that the keys are the names. So if you see right over here, the key is the name. That's why I'm naming this parameter as name and the values are the weight. So that's what I'm calling as earth weight right over here. So for each iteration, the first thing that we want to do is we want to calculate the weight in Zorton. So let me create a variable called as Zorton weight. And here we need to calculate. But for calculation, let us create another function called as calculate weight. So let me write the function first and then we will create it. So calculate weight would be my function and I need to pass my earth weight to it. Now let us go up and define this function. We have defined this function in our last video. So let me open up that file right over here. So the file was called as weight.py and I just have to copy this, go back to my current file. Let me collapse my sidebar and let me go to the top and we can paste it right over here. Let me also add some documentation. So what this function is doing is this function is calculating your weight in Zorton. So this is an example of data transformation. It is taking a weight in kgs and it is returning the same weight but in Zorton in weight, you can also say that this function is a pure function since it takes one input and gives back one output. Now let us go back to our function of flying friends. So on line number 36, we are able to calculate the weight in Zorton. 
Now the next thing to do is we just need to check if we can fly or not. So here we can say that if and here we need one more function to check if we can fly or not. So first let me write it and then we will create the function. We can call that function as can fly and we need to pass the weight in Zorton. So let me pass my Zorton weight. Now let us go up and create this function as can fly. So just let me go right over here and I can define my function as can fly. This function accepts weight and the type would be a float and this function is going to return a boolean value. Let me write some documentation for this as well. So the only responsibility of this function is it is going to see if you can fly or not. That's why we have the return value as the boolean. So this function is also a very nice example of data transformation. So we can see that we are accepting a data which is of the type of float. Then we are transforming that data and we are transforming from a float value to a boolean value. Let us see how we can write the body of this function. Now the body of this function is very simple. We just have to say that we have to return if my weight is less than or equal to our constant of maximum flying weight. So what we are doing is we are basically composing functions where each function has only a single responsibility. For example, this function of can fly, the only responsibility of this function is to say you if you can fly or not. Now, the only responsibility of this function calculate weight is just to transform the weight from the earth to the Zortanian weight. Now let us go back. On line number 47, we have created this function can fly. Now this function is returning a bool value so we can use it with our if and else blocks. Let me take it a little up. So here we can say that if the friend can fly, then we can simply print out a nice statement saying that here we can put the name and then we can display the weight in Zorton and then we can say kgs can fly on Zorton else that means the friend can't fly in that case let us print out another statement saying that the name followed by the Zorton weight can only walk on Zorton let us save it and let us try running this file but before we can run this file we have to invoke our main function so let me go at the bottom and here I can say that I want to invoke my main function so I can say main followed by our brackets. Let me save it and now let's run this file. So here we have the output cc the weight is 10.75 in Zorton so she can fly. But for Nico, Nico weighs 16.75 so he can only walk on Zorton and similar with Zico as well. So getting back to our program, what we have done is we have seen how to create functions which can have a single responsibility principle. Now let us understand one more very important part of functions and that is how we can work with variable arguments and variable keyword arguments. Let me create a file over here and let me name it as arguments and keyword arguments. That means ARGS and KWARGS for short. Let me put up some comments. The first thing that I want to show you inside this program is all about unpacking. First, we will see how we can unpack a couple of data structures in Python. And once we understand unpacking, then we can move to the variable and the keyword variable arguments. So the first thing that I want to show you is all about unpacking. Suppose you have a tuple like this, Lewis and Zappa. You can unpack the values of this tuple in a single line. So on the left, I can say that my Lewis would be my first name. So I can write F name and Zappa would be my last name. So I can say L name and that's it. This is called as tuple unpacking. Lewis would be assigned to this variable and Zappa would be assigned to this variable. Just to confirm, let us print out the values and see what we're getting. And you can see we are getting the right values. Now let's see how we can unpack a list. 
Suppose you have a list like this and I want to unpack this list. But while unpacking, I only want the first value inside a variable and I want all of the rest into a separate list. We can do this by using a special syntax. So I can say first, then I can say star rest of the values is equal to my list. So let's see what's happening. The first value that means CC is assigned to this variable and Roko, Chico and Nico inside a list is being assigned to this variable. You can name the variables whatever you want. Let's try to print out the value and check if we are getting the right output or not. Let me run the file and here you can check the output. Let me take it up. The first value is CC and that's what we are getting right over here. Rest is a list of all of the remaining values, Roko, Chico and Nico. That's what we have right over here. Next, let us see how we can unpack a dictionary. Suppose we have an existing dictionary like this. So this is for specifications. Type is dynamic, optional static typing and it is found everywhere. Let us create a new dictionary and let us try to unpack the existing dictionary into it. So let me call the new variable as lang and I can say name is python. Now I can unpack the entire dictionary right over here by using a very special syntax. So I can say star star followed by the name of the dictionary that we want to unpack. So the name of the dictionary is specs. That's it. Let us print it out and see what we are getting. And as you can see, we have the right dictionary. So the name is Python. And here you can see we have unpacked the entire other dictionary as well. Now let's go back to our program. Now let's try to think of a situation where we would use this functionality. Suppose we have a function and this function has to accept a known number of arguments. At that time, we can use this functionality. Now suppose we have a function called as unknown friends and we don't know the number of friends that we are going to get in the arguments. So here I can say that we are going to receive variable argument and that variable argument I can declare by writing star and the name of the variable. As a convention, whenever we are getting variable arguments, we name that variable as args. Now let's go to the body and see what we can do with this one. Let's try to simply print out the values. So I can say for my friend in my arguments, I simply want to print out my friend. Oh, it has to be friend, not friends. So this looks good. Now let's see how we can add types to this function. By default, Python is going to pack all of the variable arguments inside a tuple. So essentially what's happening is this argument is going to be of the type of tuple. And since this function is not returning anything, this is going to return none. Let us invoke this function on the next line so I can say my unknown friends. And here let me pass a couple of friends. So I am passing an unknown number of friends. Now adding type hint to this variable, it's a little tricky because by default args is a tuple, but we can say this tuple is of the type of string and that's it. This is how we would add type hints to our variable arguments. This simply means that our variable of args is a tuple and the data type inside the tuple is of the type of string. Let us try to save this file and let me try to run it and we have the right output. We can see all of the friends right over here. So all of these friends are coming from this line right over here, line number 33. Now similarly, we can also accept keyword arguments. Now, what do you mean by a keyword argument? First, let me write the program and then I will explain what exactly I mean by a keyword argument. So let me put up a comment. So suppose we have a function called as unknown product and this function accepts a variable keyword arguments. So that can be denoted by two stars. And by convention, we always 
name the variable as kwargs that means keyword arguments now let's see what we can do inside the body of this function now what python is going to do is it is going to pack all of the keyword arguments in the form of a dictionary so we can simply print out the key and the value from our keyword args dot items and let us print it out i can also write this in a short form v for value and k for for the key and here i can simply say i want to print out my key and my value now let me try to invoke this function by passing keyword arguments so this is the place where all of the things are going to get cleared so i can say my unknown product and the keyword arguments would look something like this name is equal to pizza price is equal to 3.99 topping is equal to olives and so on so you can see all of the arguments are in the form of the key and the value the key and the value so that's why we call this variable as a variable keyword argument by default it's always going to be in a form of a dictionary now let's see how we can add types to this one now adding types for this one is really very tricky if you see our keyword arguments the first one is a string the next one is a float the last one is a boolean so we don't know what kind of argument we can get inside the dictionary so this time what we can say that the values can be anything so i can write the type as any and let me import any from our typing library so on the top i can say from typing i want to import any so what this really means is since we don't know the value of the type of the dictionary we are going to accept any kind of a value and since this function is not going to return anything we can say that the return type is none let's try to run our program and here is the output let me just take it up so for the variable keyword arguments we have name price toppings and extra cheese and that is what we have right over here now let's see how we can combine both of these concepts together that means let us combine the variable arguments and the variable keyword arguments in a single function so let me put up a comment over here suppose i have a function called as invoice wherein i am supposed to generate an invoice for a product but i don't know what is the product i don't know the characteristics of the product then how do i handle this situation so let's see how we can define the function the first argument can be the name of the product so i can simply write as product the type is going to be a string after that since we don't know what the product is all about or the different varieties of the product we can simply write that we can also accept a variable argument right over here now suppose the user gives an argument in the form of keywords we can handle that situation as well by using our keyword argument so we can say double star keyword and args and this time let us simply print out our product arguments and our keyword arguments so i can say i want to print out my product let me copy and paste then i want to print out my arguments then i want to print out my keyword arguments now since this function is not going to return anything so i can say that it's going to return none now let's try to invoke this function so let me go down over here i can say invoice my product could be sneakers now suppose the sneakers are available in black and white color so i can give a variable number of arguments so i can say black and white we can also define a couple of keyword arguments over here suppose we know the name of the brand so we can say my brand is equal to maybe it's nike the category would be my air jordans 
price could be $899.99 in stock would be a boolean value and let me assign it a value of false the sneakers are not in stock let me save my file so as you can see my formatter which is black it automatically formats my file now let me save the file and let me run it for the last time and here we have the output so let me just take this down the product is our sneakers so that's what we are getting over here now this arguments by default this is going to be a tuple so that's why we have a tuple over here and the keyword arguments this is always going to be packed as a dictionary so that's why we have the last line as a dictionary there is one more important concept that i want to cover and after that we can move on to our game this concept is called as your local and global variables for this i want you to create a new folder right over here and i want you to call that folder as scratchpad you can utilize this folder for writing small programs and for doing small experiments i always create and use a scratch folder let's create one file inside of this folder and let me name it as variable scopes let me put up a heading right over here so we are going to talk about global and local scopes before that let us try to understand one more concept all of these files that we are creating these files are technically called as modules so in the world of python all of these files are modules now let's go back to our file inside our module if we declare a variable like this num is equal to 10 that means this variable has a global scope that means anyone inside our module can use this variable any function or any functionality or any variable inside the module can use this variable so let's create a function called as print global num and this is simply going to print out our number let me save it and let me invoke it right over here so i can say print global number we can do a slight improvement over here we can use a formatted string and we can say global number is and this is my number now let us try to execute this file and we have an output saying that the global number is 10. now let us see what happens if we declare one more function and if we declare the same variable inside that function so let me create a new function by the name of print num this does not accept anything and inside this function let me assign a value of 20 to the variable of num and let us try to print out and see what values we are getting over here so i can use my formatted string my local number is num let us invoke this function and let us see what we are getting let me run this file and here is the output now watch closely what's happening on line number 8 we have declared that the num is 10 and on line number 16 we are saying that num is equal to 20 now what happens is whenever python sees we have the same variable python is going to create a new variable called as num and this variable is available only inside our variable of print num and that's it so this is also called as variable shadowing now please keep in mind that this variable shadowing can introduce a lot of bugs and these bugs can be really difficult to debug just to demonstrate let me go right over here and let me say i want to print my num let me save it and let me try to run it so here you can see the global num is 10 but on the second line the local number is 20 and this 20 is coming from our line number line number 17 so this variable is accessible only inside this function and it is not valid outside 
outside only this number that we have declared online number 8 is visible that's why we are getting the output of 10 right over here now let us see how we can access this global variable and how we can do some operations on it let us create a new function by the name of increment number here we simply want to increment our number by 2 so we can say my num plus equal to 2 but what's happening right over here is python is seeing that we are doing some sort of an operation on num so python is going to create a new variable we want to increment the global num so we have to explicitly tell python that hey python i want you to use the global num and that's it let me put up some comments so i have a comment for this one and this one is my function or my local scope and this one for my global declaration let me save it now let me increment the number and then we can print it out so let me say that i want to increment the number let me save it and let me try to run it so this time you can see the global number is 12. now let's see one more behavior of the global number so here let me create a new function by the name of increment my local num and here i am saying that my new number is is equal to my existing number plus of 10 and let me print out my new number right over here now can you tell me what is going to be the output of line number 30 well we don't have to guess we can simply run the program and let's see what output we are getting so let me invoke the function right over here so i can say my new function i want to invoke it let me save the file and let me run it so as you can see i'm getting the output as 22 let us see what's happening right over here so as you can see on line number 29 the value inside num is 12 you can see that's what it is and since we are creating a new variable and we are trying to assign value to the new variable python is taking this num from the global scope in the global scope the value is 12 and we are trying to add 10 that's why the new number is 22 in the next video we will go back to our game and let us see how we can divide all of the logic into small functions now let's see how we can use functions inside our game so i want you to just copy this file from folder number four to our folder number five and uh, i want to just rename this file from number two to number three and that's it and let me also change the documentation for this module in this video we are going to concentrate on two main things the first concept is called as dry that means don't repeat yourself what this means is whenever we have some kind of a logic that is repeating at that time we want to take the logic out and put that logic inside a function and we can keep on using that function wherever we require it the next one is what i've already shown you this is called as single responsibility principle that means we want to define our functions in a way that one function will ideally do one job at a time let's see how we can do all of these things let me go down over here so here you can see that we have a list of all the superheroes and all of our super villains so what i can do is i can create a function that will return the list of all of these superheroes and super villains as well now why do we need to do this the answer is we want to isolate parts of our program suppose you're working in a team and you don't want any other developer to add or subtract from your list of characters so that's why we need to have some sort of an isolation so let us create a function for superheroes and super villains as well let me put a comment right over here so this block is going to be for my superheroes let me define a function called as get all superheroes this is not going to take anything and let me take all of these things inside my function and since i'm going to return a list of superheroes i will also cut my line from 51 and i'll put it inside my function 
which is right over here i also need to return my list so i'm going to use the keyword of return and i want to return my list of superheroes now since my function is returning a list of characters so the return type of my function would be like this so this function is going to return a list of characters till now i have been using this keyword of final because i just wanted to show you that whenever we type everything in capital that symbolizes a constant and we don't want to change the value in the future but these days your code editor and my pack is smart enough to infer that if we write everything in capital we can actually skip writing final so i'm just going to take it out what i can do is i can just leave final on this line number 40 just as a reference for you and let me take it out right over here and uh, this one and this one let me save my file if you just hover over any of the variable you can see that we have the word of constant that means my pi and your code editor they are able to correctly infer that this is a constant let us create one more function to get a particular superhero in this function we can get all of the superheroes but what happens if we want to get a particular superhero and remember this is a list of superheroes so we can get a particular superhero if we know the index suppose the index number is 1 so we can return black widow if the index number is 3 then we can return hulk and so on so let's create a function to return a single superhero let's create a function right over here so i can say define a function called as get superhero this function is going to accept one parameter called as index of the type of integer and let us see what this function is going to return this function is going to return a character but what happens if we can't find a character in that case we also have to return none so this function is either going to return a character or it is going to return none let's see how we can implement the logic let me add some documentation right over here but before we can get a superhero we need the list of our superheroes but that's pretty easy we just created an entire function for this so i can just say that my superheroes is equal to the function get all superheroes and that's it we have the list of all our superheroes now let's see the logic of getting a single superhero from the list of superheroes we already know how to work with indexes but this time we have to be a little more careful what happens if we get an index number which does not exist that time our program will panic and it will exit but we don't want this kind of a behavior let me go to my ipython shell and let me show you what i'm talking about suppose i have a list called as my characters would be a b c and d here you can see the length is 4 so i have 4 characters so the length is 4 but my index number stops at 3 so this is my index number 0 index number 1 index number 2 and index number 3 we don't have a index number 4 now what happens if i say i want to get characters on my index number 4 this is going to cause an error let's see what's happening so as you can see we have an error and the error is the index is out of range and we want to avoid this situation inside our program because we don't want our program to panic and exit so let's go back and here we can say if my index so if my index is less than the length of my list of superheroes only then i can have the right index number so here i can say i simply want to return from the list of superheroes the superhero at the given index else we have some issue and here i can return none because we can't find a superhero let me just save my file let's do the same logic for our super villains as well let me put up a comment these blocks are for my villains let us define a function get all villains this is going to return a list of my characters and let me take all of these things inside and then i also want to 
return my list so return villains then we want one more function to get our single villain so let me copy and paste this block so this goes right over here this becomes from superheroes to villain and that's it so now we have a way of getting a particular character and and how to get a list of our characters now let's see where we can use this logic the place where we want to use this is right over here on line number 98 and 99 here you can see we first generate a random index and after that we want to get a superhero given that index let me use the function right over here but before we can use this function as you can see we have a block for the attack we can create a function for the attack and we can isolate this functionality as well so let's start doing that so let me add a comment saying that this is the main logic for the game and i can define a function called as attack this is going to return nothing so i can say none and let me take all of these things inside my function so all of these things goes inside my function let us change this logic so this becomes i want to get superhero from the given hero index and this becomes get my villain from the given index just save a file and you can see we have a bunch of errors let's start addressing these errors one by one first thing that i want to change is this variable what i mean to say attack is the attack number so we can improve the name of the variable from attack to attack number let me change right over here as well so as you can see inside my print statement i'm using this variable so this also needs to be changed from attack to attack number there is one more finer point that i want you to think if you see at the definition of our get superhero we are returning a character or none so what happens if we don't have a superhero or if we don't have a villain in that case we can't have a fight let's create some logic to handle this as well so here after this line i can say if i have a superhero and if i have villain so my current villain only in that case i can do something let me write a comment over here so if we have a superhero and we have a super villain in that case we are going to have the attack else that means we don't have a superhero we don't have a super villain that means we have an error so let me print out a message saying that error no superhero or villains to fight now let us go to this line line number 104 what happens if we have a valid hero and a valid villain then we need to have an actual attack so all of this logic from line number 108 to 117 should go right over here but we are going to create one more function to simulate the attack if you're wondering why do we require so many functions the answer is for flexibility if in the future you have some more characters if you are fighting seeing changes then you can change only a single function and the changes would be reflected throughout your program so we want to have our program as modular as possible that's the reason why we are creating so many different functions first let me invoke the function and then i will define the function so the function would be called as simulate attack simulate attack now let's see what we need to pass to this function the first thing that i want to pass is my attack number remember we can have only three attacks so that's why we have the range of three over here so i can say the first parameter i want to pass is my attack number then obviously we need the superhero and we also need the super villain now let's go down to line number 107 and let's create this function so let me just copy all of this let me go down let me create a function let me say that define function put my quotes let me add a comment i also need to adjust the spacing because this is out of format
now let's work on this function so here i don't need the word of current this has to go this also has to go it has to go from everywhere so let me do a multi select so this looks good let me save my file everything is looking really good let me put a comment right away so this is a place where we are setting the life this is where we print some nice message and this is the place where the actual attack is taking place but i'm not really happy with this logic here we are manually adding and we are manually decrementing let us create functions for this as well you must be thinking that i have gone crazy why do we require so many functions let me ask you a question suppose tomorrow the logic of the game evolves and you have some bonus attacking power or you have some bonus life then what do you do so at that time you simply have to change the logic in a single function and that's it so let's develop this habit of making the logic inside different functions as possible and let us try to stick to the principle of single responsibility function that means i want my function to do only one job and also in the future when we learn testing at that time testing functions becomes a much more simpler job so let's see what functions we are going to require we are going to require one function to increment the life of the superhero one to increment the life of the villain and then one more to decrement the life of the villain and one more to decrement the life of the superhero so we require four different functions to do all of these things so let me go to the top and uh, here just below the characters let me put up a comment so this block is for the life let me go below and uh, i want to take this variables to the top as well so let me paste it right over here and here we can start creating our functions the first one was to increment the hero life so this function accepts life which is of the type of integer and it returns nothing so it has to return none let me put a comment now let's see how to use the logic inside of this here i have to operate on this variable and if you remember the last video this variable is defined on a global scope that means i have to use the keyword of global to reference this one so let me go down over here and let me say that i want to use the global variable of hero life and uh, let us increment the life so i can say hero life is equal to plus my life and that's it we can also use the shorthand syntax so i can simply say plus equal to so let us copy and paste this one and this time let us decrement so i can say decrement this becomes decreases this becomes minus equal to and let us do the same thing for our villain as well so let me copy all of this and let me put it over here and my hero becomes villain so let me do a multi select and this becomes my villain let me copy and paste this one for the last time so this one to decrement so this becomes decrement decreases minus equal to let me save my file everything is looking really good let us go down and see what we are supposed to do next now once inside our function of simulate attack let's see how we can use this functionality but first let us set the types for our function definition so the attack number is my integer my superhero is my character villain is also of the type of my character and this function is going to return nothing so i can say none now let's use the newly created functions so we can use the function right over here so i want to increment the life of superhero so let me grab this let me take it out and write the name of the function this was to increment the hero life same thing will happen here also let me take it out 
put it inside my brackets i want to increment my life of the villain let us do the same thing so here first i want to decrement the life of the hero so let me put this inside my brackets and i can say i want to decrement the hero life and let us do it here as well and here i can say i can decrement the villain life just save your file and we can see we have a couple of errors so let's see what's happening so what's happening is mypy is complaining because of incompatible types for now you can ignore the error but let me try and explain what's happening all of these errors will go away when we convert all of the characters into classes in the future videos but right now what's happening is if we go to the definition of our character here you can see the values can either be a string or an integer this is the thing that mypy is trying to complain it's saying that we can't add or we can't subtract strings right over here so that's why it is showing this error so let's move on and let's go to the next block so this is the place where we are seeing if we have lost or if we have won the game we can create a function for this as well so i can put up a comment saying that this is for my final game status and let us define a function called as win or lose it's not going to accept anything and it is going to return nothing let me take all of these things inside we can slightly improve the code as well on line number 164 and 166 we are printing a statement so let us get those variables inside our function so here they are let me take them out and and let me paste it right over here they have to have the right formatting let me put up some documentation right over here and little space let me save and see if everything is all right or not everything looks good and we have a very nicely typed program the last thing to do is just to define our main function and we simply have to invoke it writing the main function is the most simplest thing so we can just say let me define my main function this is also going to return nothing so this is the place where we would start the game first thing is we want to have an attack the next thing is we want to check if we have lost or won and that's it the last thing to do is we simply have to invoke this function so i can just say main just save your file and let me just browse if we have some errors or not we can ignore this error as i have just explained but let me check if we have some errors no no everything is looking beautiful all right so let's go down and let us try and play this game beautiful it looks like i have defeated thanos in the first try itself it's amazing hi we are officially at the end of this section but i have decided to add one more bonus video now this bonus video is all about teaching you higher order functions now learning higher order functions can be a little bit challenging for beginners so i want you to just sit back and relax and just watch as if you are watching a movie if you can understand the concept then it's really amazing if you can't there is nothing to lose and normally it will take you multiple att attempts maybe twice or thrice before you can understand the concept and which is perfectly fine i don't blame you for that the concept itself can be a little more challenging so just enjoy and see if you can get it welcome to the world of functions Let's start by understanding what are functions and how they are managed inside our memory. So suppose we have a couple of functions. So here I have defined two functions. One is hello and the next one is good morning. So these are pretty simple functions. Now let's see what's happening inside our memory. So this green area would be our memory. Now please keep in mind that this is a very simplified version. In actual life, things are much more complicated. 
let's see what's going to happen now when python comes across this line number three and four it is going to create a function called as hello inside our memory so this is what is happening we have a function called as hello inside our memory now the next question is how does python know how many functions it has created inside the memory the answer is python gives each and every object a unique id now what do i mean by an object object is a generic term just like all of us are human beings but we are also animals same thing anything inside the world of python is an object a variable is an object a class is an object a function is an object anything is an object inside the world of python so let me say python is going to create an object which is of the type of function inside the memory and the way python is going to keep a track of all of the objects inside the memory is by giving each one of them a unique id it's just like us every one of us has a unique passport number so you can say each one of us has a unique id as well the next question would be how does python know where does the object live it knows because it allocates some address to the object it's just like us every one of us has an address similarly inside the world of python every object which is created inside the memory also has an address and this is how it looks like now this format is a very special format it is called as hexadecimal format you can see this address always starts with a zero followed by an x so whenever you see this format it means it's an hexadecimal format it is just a way of representing the memory inside our computer now what happens when python goes to next line line number seven it sees that we have another function so it goes back to the memory and it creates another function by the name of good morning now good morning also has a unique id and it also has a unique address so for example we can say good morning has this address right over here we can see this in action inside our ipython shell so let me open up my ipython shell so here it is so here i can say my definition of hello it's simply printing out hello world so here i'm just creating a very simple function let us see the id of this function so i can simply type I want to see the ID of my function called as hello. So this is the unique ID of our function. You can also ask Python to reveal the type of this object. So you can say, I want to see the type of hello and the type is a function. If you want to see the address, then we can say, I want to see the hexadecimal of the object, which has an ID of hello. And here it is. So this is the address of hello inside our memory. Let us create one more function. So let me define a function called as good morning. And on the next line, I can say, I simply want to print good morning. So we have another function. Let's see the ID of good morning. Now you can see we have a different ID. This ID ends in 144 the id of hello was 032 let us also check the address of this one so i can say hex id of good morning so you can see we have a different address so this is f7 f0 and here it was b370 so that means hello and good morning are two different objects with two different id and with two different address inside our memory let me clear my terminal and now watch closely what happens if i create a variable called as greet and if i assign it the value of hello and if i try to invoke greet we have an output called as hello world so what's this what's happening behind the scenes now let us go back to our diagram to understand what's happening what's happening is python is actually playing a trick with us so this is the variable which we just created but if you check its address it has the same address as hello so in short what python is doing is it is just creating a reference to hello so the greet variable is just referencing the function of hello it's just like sharing your house and when we invoke this function by using brackets so when we use the bracket that means we are invoking here you can see i don't have the bracket on line number 33 i am just assigning the function of hello to greet 
and on the next line i am using brackets to invoke the function and when we invoke the function we get the output of hello world so what happens is when we invoke greet it goes back it sees that greet is actually referencing hello and behind the scenes it's this function which is being executed but on the scene it looks like it's the function called as greet which is being executed now let's get back to our code editor and start writing some code what i've done is behind the scenes i have created a new file called as hof this stands for higher order functions.py and i have created a couple of comments for us the type of function is also called as callable because this object can be called we can give some arguments to it and we can get some values from it that's why in the world of python functions are also called as callables if you're thinking why do we need this kind of a functionality the answer is till now we have been passing data to the functions but sometimes it can be very expensive so what's the solution the solution is passing the function to the data you have to just start thinking in reverse so what we are going to do is we have some data and we would be passing functions to it imagine you have terabytes and terabytes of data it would be so expensive to transport all of this data from one server to the another server just for the sake of computation instead we can simply pass a function to the data and we can get our job done much more easily so let's start by creating the same function called as hello right over here so this is the function that we created the next point i again want to reiterate that function is just a regular object of the type of function there is nothing special about it now let us print let us also try to print the id of hello and let us also try to print the type of hello let me run the file so here it is let me take it up a little bit okay so when i'm saying i just want to print hello so hello is a function which is present at this address the id is this one and the type is actually a class of the type of function let's get back and see what else we can do now let's try to create a variable and assign the value of hello to that variable so let me put a comment and let us create the variable called as greet and let me assign the value of hello to it again remember i'm not putting my brackets over here because i'm not invoking the function i am just assigning the function hello to the variable of greet now let us try to invoke the function of greet so let me write greet with the brackets let me save the file and let me try to run the file so here we have the output of hello world let us go back and see how we can add types to all of these variables i just explained that hello is also called as a callable inside the world of python so the type of greet is actually a callable type let me go up and let me say that from typing i want to import callable now let us go down let us start adding our types right over here so greet is of the type of callable now if you see the function of hello it is not taking any arguments and it is returning none so what we can do is callable let us put some brackets this means that greet is of the type of callable and inside this brackets we have to specify the input arguments and the output of the function and here inside the square brackets the first argument is always a kind of a list and the second argument is the return type of this function now let's see how we can add the types hello it is not accepting any arguments so the first argument to callable would be empty next our function of hello is returning none so here after the comma i can say it's a callable which returns none and that's it we have a nicely typed function as well let me add some comments just for the sake of reference so here we are just assigning the values and here we are invoking the function let us see what else we can do with our functions let me put a separator and uh, let me put some comments so this time we are going to create a universal greeter remember i just explained the concept that 
we can also pass the functions to the data that's what we are going to do right now i am going to create a universal greeter that takes two arguments the first argument would be for the name and the second argument will actually take a function now suppose you want to greet zola then our universal greeter function will greet as zola if you want to greet as good morning then our function will greet as good morning if you want to greet as goodbye then our function will greet as goodbye sounds so awesome isn't it so first let me type all of the functions and then i will try to explain all of them let me create the first function called as zola so what this function is doing is it is simply taking one argument and it is returning a greeter in the form of zola followed by the name let's create one more function for good morning the next would be for goodbye now let's create our universal greeter function so let me put up a comment over here and i can say my universal greeter so this function is going to accept two parameters the first parameter is the name and let me get the spelling right string the name is of the type of a string now what should be the next argument the next argument is of the type of a function let me name it as greeter the type of this is callable now let's see how we can define the types inside callable look at all of the functions which i have created zola good morning goodbye the function signature is common all of these functions accept only one parameter that two of the type of string and all of this function returns a single argument which is also of the type of string so that's what i am going to pass right over here let's see how we can define the types so the first argument is a list and the second argument is the return type all of the functions are returning strings so i can just write string over here and all of the functions are also accepting a string so inside my inner brackets i can say string so this is called as a function signature all of this function accept one string and return one string same thing we are saying over here our callable accepts one string and returns one string now let's see how we can define the body of this function let me add some documentation now here you would be amazed it is just two lines function the first thing that we want to do is let us take the function of greeter and pass it the argument of name that's it that's the entire logic let me assign the output to a variable called as message and on the next line let me simply print it out just save a file let me try to run the file and after that i will again try to explain what's happening but before that i want to comment all of these things let me comment out all of this i don't need all of these things the greet function as well let us invoke our universal greeter function and then we can have a nice output so let me go right over here and here let's see how we can invoke the function so let me say universal greeter my name is octalium now let's see what we can pass as the second argument if you see right here my ide is telling me that greeter is also a type of function this brackets it denotes a function it takes a string and it returns a string so basically we can pass any functions that satisfies this signature and luckily all of our functions zola good morning and goodbye satisfy this conditions so we are going to pass one by one inside the universal greeter for the first one let me pass simply as zola now remember i don't have to put brackets because i am not invoking i simply have to pass my function and that's it let me copy and paste let me take a little up the second one would be good morning the last one would be goodbye that's it just save a file and let's try to run it and hopefully this time we should have a nice output wow it's so amazing single function can produce 
multiple outputs. Now let's see behind the scenes what's exactly happening. For example, let us take just this line, line number 65. So Zola is actually a function and this is how it looks. Now let's go back to our definition right over here. This Zola comes as a function called as greeter inside our function. Now this greeter is just a reference to the function of Zola. Let me open up my diagram one more time. So imagine this to be our greater function and this to be Zola. So greater is just a reference to Zola. And whenever we invoke this function behind the scenes, the original function is being evoked. So let me go back to my code. So you can see on line number 61, we have a new variable called as greater. So this greater is actually a reference to Zola. We pass one argument of name to the function. This name goes right over here. And if you see the function definition, we are returning a string called as Zola followed by the name. We are saving this string inside a variable called as message. And we simply want to print it out. This is happening with each of the functions. The second time what happens is we are passing good morning. Now the second time this greeter over here, this references good morning. And what good morning is doing is it is simply returning a string good morning followed by the name. We capture this output inside this variable right over here and we are printing it out. And the same thing goes with goodbye as well. That's the reason why every time we have a unique output. First time greeter was referencing Zola. So we have Zola Octalium. Second time it was good morning. So we have good morning Octalium. And the last time we had goodbye. So we have goodbye Octalium. Sounds pretty neat, isn't it? Now let's get back and let's try to learn a little bit more about functions. Let me put a separator. A function as we saw can accept a function, but a function can also return a function. Now this part really took me a couple of attempts to understand. So if you can't get it, don't worry. You will eventually get it. So let's go down and let's see how we can create a function that accepts as well as returns a function. Let me put up a comment. Let us see how we can create a function that will return us a function. Let me define a function called as add by five. This takes one argument number, which is of the type of integer. Now, since this function actually returns a function, so we can say this is going to return a callable and we would define the types a little later on. Right now, just go ahead and let us type the body of the function. Let me add some documentation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one more function inside this function. So let's create one more function. Let me create a function called as by five and this actually does not accept anything and this function returns an integer inside this let me say i want to return the number that we get right over here so i want to return that number plus of five so this is the function inside this one and since our outer function it has to also return a callable so we need to have a return statement and this time I am simply going to return my function, which is going to be this one called as by phi. First, let us see the type hinting and then we will try to understand what's happening. So let me go back to this line. So we know that this function is supposed to return a callable type. Now this callable type is actually this function. So now we can start adding types to it. So here goes my brackets. The first one is for the inputs after the comma is for the output. This function is returning an integer. So let me write int over here. And this function is not accepting anything. So this argument remains blank. Just save your file. So this is also called as your higher order function. Let's see how we can work with these functions. Let me say that a new variable called as sum is equal to my function of add by 5 let me pass a argument of 5 
if you just hover over right over here so your ide is also telling you that the return type is a function which accepts nothing but returns an integer so what's happening is a variable of sum now this is referencing to this variable which is inside we can also invoke sum and let's see if we are getting the right output or not so i can say print and sum and that's it the reason why we are not giving any input right over here is because sum is referencing this function right over here and this function does not accept any argument that's why it is blank let me just save it and let me try to run this file and here we have the output of 10 so this file plus this file is equal to 10 well we can also return a function that accepts an argument that means we can create a function which can actually accept something and do with the data so this time let us create a new function called as universal adder but this adder is going to be a little unique this adder is going to add two numbers and subtract by one it's our own adder so let me go down over here let me take it up let me add a command and let us define a function called as our unique adder now this accepts one number so this is going to be our first number so let me call it as num1 the type is integer this also returns a callable we will add the types shortly let me add some documentation now let us create one function right over here but this function is going to accept another number and we are going to return this number plus another number minus of one so i can say define our adder this function also accepts one argument let me call it as num2 type of integer and this one returns an integer and let us place our logic right over here so since this is a unique adder what we want to do is we want to add the first number the second number and minus of one let us go below and complete the function by adding our return statement so we can say this function right over here this is going to return a callable and this time this callable is going to be adder so we can say return adder let us define the typing for this one so our brackets one more brackets inside for the input argument and the next one for the return argument let us see this function this function is returning an integer so we can say integer right over here and this function is also accepting one integer so inside this brackets i can say integer and that's it we have a beautifully typed function as well let's try to invoke this function and let us see if it is doing its job or not so my adder would be my unique adder let me pass one argument of five and as you can see this is returning one more function and the function signature is integer returning an integer let us print out the value let me use my print statement adder and here i want to give my next number so i want to add five and five let us see what output we should get so i want to add my five with my five but minus of one so the output should be nine so let me save my file and let us try running it and here we have the output of nine let us go back and let us try to study what's happening so what's happening is our function of unique adder is returning another function so this adder is referencing the return callable from this function and the return callable is this function right over here so in short adder is referencing this adder over here let us try with one more example so let me add four and three the output should be four plus three seven minus one six 
let me save it and let me try to run it and here we have the output of 6 let me put it back to 5 and 5 now let us move to the last part which is called as a lambda let me put a separate line over here and let me put some comments so we are going to learn about lambda now lambdas are pretty simple but they are often neglected trust me they are not really complicated it is just a different way of declaring your functions let me first type and then i will show you what's exactly happening let me go to the top right over here now this is a function called as hello let us see how we can define this hello using a lambda so i can say my new function called as hello number two would be a lambda lambda simply means a function now this function is not accepting any arguments so we can just write colon but this returns a string so we can say this is going to return hello world and that's it it's so simple the entire function can be condensed into a single line let me copy this and let me go back to my ipython shell and let's play over there so let me paste it right over here and i can invoke my hello to just as a regular function and we have the output of hello world so lambdas are just your regular functions but they are declared in a different way suppose this function accepts one argument then that argument will come before this colons let me take it out and let me show you one more example let us go right over here for zola so i can say my zola number two would be my lambda now this function of zola accepts one argument as name so i can write name and this returns a formatted string so let me just copy and paste it right over here and that's it we have a lambda function ready let me copy this and paste it in my ipython shell let me paste it and that's it let us invoke this one zola to octalium i forgot to close the string let me close it and we have the output of zola octalium it's pretty simple isn't it let me again take it out so just for the sake of practice let us create one function which will act like a calculator now just imagine your calculator it's a single calculator but it can do multiple functions it can do addition subtraction division and so on so we are going to try and mimic the same functionality by using lambdas so here let me create my first lambda by the name of add so i can say this is going to be a lambda this accepts two number so my number one and my number two and this is just going to return the sum so i can say number one plus number two if you notice we don't use the keyword of written inside the lambda because whatever value that comes after the colon it's automatically returned let me save this one now as a convention the arguments for lambda functions are written as x and y but you can write num1 and num2 but right now just for the sake of simplicity let me convert this to x and y so let me do my multi select this argument becomes my x and the next argument becomes my y let us see how we can add types to our function so as we know lambda is nothing is just a function and we know the function is also called as a callable we can say it is of the type of callable now inside the first brackets are for the inputs the next one is for the output now let us see what's happening our function of lambda is accepting two inputs this is the first one and this is the second one and we want to say that both of the inputs should be of the type of integer so let's go back right over here and we can say the first argument is an integer the second argument is an integer as well and we are returning a single value so we can say 
this function is going to return a single value of the type of integer and that's it let us create one for subtract and one for multiply so let me just copy and paste this would be for subtract i just have to make a very small change this has to be x minus and this one would be for multiply again this is x into so you can see it's so simple let's define a calculator on the next line so i can say define calc now let's see the inputs so obviously we require two numbers so i can say my first one is an integer the second one is also an integer and the third one is going to be a function let me call that function as operation so we are going to operate on both of this number that's why i'm going to call this function as operation you can call anything that you want the type of this one is exactly the type of this one so i just have to copy and paste from here to here now let's go to the return type and this is going to return an integer so what's happening is we have a lambda it is taking two integers and it is also giving an integer in return so this is what we want to return so this integer comes from here to here and inside let me put some documentation here the written statement is extremely simple we simply want to execute the operation on both of our numbers so number one and number two that's it and we simply have to return the output so i can say return save your file and we have a nicely defined calculator as well let's try to invoke our function and let's see if we are getting the right output or not let us try adding four and five so i can say i want to print the output of my calculator i want to add four and five and the operation here is going to be this add operation so i can just pass that function right over here i can say add next let us do subtract and multiply as well so this will be subtract and this would be multiply save your file and let us try it running for the last time and here is the output 4 plus 5 is 9 4 minus 5 is minus 1 4 multiplied by 5 is 20 well that's it for this video I hope you really enjoyed working with functions. More you start practicing with functions, more you will start loving them. And once you are hooked to functions, you may never want to go back again. And if you want to learn the functional approach of programming, then perhaps Python may not be the right programming language because Python is an object oriented language. If you want to learn more about the functional aspect, then you can learn languages such as Elixir, Haskell and Scala. Those languages are built around the functional approach. Welcome to a brand new section. This section is all about object oriented programming. Even though the name sounds pretty big, but the concept is not so difficult. Some of the main aspects of object oriented programming are classes, instances, inheritance and polymorphism. So I would be covering all of those inside this series. Let's go to our code editor and let's start creating some classes. Behind the scenes, I have created one more folder called as 06 oops. And inside of this folder, I have created a file called as basic.py and I have posted some documentation right inside this file. First, let us create a class and then we will see what is it all about and after that i will come to all of this documentation so let me collapse my sidebar so let me go below and let us create our very first class so we can use the keyword of class followed by the name of the class let me just call it as some class i don't care the name right now the next line is for the documentation of the class so let me add some documentation saying that defines an empty class and inside of this i don't want to pass any logic for now i want to keep the body as empty so i can simply say pass and that's it we have created our very first class 
let's try to print it out and see what output we are getting so i can say i want to print out some class let us save it and let us try to run it and here we have the output underscore underscore main underscore underscore dot some class now this output looks a little bit cryptic and we will take care of these things in the future but what this is trying to say is in the main file there is a class called as some class so this some class means this class and this underscore underscore main underscore underscore simply means the main file now this is just a naming convention whenever we execute some python module python behind the scenes names the main module as underscore underscore main underscore underscore so this double underscores are also called as dunders python makes a lot of use of this dunders and we would be seeing them shortly let us go back and create some more classes let me put a separator let us create a class which represents a person so i can say class followed by the name of the class now remember the name of the classes are in pascal case that means the first alphabet of each word has to be capital if you check this class my s was capital and c was capital just make sure you always follow this convention whenever you want to define a class now let's go right over here and create a class of person let me add some documentation that this class defines a person now let's see let's try to imagine a structure of a person every person has a first name and a last name so let us give this properties to our class of person and we can do that by using a dunder method which is called as init now don't fuss over what is this method what is a class and whatever i'm going to show you right now this video is just to show you what is a class and in the next video i will explain you all of the things which are happening behind the scenes right now just go with the flow the first function inside your class always has to be a special function by the name of dunder init so this is how you define it define dunder init dunder this is just a naming convention by python we have a dunder in the front and dunder at the back there is nothing special about this function this is just like your regular function just that we have a different naming style for this one now since this init function belongs to a class the first argument should always be self self actually acts like a reference it means the instance of this class again don't worry i will explain all of these things in the next video this function of init is going to accept two more parameters the first one would be for the first name of the person the type is going to be a string next one would be the last name again a string and always remember that this init method returns nothing so the return type is going to be none and inside let us see how we can construct a person here we have to say that self dot first name is equal to first name so what i'm trying to do is i'm just taking the first name and i'm creating an instance variable called as first name now this can be anything i can also name it as f name and i can write this as f name it doesn't really matter the same goes for this one you can call this abc it doesn't matter but if you are writing abc over here then this also has to be abc but as a convention it is normally self and let me change this to my first name let us create one more instance variable for the last name so i want to say for my instance of a person so that means for self dot last name is equal to last name so the same thing i am taking the last name from my init method and i am creating something which is called as an instance variable right over here now let's see how we can work with this class so i want to say my first person is a type of person the first name is lewis the last name is zappa let me save this and 
let us try to print first person that's it let me comment this out i don't want this one and let me run this file and here we have one more cryptic output saying that it is main dot person object at so and so address if you have seen my last lecture about higher order functions you can make it out that this is a hexadecimal address for this object let us go back and see if we can improve this one let us create one more dunder method and this time the name of the dunder method is called as underscore underscore r e p r so this stands for representation underscore underscore and self always remember the first argument by default inside a class should always be self now this is going to return a string so i'm going to put a string over here and let me just say return and i am going to return a string so i can just say inside my quotes that this is a class of the type of person that's it just save a file and try to run it so this time we have a much better output so this underscore underscore in it and underscore underscore repr these are also called as magic methods python is always going to look for this magic methods whenever it has to create an instance of the person class let me add some documentation over here so this magic method of repr is also known as the official representation of your class now let's see one more magic method let us open up the terminal one more time and to be frank this output doesn't make much sense except that this is saying it is just a class of the person it is not giving any details of which is a person what is the first name what is the last name and so on but we can improve this by using one more magic method and this time the name of this magic method is underscore underscore str so i can say define my str so this str simply means for the string representation of the class and uh, as a convention it has to accept self as the first argument this method also returns a string let me add the documentation saying that this magic methods provides string representation of an instance i will explain all of these things in the next video instance and classes right now just go with the flow and complete this video so here i can say i want to return a string let me construct one string by using our string formatting so i can say person the way to get the first name and the last name is using this syntax self dot first name inside this curly brackets i simply have to say i want to get the first name of this instance so self is acting as a reference it is telling python i want to fetch the first name of this particular person only so let us have the last name as well so we can say self dot last name let us save the file and let us try to run it so this time we have a much better output and this output also makes some sense that this is a person and the name of the person is louis zappa let us create one more person let me put up a comment first over here so what we are doing is we are creating an instance of the class of person let us create one more person so i can say the second person would be person the first name could be cc let me get the c capital and uh, her surname could be neutron let us print it out let me print out my second person save your file and just run it and here we have the output the second person is cc the first person is lewis so i think we have learned enough for this first video in the next video i will explain all of these things and hopefully you would have a better understanding of classes now let us try to demystify our classes so this is the class of person that we have created in the last video 
for this slide i had to slightly compress the syntax so you can see some of the namings are different from the names that we gave the last time so just go with the flow so this was the class that we created last time the name of the class is called as a person and we have a couple of magic methods inside of this one now let's see what's happening inside our memory so as usual this is our memory and let's see what's going to happen next python will see that we have a class called as person and it is going to create a class inside its memory now this class doesn't hold any data this class that you can see over here this is just like a design or rather it is just like a blueprint for a building but we don't have the building yet and how do we know what is the design of this class we can see the design of this class with the special method called as init this method is also called as the constructor or the initialization of our class so let me repeat this is just a class it does not hold any data it is just like a design or a blueprint now let us see what's going to happen on our line number 15 whenever we are creating an object of the type of person that time we say that we are creating an instance of the class of person so let's see what's going to happen python is going to take the design of person from our underscore underscore init method so it's going to take the design so we have the design and it's going to create an instance by the name of person1 so as you can see we have an instance by the name of person1 so that is being constructed inside our memory the same thing happens with person2 as well python is going to take the design of person and it is going to create an instance of person2 so here it is so this is the basic difference between a class and an instance class is like the basic blueprint or the design and an instance is an object of the type of class so person1 and person2 are called as instances the design is called as a class now if you have seen my earlier video about higher order functions you must be knowing that different objects have different memory address so person number one and person number two are completely different objects and they have a completely different memory address just imagine that this is the memory address for person one and this is the memory address for person number two now let's see what's happening behind our constructor or our dunder init method so this method is just acting like fill in the blanks so you can see our constructor this is for the first name and this is for the last name and you can see right over here first name and the last name this init method just acts like a fill in the blanks so it's going to take louis from here and it is going to put it right over here it's going to take zappa and it is going to put it right over here so that's what is happening so if you see inside the memory when the first instance is created the init method is going to assign the first name to louis and the last name to zappa same thing is going to happen with person number two as well whenever we are creating this instance the init method is going to assign the last name sorry this has to be first name not last name the first name to cc and the last name to neutron the last thing that i wanted to explain is all about this keyword of self now self only acts as a reference that means it tells python on which instance do i populate the data or if you want to get the data it simply tells python from which instance do i have the data let me show this in action let us go back to the previous class which is right over here and on the next line let us print out the first name for both the persons so i can say i want to print out my first person's first name and let us do the same thing for the second person as well just save a file and let us try to run it and you can see we have a different output let me take it up the first person's first name is lewis the second person's first name is cc the way python can keep a track of this is because of the keyword of self 
so this first name belongs to the instance of this one so let me show in the diagram whenever we are printing the first name of the first person the self references to the instance on this memory address so python can correctly retrieve the data of lewis and that's what we are seeing on our terminal so let me open up the terminal and this is what we get and similarly when we say we want to print out the first name of the second person let us go back to the diagram the self is telling python that this time the person is actually this one and this person can be found at this address so the first name this time would be cc and not lewis i hope now we have a much better understanding of classes instances objects constructor and so on now let us move on in the next video we just saw that instances have different memory address let me go back to the diagram so here i explained that this instance has a different memory address and this instance has a different memory address now let's see that in action let us go back to our code and here let me put up a comment and i don't want this one so i can take it out this one as well and let's print out the memory address of our p1 and p2 as well so i can say print my formatted string and i can say p1 is located at memory address and if you have seen my video on higher order functions we know that we can get the memory address from hex and then inside we require the id of the object and we require the id of p1 let me copy and paste it this time it has to be p2 this also has to be p2 just save it and let us try to run it so here we can see p1 is located at this address so here you can see this is 4763f and p2 is 479ed so you can see we have two different instances at two different memory locations and both of them have taken the design from the class of person and the constructor was our init method let's create one more function inside our class so let us create a simple function for greet so i can say define greet and as you know the first argument should always be the self self always acts like a reference and this one actually does not return anything so i can say none and here i can say print formatted string let me put the first name self dot first name and then i can print a message saying that first name says hello that's it just save your file now just one small technical detail all of the functions that we create inside the class they are called as methods so let me put up a comment over here so this is a method that prints a greeting message so methods and functions is the same thing the only difference is that methods are always tied to some class that's why they are called as methods now let's see how we can call this methods so let me go right over here let us get the first instance so we can say p1 and we can call the method by dot and the name of the method so we can say i simply want to invoke the method of greet on the first person we can do the same thing on the second person as well so i can say second person and let me put up a comment that's it let me save and let me run it and here we have the output lewis says hello cc says hello if we go back to the definition of class you can see we have four different methods in it representation the string representation and greet what differentiates between this dunder methods and the regular method is that python by default is going to search for this dunder methods so that it can implement its own magic if you change the name from init to something else then the class constructor is not going to work so always make sure you get the naming convention right init is for the construction repr is for the official representation 
and this is just for your reference this is called as a string representation now, even though the name starts with an underscore you can use them just as your regular function let's see how to do that let us go right over here let me make some space and uh, let me print out p1 dot underscore underscore str and that's it so what we are doing is we are simply calling the method called as str on the instance of p1 that's it let me save and let me try to run the file and here it is we have the output of person lewis zappa so this is absolutely possible but this is not the recommended way of doing it so let me put up a comment possible but not recommended well that's it for this one in the next video we will convert the character from our game to a class now let's see how we can convert the character from our game to a class what i've done behind the scenes i have created a new file called as character.py inside my 06 folder let us go back to the folder number 5 and inside the game so this is how our character looks like our character has a name, attack power, and life. We can use these parameters to create our own class. So let us go back to our character.py file. Let me collapse my sidebar and let's start creating a class for our character. So the first is the keyword of class followed by the name character. Let us go inside. The first method is always going to be the constructor that means our underscore underscore init method so we can write like this define my init remember the first argument should always be self for reference here we can accept three different arguments let us go back to the game so we need one argument for the name one argument for the attack power and one argument for life so let us go back to our init method and here i can say I want to accept a name type is string next is attack power type is an integer life the type is an integer and this method always returns none let us create some variables inside again you have to follow the conventions you have to write self dot name and let us take the data from this variable and put it right over here so i can say name remember that you can name this anything so i can just call this as n but you have to change over here also but as a convention normally we would like to keep it the same names so let me go back the next is for the attack power so i can say self dot attack power would be my attack power the next would be self dot life would be my life let me add some documentation right over here saying that this method creates an instance of character let me add some documentation for the class as well so this is for the documentation of the class that this class defines a character now let us create an instance of this class so let me create a villain first so i can say a villain villain the first one would be a character the name would be thanos his attack power is 400 and his life is 1500 let me print out the villain number one let us save the file and let me try to execute this file and here we have the output but as you know this is a little cryptic output so what python is telling that this is a character object at this and this memory address but you already know how we can improve this so let's start adding some of the dunder or the magic methods the first one i can save is my repr the first argument is self and this returns a string i can say return so this is my class of the type of character. Let me save the file and let me run one more time. So this time we have a little better output. My villain is actually a class of character. Let us improve further by using our str method. 
so we can define it right over here str first argument is always the self this returns a string and uh, let us construct a string right over here so i can say the name it would be self dot name next would be the attack power and this would be self dot attack power next would be life so this would be self dot life that's it let me save it and let me try to run it so this time we have a much better output the name is thanos attack power is 400 and the life is 1500 let us go back and let us create some more characters let me put up one comment over here so while constructing a class you can actually use key and value pairs so let us create one more villain and let's see how we can do this so this is my villain number two it is a character and here we can use the key value pairs so i can say the name maybe this time it is red skull the attack power is 300 and the life is 800 and that's it let me try to print out the second villain as well so i can say villain number two just save it and try to run it and here we have the output red skull attack power 300 life 800 now the beauty of this key value pairs is you don't have to specify the arguments in a given sequence you can mix up the sequence but still we can have a proper instance so let me show you maybe i can just take this out and put it here and let me save this let me try to run it one more time and still we have the right output let us go back and let us try to create some more heroes let me create one hero so this is iron man attack power is 250 life is 1000 let me create one more so this time it is black widow the attack power is 180 and the life is 800 and let us also print them out let me run the file for the last time and here we have the output thanos red skull iron man and black widow before we can move ahead let us take a small pause and let us think do we really require classes let us go back to the earlier program that we wrote so let me go back to my file called as basic and let me collapse my sidebar so let us ask a very fundamental question do we require a class the answer is it depends whenever you want to have a structure and a behavior together at that time using a class makes much more sense if you require just the data then you can use any other data structures you can use a list you can use a dictionary or some other custom data structures as well but whenever the structure and behavior is tied together that's the best place to create a class for example in this file we have a class of person now let's see what's happening person has a structure and that structure is defined by the first name and the last name now this person can also have a behavior a person can greet another person so we have a method called as greet so greet can be imagined like a behavior of a person a person can have different kinds of behaviors a person can walk a person can talk a person can eat so all of this can be imagined as behaviors but all of these behaviors is tied to a structure and that structure is a first name last name and maybe you can have multiple other parameters such as your age your location and so on so just keep this in mind classes are not the solution for everything make sure you use the right data structure or the right classes only when it is required let us learn more about classes and this time let us learn about class membership till now we have been creating variables inside our constructor so for example in our class of character so you can say self.name is a member of the instance of this class same thing attack power can also be called as an instance variable let us create a new class and let us try to study what is this all about so behind the scenes i have created a file called as 
members.py added a couple of comments. So let's try to see what's happening inside. Let us try to create a class called as box and let us define an init method. This box has two sides. This is my side number one. I can say the type is integer. My next side, also the type of integer, it returns none. Let us create the variables inside. So I can say my side A is equal to my side A and my side B is equal to my side B. Now what we have done is we have created variables inside our constructor class. Now remember what this method does it actually creates an instance and fills in the value. So if we refer this diagram, our constructor is simply filling the values of the instances. So the variables that we create inside, they are called as instance variables. Let me put up a comment right over here. Now, if you go back to the diagram, the data is different for every instance. So for example, the first name for person number one was Lewis. And for person number two, it was CC. Now let us see how to create class members. Let me put up a comment. So this class members are defined on the class scope. So this class members are defined outside our constructors. So let us define a couple of class members as well. Let us create a variable and we can say box type. And this is going to be a packaging carton and uh, the color for this one would be brown so this variables that we have created box type and color this variables would be accessible to all of the classes please note that we don't have self over here because we don't need reference to an instance this data is available to all of the classes and all of the instances let us create a str method here i can say define my str again self this always returns a string and i can say return my side a would be my self dot side a and my side b would be sorry it has to be self dot side b for this example, I am going to skip the REPR, but you can write it on your own. Let us create an instance called as the first box and I can say the box side A, maybe it's three and the next is four. Let us try to print out my box. So I can say I want to print my box. Let me save it and let me try to run it. So here we have a box side a is three and the side b is four now let us try to print the class variables from an instance remember this class instances are available for all of the instances so i can simply say i want to print my box first dot box type and let us print the color as well so i can say the color let me save it and let me run it so we have the output, it's a packaging carton and the color is brown. Let us go back and let us try to solidify this concept of class members. Now this class members are available on the classes itself. You don't have to create an instance. That means if you go back to the design, we can get back the data from the design itself. We don't have to create an instance to get back the data. Now let's see this in action. What we did till now is we created an instance of the box and then we printed this variables right over here but we can simply say i want to print the box type from the class of box let me copy and paste we can also say i want to see the color that's it just save it and let me try to run it and we have the output packaging carton and brown so this time what we did is we simply accessed this variables from the class. We did not create an instance. So this is what I mean to say 
when all of the class members are available to the class itself and also to the instances. Let us create one more box and uh, print it out. So let me print my box number two. And just for the sake of confirming, we can say my B2 dot box type and my B2 dot color. And we should get the same output. Let me save it and let me run this file for the last time. And here it is. We get the exact same output. Let us try to study the next concept in our object oriented programming. And this concept is called as inheritance and polymorphism. What I have done is I have created a file right over here called as inheritance and polymorphism. And let us try to see what's going on. Just to give you a very simple example, we are all human beings, but we are also animals. That means we inherit a lot of properties from animals. For example, all of us have eyes, ears, hands and legs. But all of us human beings, we don't speak the same language. Now that's polymorphism in action. Inheritance means we inherit all of the features of an animal and polymorphism means even though we have the same properties, but we exhibit different behavior. Now let's create some classes and see this in action. Let us create the first class called as animal. So let us create a class of animal. Let us define our methods over here. First is a self and let me accept one argument for name, one for the age and one for the number of legs. This returns nothing, so I can say none. Let me put up a comment that we are going to create and initialize the instance variables. Let's start creating some of our instance variables. So I can say my self dot name is equal to my name. Then my self dot age is equal to age. Then self dot of legs is equal to my num of legs. Let us also create the str method so I can say define my str. It takes a self, it returns a string and here I can return. Let's say we can just return the name for now. So I can say name and this would be self dot name. Let us try to give animals some kind of behavior. So let us create a method called as talk on animal so i can say define a method called as talk the first parameter would be self and uh, this is going to return nothing so none for now let me put up some documentation saying that this method makes the animal talk but let's see what we can do right now since we don't know what kind of animal it is that's why we can't talk yet so let us print the same thing right over here so i can say print my formatted string self dot name can't talk yet so let us go down and let us create one animal so this is my first animal so i can say i want a instance of the class of animal the name is robin age maybe is 10 years old number of legs is four then let us print out the animal and let's also try to make the animal talk so a1.talk just save a file and let me run it so here we have the output we have robin and robin can't talk yet now let's go back and let's see how we can create some sort of inheritance let us create a dog now remember dog is a kind of animal so you can say that dog inherits from animal let me create a class and then I will try to explain what's happening. So let me create a class called as dog. Now here inside the brackets, we have to specify from which class we are inheriting. So dog is inheriting from the class of animal. So this is how it goes. Let us create our constructor right over here as well. So define init self. Now let's see what happens. 
Since the dog inherits from animal, dog also needs to accept all of these parameters name, age, number of legs. So let me just copy and paste. And here we can accept some more arguments as well. So let me create one more argument for breed. So we can accept one for breed. Let me get the spelling right. Let us go down and let us start creating our instance variables. Here at this point, Python can do a small bit of magic for us. Since dog is inheriting from animal, we don't have to create all of the instance variable manually. Instead, what we can do is we can pass the common data to the class we are inheriting from. So we are going to take all of this data and we are going to pass this data to animal. So technically animal can be also called as your parent class or it can also be called as your super class. Let me put up a comment. So we want to take all of the common features and pass it to the parent or the super class. Python provides a keyword called as super. So this super means the class of animal. And now we want to pass all of this data to a method and that method is called as init. Now remember init is just like any other function except it has underscores at the beginning and at the end. So we can call that method as we can call any other method. So we can say super and underscore underscore init underscore underscore and let us pass the common features which is the name, age and the number of legs. Now it is the responsibility of the super class, that means the class of animal, to create instance variables for the name, age and number of legs. The only argument that is remaining is for the breed. So inside dog we can create one more instance variable called as self.breed and we can assign the value. We can also create extra instance variable even though we are not accepting parameters right over here. So let me give you a small example. So I can say self.type is equal to dog. So you can see we can create instance variables wherever we want them. So let me save this. So this is what I mean by inheritance. Dog is a class which inherits from animals and they share a lot of common functionality. That's why we are passing the common functionality to the super class and we can create some additional instance variables as well. Now let's see how we can introduce polymorphism in this class. Remember, remember the super class of animal has a method of str. So let's overwrite this method and let us create a different str method for dog. So let's see how we can do that. The syntax is going to be exactly the same. So we have to say define str takes in a self, gives back a string and let me print out a message over here. Let us use the formatted string. So we can say self.type followed by the self.name and let us also print out the breed. So I can say the breed of the dog is self.breed. Oh, sorry, we can't print because remember the str method always has to return a string. So thanks to our typing, my code editor is catching an error. So this has to be written, not string. Let me take out the brackets. Now everything looks good. Now let's create a dog so I can go right over here. So I can say my first dog is an instance of the class of dog. The name is whiskey. The age, I can use my keyword arguments as well. So my age is five years old number of legs is obviously four and the breed maybe the breed could be doberman let's try to print out our dog so i can say print my dog let me save it and let me try to run this file so here you can see we have a doberman by the name of whiskey and the breed is doberman now let us try and explore some more benefits of inheritance so you can see we have created a class of dog which inherits from animals. Since dog inherits from animals, it also inherits all of the behavior of animal. The class of dog does not have a method for dog, but the class of animal has it. 
so we can actually make the dog talk as well so we can say d1.talk let me save it and let me try to run this file and we get the output that whiskey can't talk yet but we can use our polymorphism and we can make whiskey talk so let's see how to do that so inside my class of dog we are going to create a new method called as talk and the new method is going to override the method inside the class of animal so it's just like creating an another method so we can say define talk it always takes self this is going to return nothing and here let's print out so i can say self dot name says woof and uh, let me save the file and let us try running this and now we have the output whiskey is saying woof let us go back and let us see what else we can do let me take out this space this class of dog it can have its own behavior now since this is a dog our dog can also sniff different items so let's create a method called as sniff on dog so let us go down over here so i can say define a method called as sniff the first argument is always the self now these methods are just like your regular functions they can also accept arguments so let me take an argument for the item that the dog is supposed to sniff it is going to be a string this method is also going to return nothing so i can just say none and let us print out a message self dot name is sniffing out the item so please note that here we don't have to use self dot because item is not an instance variable item is just an a regular argument on a regular function let us go down and let us try to sniff so let me say d1 i want you to sniff for ball save a file and let us run it so here we can see we have the output whiskey is sniffing out ball let us create one more class for cat and since cat is also an animal cat is going to inherit animal as well so you can see we can have multiple classes that can inherit from other classes as well let me put a comment saying that this method of talk this is the place we are altering the method and we are adding some polymorphic behavior so let me go down and let me put a separate term and let us create the class of cat and creating that class is pretty simple i just have to copy all of these things so let me copy let me go down and paste it right over here let's change the name from dog to cat the type also is a cat this time we don't want the comment now and the cat says meow and we don't want this method because cats are not so good at sniffing so let me take it out let us create one instance of our cat so i can say my cat number 1 is my cat the name is jess suppose she is 2 years old number of legs is 4 and uh, the breed could be a persian cat let us print out the cat so i can say print and uh, let us also make the cat talk so i can say c1.talk that's it let us run the file and we have the output so we have a cat named jess the breed is a persian cat and jess is saying meow so now you get the idea just for the sake of practice let us create one more class for a dinosaur now this dinosaur is also going to inherit from animal let me copy and paste this separator let me copy all of this as well and let me go down and let me paste it right over here so since this is a dinosaur i can just say dino and this has to be dino as well and uh, since we don't know what dinosaurs can talk put some random text now the dinosaur can also hunt so let us create one method for hunt so let's create one method called as hunt it accepts a self and returns a none here i can say print self dot name is out for hunting 
let's create one dinosaur so i can say my dino one is equal to my dino suppose the name is adam age could be eight years old suppose the number of legs are two and the breed could be t-rex let's print out the dino let us also make the dino talk and also let us make the dino hunt that's it let me save and let me run the file and we have the output so this is a dinosaur adam is saying something adam is out for hunting so now you get the idea we can have multiple classes inheriting from a single class or you can also inherit from multiple classes as well but we are not covering that in this tutorials let me put a separator and let me show you one nice trick we can also ask python if a certain class inherits from other class or not so let's see if the dog and the cat inherits from animal or not so i can say print and we can use an inbuilt method called as is instance the first argument is the object that we want to compare so let me pass my dog and the next argument is the parent class that we want to compare with so suppose i want to see if the dog is of the type of animal so let me save it and let me try to run it and here we have the answer it's true and that's because the class of dog is inheriting from animal now here i want you to understand one point all of the dogs are animals but all of the animals are not dogs so please keep this in your mind let us check if d1 is a kind of dog so i can say is instance d1 and dog let me print it out and yes it is let us do one last time for our cat so let me copy and paste so this becomes c1 and this becomes cat and let us see the output so here it is c1 is an instance of cat as well now let's try to learn about decorators so these decorators are like the higher order functions but these higher order functions are already built into python these decorators can give some additional behaviors to our classes so we are going to have a look at couple of these decorators some of the decorators that we are going to see are property static methods class methods getters and finally setters so i have created a new file called as decorators and i'm going to work inside this file for this example let us imagine that we are working for a store and we have to write a software that will manage our staff now since all of the staff members are also persons so first i am going to create a class of person and then i will create a class of staff that inherits from person so let us start with the person first so i can say the class of person our constructor in it self and uh, suppose we want to accept the first name this is a string the last name this is also a string and this returns nothing inside let us create some instance variable so we can say self dot first name is equal to my first name and self dot last name is equal to my last name let us also create the string method so i can say str self and this always returns a string so i can say return this is a person and then i can say my self dot first name and self dot last name let us create one person and print it out so i can say this is going to be sorry not permission i want a person the first name would be lewis the last name would be zappa and let us try to print him out now let me try to run and see the output so we have the output of lewis zappa till now you are familiar with everything now let's go to the example now suppose you want to retrieve the full name every time now instead of creating one more instance variable over here saying that self dot full name 
is equal to something something instead of this we can create a property and that property will create a full name for us and we can retrieve it just as we would retrieve any other instance variables so let me take out this line and let me show you how to use our first decorator so let me go down over here the way you use a decorator is by this symbol at the rate and then you name the decorator so this time the decorator that i want to show you this is called as property so this is our decorator and after that let us create the function so i can say define full name this takes self as the first parameter and returns a string next line we can simply create the full name and let us return the full name so we can just say self dot first name and self dot last name so what we have essentially done is this full name right over here this would act just like your instance variable so just imagine that here we had one more instance variable called as self dot full name so this property will function exactly like this let me show you this in action so let me take it out let us go down and let us try to print the full name of the first person so i can say print first person's full name that's it now since this is a property we don't have to use brackets after this one because remember full name is just like your instance variable let me try to execute the program and here we have the output louis zappa now let us go back and let's start working on some other classes but before that let me put some separators so this is one separator and this is another separator now let's create the class of staff and this staff will inherit from person but let us try to expand our knowledge over here suppose there are different categories in the staff there could be an associate there could be a manager and so on so we can have multiple roles and each of these roles can have different salaries so suppose if you are a associate then your salary could be 15 dollars for an hour if you are a supervisor it could be 20 dollars if you are a manager it could be 25 dollars so what we want to do is whenever we create a new class we also want to dynamically give that person a different salary based on his role sounds a little complicated but don't worry let me show you how to do this now since we have to define different roles at this time using an enum is the best option so if you have not seen my video on enum i would highly recommend you to go back and see that video so that was in my section number four and i think that file was this choices.py so we are going to use this enums in this file i want to use enums because i want to define different roles let's see how to do that let me go to the top and first let me try to import a couple of things so from my package of enum i want to import enum and i also want to import my auto so now we can define an enum let me create one called as class role so this inherits from my enum and inside this let me put some documentation that this role is for our staff members now let's create a couple of roles suppose the first role is for an associate so i can say associate and let me write auto over here the next one could be a supervisor again is equal to auto the last one could be a manager so i can say manager is equal to auto let me just save it and let us go down and let's start creating our class of staff let me put some separators here as well okay now let us go down and here let us start creating the class and the class is of staff and this class inherits from person so here let us first define our constructor so i can say define my init the first argument is always self now let us see now since staff inherits from person person requires two arguments first for the first name and for the last name so let me just copy and paste right from here so i can 
take this and put it right over here now the next argument that we want is for the role remember we want to take the role and we would be dynamically creating the salary depending on the role so i can say i also want to accept a role and the type would be role this method always returns nothing so i can say none so inside this we want to pass the data to our super class so let me put a comment and then i can say i want my super to initialize with my first name and my last name now let us create some more instance variables maybe we can accept one more parameter for the staff id so let me write it right over here so i can say the staff id would be an integer now let us go down and let us start creating the instance variables so the first variable would be for the staff id and this is, is equal to the staff id let us create one more instance variable called as is staff and let us put it to true so remember we can always create instance variables even though we are not accepting them inside our constructor method next it could be for the role so i can say self dot role is equal to role now for the next one i also want to record the date of joining for the staff member so let's see how we can do that so i can say self dot date join and this time the value has to be in the format of date date and time fortunately python has an inbuilt library for doing exactly this and the name of the library as you can guess it is called as date time so let me go above and let me import it so here i can say from my library of date time i want to import date time now let us go down and let's see how we can assign the value of date time so here we can simply say date time for now so what's happening is the moment that we are creating this instance we can have the date time automatically assigned to our variable before we proceed i want you to wait and i want you to think once we have a staff member i don't want anyone to accidentally change the date joint so what's the solution let us try and make this variable a private variable now there is no real concept of private and public but we have a convention so whenever we put an underscore this means that we want to keep this variable as private you can also write double underscore or a single underscore it's up to you normally whenever we want to enforce that it's a strictly private then you can use double underscore but a single underscore also means that we want to keep this variable as private so let me write a comment right over here so this is going to be our private member and all of this are public variables the next thing to do is we want to assign the salary but this salary has to be dynamically assigned depending on the role if the role is of an associate then the salary has to be 15 dollars if it is a supervisor then the salary has to be 20 dollars if it is a manager then the salary has to be $25 let's see how we can dynamically assign a new instance variable called a salary and assign values to it so let me put up a command that we want to dynamically create and assign values so let's see we can use an if and else statement so we can check if the role is for a supervisor or for a manager and so on but we can also use our match statement so in this example let us use the match so i can say let us match for the role the first case that i want to match is for my role dot associate so in case this role is for an associate then at that time i want to dynamically create an instance variable called as salary and i want to assign the value of 15 dollars let us also add some type hinting so instead of 15 it can also be 15.5 15.75 and so on so let us declare this instance variable as a float 
now you must be wondering why do i need to have a type hint right over here but here we don't have the answer is it's because we have declared the types right over here so this first name is a string so by default this first name is also going to be a string staff id is an integer so here the staff id is also going to be an integer and my pie is smart enough to infer all of these things but here since we don't have this instance variable declared anywhere we have to be explicit and let us declare the type is going to be a float here again let us think about the visibility i don't want anyone to change the salary salary has to be privately managed so we can say i can put an underscore or i can put a double underscore let us go to the next case suppose the role is for an supervisor then i can say self dot underscore underscore salary would be twenty dollars and then i can say if the role is for a manager then i want to assign the salary of 25 dollars let us also define the string method for this one so i can say define my str self this return a string so let me return so i can say this is a staff member the name is self now here i can use the property that we have defined for full name if you scroll little up we don't have an instance variable for full name but we have declared a property and that's what i'm going to use right over here i want to display the full name so i'm using self dot full name next we can also display the id so i can say id is my self dot staff id let us go down and let us try to create a staff member this time so i can say my staff member is my staff the first name is chico the last name is jonas staff id can be three two four five let's give her a role of manager so i can use my enum i can say the role is role dot manager and let us try to print it out so let me print my staff that's it let me run the file so we have a new staff member so you can see right over here the name is chico jonas and the id is 3245 let us go back and let us see what more we can do with our classes the next decorator is called as the class method just imagine the scenario that we already have a person in our database and this person is joining our shop as a staff member so what we can do is we can simply take that person as an argument if you see right over here we are taking first name and last name as an argument instead of this we can take a person and from that person we can create an another class for the staff so let us go down right over here and this is called as class method now always remember this method is used to create an another class till now we have been working with instances but what this class will do it will return another class which is of the type of staff itself so let's see how to do that suppose we want to create a new staff member from an existing person so i can say define new so new is just the name of the function you can write anything that you want and since this is a class method the first argument is called as a class till now we have been taking the first argument as self so we can see it was self but since the class method works on the class that's the reason why the first argument is a class if you are still confused then let me go back to my diagram so this is a class and this is an instance the class method is going to work on the class itself that means we can create a new person from a design of the person that's what it really means let us write the different arguments so obviously we want to create a new staff member from an existing person so we need to accept a person next we also need a staff id so this is going to be an integer then we also need a role the type is for the role now here this method is going to return an another instance of the class and that instance is of the type of staff itself so this function returns a staff let me add some documentation saying that this is going to create a new instance of the staff itself and let's see how we can create a staff in this case this class actually means staff 
so here we can say i want to return a new staff member and the first name is going to be the first name of the person that we are accepting so i can say person dot first name the next argument is the person dot last name then we have to give the staff id and then we also have to give role now unfortunately we can't write this syntax but what we can do is since this class means staff we simply have to replace staff with class and it's the same thing now the written value is of the type of staff but what's happening is we are trying to return the staff member before we have defined the class of staff. So in order for this code to work, we have to do something. So we have to go a little up and we have to say from future, I want to import annotations. So what do I exactly mean to say is since this method right over here, the method of new is returning a staff. But at this time, Python does not know what is a staff because Python has not yet created this class. But by importing this functionality from futures, we can tell Python what's exactly happening. So let us go down and let us add one person to our staff member. So since we already have a person called as Louis Zappa, Maybe he joins our store. So let us create a staff member from Louis Zappa. So let me say my staff number one. So here let us create a new staff member by using this class method. The first argument, as you can see, it's for a person. So let me pass my first person. The staff ID could be one, two, three, four. And the role could be the role of a supervisor. Now let us try to print it out let me say I want to print my first staff member and this I can say this is my second staff member just save your file and try to run it so we have the output the first staff member is Louis Zappa with ID 1234 and we have one another if you are a little confused then just keep in mind that class method is a method that returns an instance of the same class. Now let's try to move on and let's learn a little bit more about classes. Now since we have defined this instance variable as private date join, but what happens if anyone wants to see what is the joining date? So we can create another property that will display the joining date. So we can go down and let me create a property. So here I can use my decorator called as property let me define the property called as joined on this text the self and this is going to return a string let me put up some documentation saying that this is for the joining date of the staff member and since this has to return the joining date we can simply say i want to return and here i can say myself dot underscore date joined now if you're wondering why do we have to do all of these things and the answer is since this is a property we cannot assign values to a property at least not yet in technical terms this is also called as a getter in short we can simply get the value from here but we can't set the value over here later on when i teach you about getters and setters at that time we can actually use properties to get as well as set different properties but for now let us go with the flow and let me try to save the file and let me try to run it let us try to see the joining date of lewis so i can say print dot joint on and that's it let me try to run the file and we have a joining date now this joining date looks pretty complicated it's in a different format but fortunately we can also have the output which we can understand so let's see how we can do that suppose i want to see the date in a format of month day and the year so let's see how we can format this fortunately there is one inbuilt method for our date time and that is called as string format and we have to use a couple of keywords right over here so let me paste it over here 
so this capital b stands for the month the lower case d stands for the day and obviously y stands for the year so let me save this and let me try to run this file and here we have a much better output so the date of joining for Luis Zappa is July the 6th and the year is 2022 let us see the last concept that I want to teach you in decorators and this concept is called as getters and setters I have already partially explained that this property right over here this property acts as a getter that means I can always get a date but I can't set a date but let's see what happens if we want to set an value suppose we promote an employee suppose an associate becomes a supervisor or a supervisor becomes a manager that time we also need to increase their salary so let us see how we can do that by using our getters and setters now if you remember we have declared the salary as a private member but what happens if our HR department wants to see the salary so first let us create a property or a getter to see the salary and then we will see how to use a setter to set the new salary so let us go down and let us create one property for the salary so I can say property and let me call it as salary it takes the self as an argument and this returns a string I think I have declared it as a float yeah it's a float so this has to return a float let me put a comment so this acts like a getter of the salary and we simply have to return our self dot underscore underscore salary let us see the salary of Louis so let me say I want to print staff one dot salary and that's it let me run the file and here you can see the salary is twenty dollars for an hour now let's see what happens if I try to set the salary so if I say my s1 dot salary is equal to 17 let me save it we have an error so if you just try to hover it says that property salary is defined in staff is a read only so what this is trying to say is we can only get the value we can't set and we can't set because this is just a read only property so this is the beauty of getters and setters we can't accidentally change the values but what happens if we do want to change the value at that time we need to create another method which is called as a setter let's see how to do that normally you would use a setter when you need to do some kind of validation before you want to set the values now in this case let us see what kind of validation do we require if you remember if the role is for an associate the minimum salary is $15 for a supervisor the minimum salary is $20 now if the role is for a supervisor but if we try to set the salary which is lower than $20 then we don't want that to happen so this is a part of our validation logic and we can use that inside our setter method the way to declare the setter method is kind of weird in python but let me show you how it is so the syntax is i want to say for my salary this is the setter so this is a syntax for the setter this simply means that we are declaring a setter method for the property of salary let us create the function for salary obviously the first argument is for the self and the next argument is for the amount that is the amount of salary that we want to give the employee so i can take one more parameter called as amount the type would be of a float and since this is a setter we are not going to return anything so i can say none let me put up a comment saying that this is our setter method and inside of this let us see how we can use our validation logic and how we can set the new values let's start with the associate the associate cannot have a salary which is less than 15 dollars so we can say if my self dot role is role dot associate and if the amount is less than 15 dollars that means it is going to fail our validation because we can't give an associate a salary which is less than 15 dollars so let me print out a message saying that error associate cannot have a salary less than 15 dollars 
Now what happens inside any of the methods, you have access to all of the instance variables. So if you see, I'm using this instance variable called as self.role and we have defined this self.role right over here. So this is where it is on line number 60. But since we are inside the same class, we can have access to all of the instance variables. The same thing is happening everywhere. So for example, in this property of salary, I can access the salary. In actual, the salary is being declared right over here, either on line 66, 68 or 70. But we can still access all of the instance variables. Let us go down and let us create the next validation logic. So this was for an associate. Next, let us create one for the supervisor and the last one for the manager. So we can say else if the role is for the role of supervisor and if the given amount is less than 20, then we need to print an error message. So we can say supervisor cannot have a salary which is less than $20. Let's go to the next one. We can again check if the role this time is for the role of manager. And if the amount is less than 25, then let us print one more error saying that manager cannot have a salary less than, so this should be $25 for an hour. Now let us go down. Now what happens if we pass all of this validation that means we have the right role and we also have the right amount. In that case, we can assign that amount as a salary. So here I can say else, if everything is fine, then my salary is equal to the given amount. And let me print a nice message saying that self dot full name now has a salary of dollars and self dot salary and i can write per hour so remember that this salary is a property so as you can see the visual studio code is telling you that this is a property and this is a getter method now let me save the file now let me try to run it if you see on line number 120 i am assigning a value of 17 dollars but the role is for a supervisor and if you see inside our validation logic supervisor cannot have a salary of 20 that means we should get an error let me save the file and let us try to run it and see if we can get an error and that's it we have the right output so it's saying that error supervisor cannot have a salary less than 20 dollars for an hour what happens if we try to set the salary which is valid so i can say s1 dot salary is equal to 20 or maybe i can say 22 so let me save it and let me try to run it and we have the right output. So on the next line, you can see Luis Zappa now has a salary of $22 for an hour. Let us go back to the file. And this time I want to show you the final decorator in this section. Now we have been inheriting classes. For example, here the class of staff is inheriting from person. In some of the earlier examples, we were inheriting classes such as animals, dogs, and so on. But what happens if I want to say that you can't inherit this class? Whatever class I've created, this is the last and final class, and no one can inherit it. We can do that by using a different decorator. But first, let me import that. And that comes from our typing library. So I can say right over here from my library of typing i want to import final and just before the class that we want to declare as final we have to use it so suppose i want to say my class of staff is a final and no one can inherit it so i can just say at the rate and this is going to be my final class let me save it and let us give it a try so suppose uh, let me put a separator over here Suppose someone creates a class called as HR and uh, let us try inheriting from staff and we can keep the body as empty. So let me just write pass. Let me try to save it. Now we can see the code editor is highlighting that we have some issue 
and it is saying that the class of staff is marked as final and it cannot be subclassed. So let me just comment it out and I think we have done for this video. Let us start converting our game into classes. So the first thing that I want to do is let me just copy and paste it inside this folder. Let me rename from three to four and let me change the documentation. So this is where we are trying to improve our design by using classes. So let's see how we can start using classes inside our game. Till now we have been using an alias, but now what we can do is instead of using an alias for the character, we can actually create a class for character. So let us go right over here and let us create our class for character. So we can say class character. Now let's see what instance variables do we require. Now each of the character has three main things. You can see right over here name attack power and life so we can define these as our instance variables so let us do that define in it self the first is the name is going to be a string attack power integer life is also an integer this returns nothing let me write some documentation saying that this creates an instance of character so here i can say self.name is equal to the name self.attack power is equal to the attack power self.life is equal to the life let's also create a nice str method so we can say define a string method for this one self and this always returns a string and inside let us make a nice string representation for the character so i can say the name of the character is self dot name the attack power is going to be self dot attack power and the life is going to be self dot life let me save it next let us see how we can create superheroes and our villains now superheroes can inherit from our character and our villains can also inherit from our characters so let's see how to do that so let's create a class called as superhero so you can say my class of superhero this inherits from the character let me put some documentation and let us write the init method now since this is inheriting from character i can simply copy and paste all of this just copy and paste and uh, this returns nothing now inside since we are inheriting we can use the super keyword and we can say super dot init and we can simply pass the name attack power and the life so the super class of character would be responsible for creating all of these instance variables next we can also create one more instance variable called as a role so this instance variable can say that this is a superhero or this is a super villain in order to define a role again let us go back and create a nice enum so let me go to the top and first thing that i want to do is i want to import so from enum i want to import my enum and also i want auto i can say my class of character type this inherits from enum let me add some documentation then i can say superhero and assign it to auto then i can say villain and assign it to auto as well so let me save this and let us go on below 
here I can create one more instance variable I can say self dot role and this would be equal to my character type dot superhero let us also create the str method so I can say str self this returns a string let me copy and paste all of this let me put it here now just before the name I can say that this is a superhero so I can say this is a superhero and put a nice arrow now since this line is really long so we can do one small trick let me take it down and I want to have brackets around this so this is my opening bracket and right over here I can put my closing bracket and what I can do is let me cut this portion out for the life and on the next line I can simply again say F and paste it over there and that's it so this is also a valid syntax next let us create the same thing for our villain so I can simply copy all of this paste it down so from superhero it becomes my villain and uh, this has to be my villain this has to be again my villain let us go down and we don't need all of these things because we already have a class for character so I can take all of this out I don't want any of this now let's see what we can do with life with life I'm going to do a very small trick I'm going to create a class for life but all of the methods would be static that's because I don't want to create an instance of life it makes no sense I just want access to hero life and villain life so let me create it first and then I will try and explain so here I can say this is going to be a class of life and what I want to do is I want to take all of these things inside so till here all of these things goes inside my class now let's start changing them one by one now what happens is you can see my these two variables these are outside my init method or rather I don't have an init method over here and that's also perfectly fine these two variables belongs to the class so they can also be called as my class variables and that's what I want there is one other alternative approach let me paste it right over here that approach is called as data classes but I am not going to cover them inside this course you can use this link to study more about data classes now let us continue with our journey I am going to use a new decorator which is called as static method so let me copy and first let me paste everywhere and then I will try and explain what's happening since this hero life and villain life belongs to the class I no longer have to use the keyword of global and hero life so I can take it out and now what happens is this hero life is actually a class member of the class of life so I can simply say life dot hero life plus equal to life so this means that this hero life variable references exactly this one let me save it and then I will try and explain what this new decorator is doing now if you see I am not taking the argument as self for static method that's because this decorator works on the class directly it does not have to create an instance let us go back to our decorators file and there I will try and demonstrate what's happening so this is our decorators file now let me go back to the diagram itself so here is our diagram again whenever I'm saying that this is a static method means that we can call that static method from the class itself we don't need to create instances for example here in our decorators file you can see that we have this one date time dot now no matter whatever the class you don't need an extra instance we can have a common functionality that's what I mean to say by a static method so basically static method is just like any other method but it does not take a self argument 
because it works directly on the class and not on the instance. Suppose we can create a static method called as describe and that static method will just describe what this class is going to do. So let's create it and see it in action. So let me go down and uh, just after this property joint on, I can create my static method. So I can use my decorator of static method. The name would be describe. So again, this is not going to take self, neither this is going to take a class because this is independent of everything. This is going to return none. Let me write some documentation, what's happening. So this method is just going to describe what this class is all about. So I can just print out that this is a class to create a staff member. Now let me go down and here I can simply call this method on my class. So let me call it at the top. I can say staff dot describe and since it's a method, I need to use my brackets. That's it. Let me run this file and here we have the output class to create a staff member. Now using this same concept, let us go back to our game. Now here what happens is we have two class members, hero life and villain life. I want to get access to this variables and that's what I'm doing right over here by using a static method. You can get a little bit more clarity when we use this method later in this video. For now, let us change all of the syntax. So this one also becomes my static method and I don't want global and this becomes my life dot hero life. Same thing for this one. This also becomes my static method. I don't need the global. I can say my life dot villain life and same thing for this one as well. So this also becomes my static method. I don't need the global and this is my life dot. That's it. Just save a file. Let us go down. So here what we can say is this is a list of superheroes. So instead of just character, I can say this is my superhero. Next, what I can do is I can create instances of my superhero by using the newly created class. So I can say my Iron Man is a superhero. The name is obviously Iron Man. Next. The attack power is 250 and the life is 1000. So similarly, let us create instances for all of the other superheroes as well. So here we have, we have a Black Widow, Spider-Man and Hulk. Now, since we have everything in classes, I don't require this constant. So I can just take them out. They are not required. This becomes a list of superheroes and I have to change this as well. So Iron Man, Black Widow, Spider-Man and my Hulk. Let us go down. So this instead of character, we can say this is going to return a superhero. The rest everything remains the same. So let us go down to villains. This is going to be a list of our villains. Again, let us do the same thing. Let us create instances. So I can say my Thanos is equal to my villain. The name is Thanos. My attack power is 400. Life is 1500. Let us create the rest as well. So we have all of them. Let us take out all of this. It's not required. This becomes my villain and we need to change all of this as well first is thanos then is the red skull and then is proxima let us go down so this becomes my villain and everything is looking good let us go down and let us see where we need to do some more changes this becomes a superhero and this becomes a villain now let's see where we are going to use the class of life and the static methods that we have created we are going to use 
exactly right over here for the set life and for the actual attack so here i can say from my life i want to access the static method called as increment hero life and i simply want to pass the life of the superhero so i can say my superhero dot life and we can use this syntax because life is just an instance variable on superhero so this is the beauty of working with classes let us go down again we can do the same thing we can say from my class of life i want to access the static method of increment villain life and i want to pass the life of my villain we don't need all of these lines we can take them out we can do the same thing right over here as well so i can say life dot i want to decrement my hero life and let's pass the attack power of the villain and same thing below life dot decrement villain life and let's pass the superhero attack power we don't need all of this we can take it out let's save our file now let us go to this line it seems that we have some error so let's see what's happening value of superhero is not indexable oh yeah that's right now since this is a class we have to say superhero dot the name and here also villain dot name and now the error is gone let us go down and here what we can do since hero life and villain life are now the class variables of life so we can simply say life dot hero life and here it becomes life dot villain life and now we have a beautifully typed object oriented game design so let me save my file and let me try to run this now that's really amazing everything is working perfect and it seems that i have also won the game welcome to the last video in this section this video is all about the different magic methods that we can use inside our classes till now we have seen only three magic methods one was init second one was repr and the third one was str but python provides many more of these magic methods so let me try and cover some of the most commonly used magic methods what i've done is behind the scenes i have created a file called as box and let us start working with this as you can see it's completely empty so let's create a class call it as box and the init method this box is going to have two sides so i can say my side a the type is an integer similarly we have side b type is an integer this is going to return nothing and my instance variable so my side a is equal to my side a and my side b is equal to my side of b so let's create the wrapper method so you are already familiar with it i'm just returning a new string called as class of box now let me create the str method so till now there is nothing new to you inside my str method i'm just returning a nicely formatted string saying that this is a box and side a and the value of side b let us create two boxes so this is my first box and this is my second box let us also print them out so i can say print my box first and print my box number two as well so let me save the file and let me run so till now there is nothing new to you let us go back now suppose what happens if you do something like this i want to say i want to add both of them together so if i say b1 plus b2 is equal to my b3 and then i want to print my b3 let us save and let us try to run this file and see what's happening it's saying that this is an unsupported operand and that's because python does not know how to add one box with another box but we can implement this functionality by using different magic methods so if you go back and if you say minus again if you try to run again we have some sort of an error 
because Python does not know how to minus these boxes. And the same thing will happen for all of the different operations such as multiplication, division, less than, greater than, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to, and so on. But what we can do is by using different magic methods, we can implement this functionality on our class. So let's see how we can do this step by step. The first thing that I want to show you is how we can use the in operator. So let me give you a small example. This is my IPython shell. If I say O in Octalium, so we get a true. So let us see how we can implement this syntax of in for our box. We can implement this by using another magic method and the name of this magic method has to be specific and the name is underscore underscore contains underscore underscore. This takes self as the first argument. The next argument is what we want to check. So let me name that argument as number. For now, let us skip the type and I will come back to it a little later. Let us see what this type has to return. Let us go back to my IPython shell and here you can see the return type is of the type of boolean. So that's what is going to be the return type. So this function is going to return a boolean that is it has to return true or false. The logic for this is pretty simple. Let me again go back to my IPython shell and let me show it first over here. Suppose we have a list. So let me call it as L and this is one comma two. Now, if I say one in my list of L, we get the answer of true. If I say three in my list of L, we get the answer of false. So what we can do is we can simply create a list of both the sides. So side one and side two, and we can simply compare that the other argument is inside that list or not. So let's see how to do that. Here we can simply say return if the given number is inside my list and I can say the first list member is my self dot side of A and my side of B. Now this method works but this is not foolproof. What happens if this second argument is not a number? If someone provides a boolean value or some other value then how we can say the user that we have an error. So for this let me show you some new syntax. So let me go down let me put a comment. Now if you remember when I was teaching you about classes and instances, we used one method which is called as is instance and there we could check if the dog is an instance of animal, if the cat is an instance of animal or not. So we are going to do the same thing right over here. We are going to check if this number is of the type of integer or not. If this number is not of the type of integer, then we can simply throw a number. So here what we can say number it can be any object. We don't know beforehand what the user is going to provide. So object is a generic term. And if you remember everything inside Python is an object. So we can say number could be any object. And now let's try to see if the number is an integer or not. So we can say if then we can use the inbuilt function called as is instance. Then we can say is my number an instance of my integer. And if not, so let me go up and I can use the word if not. Here I want to throw an error so I can say raise not implemented error. Now since this number is not the type of an integer, we don't know how to do the comparison. So we simply raise an error. In the next section, I'll be teaching you more about errors. Right now just try and understand if in a situation we don't know what to do, we can simply raise an error. So that's what we are doing right over here. Let me save it and let me show you it in action. So we don't want this one. Here I can say is four inside my box of one. And I can also say is six inside my box of one. Let me save it and let us run this file. So here we have the output. Let me take it up four in box number one. Yes. And that's true. Six in box number one, false. Let us see what's happening. So this is our box number one. We don't have a six over here. 
Now watch closely what happens if I write something like this. I can write A over here. Let me save it and let me try to run it. And this time we get an error and this error is of the type of not implemented error. And that is what we have coded. If you go back to our line number, line number 15, since A is a string, but we want an integer. So what's happening is in this line, we are raising an error. If you try to evaluate is instance number is a type of instance, it's going to fail because here the number is actually the string of A. So if not an instance of integer, then we want to raise an error and that's what we are doing. So if we just open up the terminal, we are throwing an not implemented error. So this error, which is called as not implemented error. So this is a standard way of throwing an error inside this method. Let's see some other operators. So if I want to say is my box one is equal to my box two. Let us see how we can do this syntax. Right now, let me take it out. And since this line is always going to fail, let me take it down and let me comment it out. So let me go right over here and uh, I want to copy and paste till this one. Let me go down and let me paste. Since we want to see if both the boxes are equal or not, the magic method is called as equal short form EQ. Let me write the proper documentation. So this, so this checks if both the boxes are equal or not. And this line is the standard check that we want to have. Now let's see what to do right over here. This time we expect a box. So let me change the name of the variable from number to a box. Let me go down. So this also has to be box. Here we want to check if the given object, which we call as box, is an instance of the class of box or not. So instead of integer, this has to be my class of box. So if the another object is also a box, only then we can have a comparison. But there is a small limitation of Python. We can't use this syntax directly, but we can use a small hack. And let me show how we can do this. Again, let me go to the top and I can say from my future, I want to import my annotations. And now we can use the syntax, which is right over here. Now let us see how we can compare both of the boxes. Now what happens is, the box has a side side A and a side B. If both of the boxes has to be equal, that means both of the sides should match. So that's what we are going to see right over here. I can say that return self dot side of A is equal to is equal to the box dot side of A. Maybe we can rename this variable. We can call this as the other or we can say the other box. Right now, I'll just write this as other. So right now we are comparing the self dot side A with the others side A. Similarly, we also need to compare the side B as well. So here I can say I want my side A to be equal and I also want my side B to be equal. So I can say self dot side B has to be equal to the other dot side of B and this also needs to be changed from box to other. So let us go down and here we can say I want to print if my box one is equal to my box two. Let me save this and let me run this file. And here we have the output false box number one is not equal to box number two. Let us go back and let us try to implement some other methods. Let us try how we can check for less than and less than equal to. So what I mean is how we can implement this behavior b1 less than and b2 or less than or equal to b2. So let us go up right over here and uh, let us start creating our method. Let me copy till this line and let me paste it over here. So whenever we say that we want to compare if it is less than the magic method is called as LT, which stands for less than. 
let me also write the proper documentation so instead of this we want this one now let's check if the other box is smaller or not one simple way of doing this is by calculating area or you can also use this syntax but i think using the area is a much more cleaner method now since we already have the side a and b we can define a property for area and we can use that property right over here so let me go over here and let me create a decorator for my property i can say this is for my area self and this returns an integer so i want to return my side a multiplied by my side of b now this makes things much more simple so here simply what i can do is i can go right over here and i can say return self dot area is it less than the others area and that's it let me save my file but what happens is this magic method is only for less than we also want to compare for less than and equal to so if you go to this line number 44 we have an equal operator as well so let's see how we can implement that and that's pretty simple let me just copy all of this and paste it now this magic method is called as less than or equal to that means l and e and on this line we simply have to add equal to and that's it so let us start printing all of these things so let me go down over here here i can say i want to print if my b1 is less than b2 one more beauty of this magic method is we have simply defined a magic method for less than and less than equal to but python can infer how to implement greater than or greater than and equal as well it simply has to reverse the logic and python does it behind the scenes we don't have to create another methods since we already have these two methods in place so here i also want to check if my box of one is greater than my box of two we can also use the less than and equal so we can say if this is my less than or equal and we can also use the greater than and equal so this one let me take out this line let me comment all of this let me comment all of this and let us try to run this one so here we have the output let us check if the output is true or not the first one is is my box number one less than my box number two let's see what's happening three multiplied by four is twelve two multiplied by five is ten so that means my box number one is larger than my box number two let's see the statement so this is exactly opposite my box number one is larger so this becomes false and that's what we have over here in the second line yes my box number one is larger so we have the output of true and so on for the line number 53 and 54 as well let us go back and let us see some other methods as well now let us see how we can implement some basic operations such as addition multiplication division and so on luckily writing all of those methods is just a matter of copy and paste so let me show you first let us create a method for addition so where we can add two boxes let me copy and paste since this is for addition the magic method is called as add let me change the documentation and let me also get my spacing right and here we simply have to add the areas that's it let's check what's the error oh yes now it's saying that it got an integer as the return type but it is expecting an boolean so let's see what's happening oh yes here we have written boolean as the return value but that's not what is happening area is an integer so let us update this from boolean to an integer so you see there are so many benefits of having a very well typed code let us implement other methods for subtraction multiplication and division as well let us create one for subtraction and since it is a subtract we can 
say that this is subtract let me change the documentation and this becomes minus let us do for multiplication and since this is multiplication this becomes mul for multiplication let me change the documentation and this becomes multiplied the next one for division now this becomes a little tricky if you think for division it would be just div you are partially right but that's not what is happening let us go back to our ipython shell and let me try and explain what's going to happen so suppose if i say 1 divided by 2 we have the answer of 0 0.5 this is called as true division now if i say 2 divided by 3 we get an answer of 0 0.6 as well again you can see this is a true division but if you watch closely we have two integers and the output is a float what happens if we want to have the output as an integer as well in that case we have to use double slash and then three so this syntax is called as floor division and this syntax is called as a true division the return value of a true division is always a float and the return value of floor division is an integer so let us go back to our code and see how we can do this the first one can be our true division so i can just say this is my true division and this becomes my true division now remember that the return type is going to be a float this time since this is going to be a true division let me copy and paste this for our floor division so here i can say i want to have my floor division and here i want to have one more slash and that's it let us go and let us print out all of these things so let me go right over here and let me put all of my print statements let me comment all of these things out and let me try to run this file and here we have the output so b1 minus b2 is 2 let us check if that is the case or not so the area of first box is 12 the area of the second box is 10 and that's what is happening so 12 minus 10 we get the answer of 2 and if you check the answer of all of the other methods obviously all of them are going to be right when i was going through the code i realized that we have a small mistake it's not really a mistake it is just about following the best practices of python so let me try and explain everywhere we are trying and throwing this error called as not implemented error which is absolutely fine but the guidelines in python suggest that whenever we have a binary operation that time we simply have to raise an error which is called as not implemented so this and this are two different things please keep that in mind so let me rectify all of these things so let me just copy and paste it everywhere so all of this let me do my multi select this becomes my not implemented this one and this one as well so let me save the file what i mean by a binary operation so all of these operations minus plus multiplication division etc all of these are called as binary operations but this one when we are checking for inside b1 this is not a binary operation so in this case we are using not implemented error and whenever we have a binary operation at that time we are using just not implemented well that's it for this video and now we are officially at the end of this section and i will see you in the next section where i will try and expand your knowledge of error handling in python welcome to a new section this section is all about error handling in python now errors in python can be divided into a couple of categories the first category can be thought as your syntax errors that means whenever you make some errors in typing those errors are called as your syntax errors now fortunately these errors are very easy to catch 
and these days we have much better tooling inside visual studio code and our plugin mypy or if you're using an ide such as pycharm all of these tools will help you to catch syntax errors the second category can be thought as your runtime errors that means these errors are not reflected inside your code but whenever you try to run it these errors will pop up these errors are a little bit difficult to debug so as we saw in our last video whenever we can't handle a situation we were raising some kind of errors so when we raise those kind of errors at least we can have some idea what's going wrong during our runtime and these errors in python are called as exceptions so let's see one by one all of this the first thing that we are going to see is the most common one and that is called as your syntax errors so let me go back to my code editor and what i've done is behind the scenes i've created a new folder called as 07 error handling and this is a file called as maths.py now let's see what's happening there is some red line right over here print x and y this is an example of my syntax errors so at least i need to have a comma right over here or i need to have like my formatted string so something like this and uh, this has to be inside my curlies and this as well and now if you try and save your error will go away so this is one of the most common errors called as a syntax error now let me try and show you what do i mean by a runtime error so what i've done is i've created another file called as divider and let's see what's going to happen this time let's create a function that divides two numbers so i can say define divide the first number could be an x the next is an y and uh, this does not return anything and we can simply print out my x divided by y so till now everything looks perfect and we don't have any errors now let me go down and let me say i want to divide my 4 by 0 now what's going to happen we can't divide any number by 0 it's just not possible so what is going to happen is our program is going to panic and it is going to exit so let me save and let me run this file and let me show you this in action so here it is our program panicked and we have an error which is called as zero division error division by zero so this is an example of runtime errors there are no visible errors inside the code but whenever we are trying to execute this code we have some errors so let me put a comment over here so this throws or raises an error and the type of the error is zero division error if you open up a terminal that's what we have so this is a type of error or rather this is a type of exception in the world of python let us try to expand our knowledge of errors so in this program we saw that when we panic we get an error this error is a very specific one and the name of this error is called as zero division error now python gives us an error handling mechanism in the form of try and accept blocks so let us see how we can use that syntax to catch this zero division error so let me go back and let me create a new file and i can name the file as smart divider.py so let us create our function called as smart divider again it's going to accept x which is integer y is also an integer this is returning nothing now let's see how we can do a very smart division last time we saw that when we divided by zero we got an error and that error was zero division error we can catch that by using our try and accept blocks so this is how the try and accept blocks goes so inside the try this is the code that we want to try so trying the code and in case this code fails then we can say accept and this is the place we are going to catch the specific error and we have that error then do something with the error let us see how we can fill these blocks 
so inside try let us see if we can divide or not so i can just say my number is equal to x divided by y and i want to print out my number now what happens if we get the same zero division error so we can tell python that whenever we are going to have that error i want my accept block to catch it so i can say accept my zero division error so that means whenever i get this error i want to catch that error and after catching that error i can do something with it so let me just print out some message can't divide by zero use some other number now let us go back and let us try dividing by four with zero and let us try to run this so this time we have a much better output our program is not panicking instead we get a very helpful message saying that can't divide by zero use some other number so as you can see we can handle our errors now imagine one more scenario instead of four i write as a then what happens let us run and see what's happening this time again we have some other error and this time the error is called as type error and unfortunately our program is panicking and it is terminating midway let's see how we can handle this situation as well so let me go back and let me create another file this time i will name it as really smart divider and let us start writing the code for this one let me copy and paste the code from my smart divider so let me take all of this and paste inside my really smart divider so since this is a really smart divider i can say this is my really smart divider let us have a look at the error one more time so what's happening is let me take it down so what's happening is we were trying to divide by a now a is of the type of a string and 4 is of the type of integer so both of them are essentially of different types so that's what this error is saying so we have a type error let us see how we can catch this error as well we can chain our except blocks so we can say if we have a zero division error then i want to catch it right over here but if there is a type error so i can say accept my type error let me catch it right over here and this time i can print out both x and y needs to be a number but what happens if we don't know what kind of error we are going to get that time we can use some other syntax and this is called as accept exception so now this exception class is the base class for all of the different exceptions so just as we saw in our classes dog was a subclass of animal so same thing all of these errors zero division error type error and all of these things all of these errors inherit from exception now the same logic goes over here dog is an animal cat is an animal same thing any errors that we get is also an exception and that's what we are trying to catch over here here we can also add an alias so we can say i want to catch my exception as a variable called as e then we can simply print out what happened wrong so here i can say oops something went wrong and let me print out my exception which we are calling just as e and that's it this time we have a really smart divider let's try to invoke it so i can say my really smart divider can you divide three with zero can you divide three with four can you divide three with a now let me try to save and run this file and this time we have the output so the first time we have a zero so we have the output can't divide by zero second time everything looks good so we have the answer third time we have a string so we have the output both x and y needs to be a number we are making really good progress with errors and let us learn the last missing pieces for our error handling so let me create a new file let me call it as try else and 
finally.py and let me copy all of the code from my really smart divider and let me paste into this file let let us call the function just as divider so let me take this out there are two more pieces for this puzzle so till now we have seen the try block and the accept block now let's see the else block now what happens is if this condition succeeds then the code inside the else block can be executed so inside my try block i am just trying to see if i can divide x with y if this succeeds then i can say that i want to print right over here the naming is a little weird but we can't really help it so whenever a try block succeeds we can use an else block to execute some other code as well let me add a couple of print statements just for the sake of clarity so else is executed only when try succeeds so we are trying to see if x can be divided by y or not and if that succeeds only then we want to print out the number now the last piece is called as finally now no matter what happens if the try succeeds or it fails this finally block is always going to execute so let me write a print statement right over here you may not appreciate the beauty of this block finally but just imagine a scenario that you're writing a web application and you want to write something to the database or suppose you are interacting with some other apis and you want to do some kind of a cleanup operation maybe you want to delete some files maybe you want to insert some files so no matter the outcome if the operation succeeds or fails we can have that logic inside the finally block now let me save this file and let me run this file so as you can see we always have this output of finally so no matter the outcome we always have this block let me comment one of this so that we have much more clarity let me try and run the file so we have a zero division error and since we have some error the code inside the else block did not execute but the code inside our finally block executed and we have this output right over here now let me go back and let us try with the second one let me comment this out and let me try to run this so now see what's happening since this operation is succeeding we go to the else block and inside the else block we first print these two lines so that's what is happening we have those two lines right over here and after that we are printing out the number so which is 0.75 and this block finally this is always going to execute so that's what is happening so if you try with this one you can have the same output so let me uncomment this so since we have an error our else block will not execute let me run this file for the last time so here it is we have a statement saying that x and y needs to be number the code inside the else block is totally omitted but the code inside final block is executed and we have the output right over here let us have a look at the next kind of error and this kind of error is called as assertion error now this assert statement that i am going to show you these statements are very useful in testing now we are not going to learn testing in this series but i just wanted to show you the assert statement so what i've done is behind the scenes i've created a file called as find zohan so what's going to happen right now is lewis has a list of friends and let us try to see if we can find a particular friend in that list or not so let me name the function as find zohan and this accepts a name of the friend that we want to find so this returns nothing so we can say none so this is the list of friends so i can just copy and paste it right over here now let us create our try and else blocks so normally you would write as name in my list of friends and this would give you a boolean value of true or not but what we can do is we can also use the keyword of assert so what i mean to say that i want python to assert if the name is inside the list of friends or not if the name is not present that means we can have a kind of error and this time the error would be assertion error 
so let us use the accept block to catch our assertion error so you can say oh not arithmetic i want assertion and then we can say let us print out the name not found now in case we get a match and this statement succeeds then we can also write the else block and we can print out saying that found followed by the name we can also include the final block remember that this is always going to execute let us print maybe goodbye that's it let us try searching for a couple of friends so i can say find zohan and let us try to find for zohan himself let me copy and paste and let me try to search for sara and let us run this file so we can see in the first case we found zohan so we are printing out find zohan the final block always executes we have so we have goodbye as well the second time we could not find sara and it threw an assertion error which was caught inside this except block so we have the output of sara is not found and the final block again executed so we have the output of goodbye till now we have been seeing how to catch an error but now let us see how we can actually throw an error so let me create a new file right over here this is going to be my find zohan part 2.py and let me copy and paste all of this code from here now let's get working on this file now since i am not catching any errors i don't require this try and else blocks so let me take it out now if we can't find the name inside the list of friends at that time we want to raise an error so we can say that we can't find the given value that means we can raise a value error here we can say if the name is not inside my list of friends then i can raise an error and i can raise a value error and i can also give a custom message saying that the name is not found and we can also say else in case we find the match we can simply print it out we can say found and followed by the name so let me save it and let me try and run this file so the first time we have a match so our program will not panic but the second time we don't have a match and our program will panic with an value error so let's see that in action and here we have it the first time we could find a match so we have an output but for the second time our program panicked and it threw the value error which you can see right over here so we have a value error followed by our message saying that sara is not found well this brings us to the end of this section as well if you want to learn more about errors you can go to this link so this is all of the files from github go inside this folder error handling and go to this file readme i have put up a reference right over here you can visit this link to learn more about errors and that's it for this one and i will catch you in the next section welcome to a brand new section this section is all about learning packages packages are used to organize our code so let's see how to create some packages but before that let us see a couple of examples where we have used them for example inside our game we have been importing a random int from random and also enum and auto from enum what this means is we are importing something that is useful from us from a package or a module and you can see this gives a very nice organization so it's very clear from my random module i'm importing something random from my enum i'm importing something as enum so you get a lot more clarity inside your code so let me go inside my 08 packages folder and inside of this let me create a new folder the name of this one is 01 local modules 
for the sake of clarity i am going to open this newly created module inside a new code editor window so i can just go inside this i can say 08 packages and i want my code editor to open 01 local modules in a new window so here we are if you just hover you can see i am inside my folder 01 local modules suppose you are taking a maths class and you have to do a lot of calculations and this calculations involve squares rectangles circles and so on so let's see how we can divide all of this functionality by using our modules let's say we have to do some operations on a circle so let's create the first file let me call this as circle.py and let me create a class of circle and let us create the init method so i can say define my init this takes a self and this also takes a radius suppose the radius can be a float value this returns nothing and inside we can say self dot radius is equal to my radius let us also create the str method so i can say my str would be myself and this returns a string here i can return saying that my radius is my self dot radius now in the same class you also have to deal with rectangles so in order to organize our code we can create another file called as rectangle we don't have to club all of the functionality inside a single file so let's do that so right over here let me create a new file called as rectangle.py and let us create the class for rectangle let us create one more file for dealing with squares so i can create another file called as mysquare.py and uh, let me just copy and paste from rectangle so let me paste it this becomes my square this becomes just my side i don't need this and uh, my side is equal to my side this becomes my square and i can just say that this is my side by my side and that's it oh i forgot to put a colon so so what we did is we segregated all of the functionality into different files now technically all of these files are called as modules inside python we may call them as files but they are identified as modules so what we can do is we can import functionality from these modules so let's say we have a file called as geometry and from that module of geometry we can import all of these functionalities and we can work with them so let me show you all of these things in action so let me create a file called as geometry.py and here i can say from my module of circle i want to import the class of circle same thing we can do for rectangle and square so i can say from the module of my rectangle i want to import my rectangle and the last one from my module of square i want to i want to import square so what we are doing is we are simply importing the things that we want to work with now this file circle rectangle and square they can have multiple functions or they can have multiple classes but we just need to import the things that we want to work with so let us create a circle maybe the radius is phi let us create a rectangle so i can say my rectangle let me give some random values then let us create a square let me give some random value as well and then we can simply print them out so this is my c and this is my rectangle and this is my square let me save it and let me try to run this file so as you can see we have the right output first one is a circle with a radius of 5 
then we have a rectangle and then we have a square. So in this example, what we did is we created different modules. But if you look closely, square, rectangle and circle, all of these things belong together. And we can create a package, which I will show you in the next video. We just saw how to create different modules. And in this video, I will teach you how to take all of the common models together and how to create a package out of it. You must have noticed that we have a couple of additional files. Let me take it right over here. So this was the folder that we created in the last video. And you can see we have multiple different folders. One of the first folder that you can see is for this one. This is called as pycache. You don't have to touch this folder. This is just a mechanism by Python to speed up your code. Just let it be there. Now for this video, let me just copy and paste this folder. And let me rename this to 02 package. And also let me open up the folder inside a new window so I can say code 02 package. So here we are. So this is the exact same code that we created in our last video. Now what happens is circle, rectangle and square, all of this are similar. All of these are shapes and we can organize our code in a much better way. So let's create a package which is called as shapes. So packages are nothing. They are just a special kind of directory. So let me create my directory and let me name it as shapes. After this, I'm just going to copy my circle inside my shapes. Yes, I want to move. Same thing for my rectangle and my square as well. So let me just drag all of these files inside my folder of shapes. Yes, I want to move. Now we need just one more file to declare that this folder is an package and not just an ordinary directory. The way to do that is by creating a file and the name of the file is very important. The name of the file is underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot py. When Python sees this file, it considers your directory to be a package. Now let's see how we can import all of this circle, rectangle and square in our file of geometry. So here you can see we have a couple of errors and that's because we have moved all of this code inside a new package and the name of the package is called as shapes. So here we have to say that from my package of shapes, I want you to go to the model of circle and you can say that by putting a dot. So this means from my package of shapes, I want you to go to the model of circle and inside the model of circle, I want you to import my class of circle. Same thing will go with the rectangle. So here I can say shapes dot rectangle and this also goes to my shapes dot square just save a file and that's it if you try to run the file here you can see we have a proper output there is one more concept that i wanted to explain in this video so what's happening in this video is shapes is an isolated directory or you can say it's an isolated package which has certain functionality and we have created a file called as geometry and this file is interacting with our package of shapes. So conceptually, you can call this file as your client and the package of shapes as your API. So what we are doing is we have created a client file which is interacting with our API. It's a very simple concept. Now let us see how we can import functionality from within a package itself. So let me copy and paste this folder and let me call this as 03 and local package and let me open this folder in a new window so I can say code 03. Now suppose you are inside your package of shapes and inside this package if you have to work with any of the modules how would you do it? Let me show you with a small example. Suppose we have a file called as shape.py and inside this file, if you want to import circle, rectangle and square, you must be thinking that we can simply say from rectangle, I want to import rectangle. 
well you are partially right but not entirely right the way to do it is by putting a dot right over here so this means that from my current package so this dot means my current package from my current package i want you to go to my module of rectangle and from that module i want you to import rectangle let's do the same thing for circle so i can say dot circle i want to import my circle and also i can say from dot of square i want to import my square now let us go to our client file and let's see how we can interact with this file so let me go back to my geometry.py now this syntax is perfectly fine it's going to work but let us use our newly created file so what we have done is we have created a file called as shapes.py and we have imported all of the other modules inside this file so here what we can do is we can simply say from my package of shapes i want to import the module of shapes so this shape means this module right over here and here we can say i want the circle which is inside my module of shapes and that's it let me copy and paste it everywhere let me paste it here paste it here and that's it let me save it and let me try to run this file and we have the right output let's see if we can further improve our code so i'm going to copy this folder and paste it one more time and let me rename this to 04 package underscore in it and let me open up that folder in a new window so my code 04 okay so here we are so what we were doing in the last video is we created a new module called as shapes and this module was importing the functionality from all of the other modules but we can do better instead of creating a new module we can simply take all of this imports let us copy them and let us put all of these things inside my init file that's it just save it and i can get rid of this file so let me just delete this it's not required now let us go back to our client file so this is our geometry here we can simply say that i just want to import shapes and that's it just save a file and everything should work just as before so let me try to run this file and still we have the right output so what's happening is we are just importing the entire package and since we have all of the modules which are imported inside our init method we can have access to all of them right over here so this init method just acts like a constructor for your entire package so it's similar to our classes we were using the same naming convention to have a constructor for our class the same thing goes over here but here we are constructing a package instead of a class and that's about it i am so excited to see you in the last section in this last section we have two projects the first one is for a cache register and the second one is obviously is going to be our game but this section marks a fundamental shift till now we have been thinking and writing with our types but this time we would be seeing how we can organize the code in different layers just in the last section we saw how we can create packages packages was one way of organizing our code but now let's try to think beyond our packages let's try to think more about in the architecture point of view now this concept may sound a little alien but by the time we are finished with our projects this concept would be much clear to you for now let us concentrate on the first project so this project is all about a cache register but before we can jump in and just start writing our code i want us to take some time and let us think how we can design this application so i want you to take back to the concept of voc dtp so this is a very simple concept which i propose for your learning so this concept stands for your visualize outline code so this is your phase number one once you're done with the first phase the second phase would be debug test and polish let us try to see one concept at a time so this is going to be our problem statement we simply want to make a simple cache 
register. Suppose you have a shop and you want to create a software for your cash register. So basically we just want to implement at what's happening at our checkout counter. Just try to imagine what's happening over there. Normally you would hand your items to the cashier. The cashier would scan the item. He will generate an invoice. The cashier would accept the payments and he will hand over the products to you. So out of all of these things, let us just try to concentrate on the cash register. So let us go to our first phase, which is this one, visualize, outline and code. Inside this phase, the first step would be to visualize. Let us try to visualize how our application would look like. Let's try to imagine what's happening inside the cash register. As soon as the cashier scans an item, an item is added to the invoice. Now what happens if the customer wants to change the quantity? The cashier can simply update the quantity. And what happens if the customer changes his mind and he wants to drop an item? Then simply cashier can delete the item from the invoice. The next thing that I want you to think is an item can also have different components such as a discount, offer, tax which can be added to the invoice. Now just to help you visualize how our code will look after implementing our cash register, I have created a nice dictionary. So let me show you. This is how our final outcome should look like. Let me zoom out a bit. Okay. So this is our final outcome. If you watch closely, it's not complicated. It's just a dictionary structure. We have a couple of keys and we have a couple of values. Let's see what keys do we have. The first key is for the customer. The next key is for the invoice total. The next one is for the items and the last one is for the purchase date. Now let's see at the values. The value for the customer is a dictionary itself. The value for the total is a float. Now here for the items, it gets a little more interesting. This bracket to this bracket, this is the value. And inside this value, we again have dictionaries. So these are the different items. So we have one item for an apple. The next one is for an egg. Next one for milk. And inside these items, we can add different components such as your discount, your quantity and your subtotal. And for the purchase date, we simply have to display the date of purchase. That's very easy. Now, the thing is, I could visualize this data structure just because I have some practice. But the same thing can happen with you. When you practice a little bit more, you can visualize this design even before you can start coding. Let us go to the next step. Let me zoom in again. Let us go to the next step, which is outline. Here, what we are trying to do is we simply want to outline our structure. So if you see right over here in this step, we have a couple of different objects. First one was for the customer, for the invoice total items and so on. So let us try to outline what components or what classes or what objects we would require inside our application. So here I am inside the next step for outline. Obviously we require a customer. The next thing we require is the item that the customer is buying. And the next thing which I have already explained, we require an invoice entry. Why do we require a separate invoice entry is because different items can have different discounts or offers or they could have some kind of taxation. So for the sake of simplicity, let us call this item as invoice item. So this means once we have the item inside an invoice, it will have a slightly different structure. And finally, we have a place called as cash register. So this object keeps a record of everything that is happening on the counter. So let's try to summarize the objects that we are going to require. So we need a customer, we need an item, we need one more for the invoice item. And the last one, obviously we require a cash register. So till now we have much more clarity about our application and the different objects that would be going inside our application and you would be tempted to just open up your code editor and start writing your code. But I want you to hold your guns. Let's try to do a little bit more planning. So before we can write the code, let us try to describe how our objects. So that means let us try to visualize how all of these objects 
would look like in the world of Python. So let's see, I've created a couple of diagrams for you. This is how our customer would look like. Our customer would require a couple of instance variable. It could also have some methods and the type of them. And obviously our customer needs a first name and last name. The type of this one is obviously is going to be string. And for the sake of customer, we don't require any methods. Now let us go to the next object or the next class. So this class is for the actual item itself. We need some kind of an identifier so that every product needs a unique ID. So we can have an ID as our instance variable. Then we also need a name for an item. Then we also require a price. In this case, let us keep the type as a float because we may have some decimal places as well. The next one is a little more interesting. We also need one instance variable for the measurement unit. Here the question is, how do you measure the product? It can be in kgs, grams, liters, etc. So we need some kind of a unit that will describe how to measure this item. Now let's go to the next object or the next class. This is our invoice item. This class is pretty simple. It has to accept one item. So I have created one instance variable for the item. And since there can be some kind of a discount, we need one more instance variable for a discount. And the customer can purchase in multiple quantities. So we have one more instance variable for quantity. Now for this class, we require one more method and that is to have our subtotal. We need some small maths over here we need to figure out how much is the discount and how much is the quantity so each item can have a different subtotal and that's what we are trying to calculate inside this method let us go to the next and the last class that we require and this one is for our cash register so this class is going to record everything that is happening inside our shop so let's have a look at the different instance variables first obviously it needs to know who is the customer that is making the purchase. It also needs to know the different items that are being purchased. It also needs to record the purchase date. And here you must be thinking that we require one more instance variable to display the invoice total. Well, you're right. But instead of just creating an instance variable, we are going to create a method called as get invoice total. The reason is we have different items and different items have different subtotals. So let us use this method to calculate the total of all of the subtotals. This is more of a convenience feature. Now let's see what are the methods this class is going to have. Obviously at the cash register, you can add an item, you can update an item, you can remove an item. And at the last, we can also display our invoice. So till this time, we have much more clarity on our application. We have a nice outline in place. We know which classes or which objects needs to go inside our application. We know what instance variables are required, the type of them, the methods that are required for all of these things. So we have a much better design and a much better clarity with us. And now we can think of writing all of these things inside our code editor. But before we can do that, I just wanted to show you one more thing. So the document that I have put together, this is technically also known as a unified modeling language diagram. Well, to be precise, this diagram is a little bit different from the document that I have put, but you can go to Google and check it out. I have left the links in the readme file. And in fact, FreeCodeCam has a full course on unified modeling language. You can click over here to have the link for this one. The next thing is just to translate all of this document inside the code. And I have just shown you once we are done with our code, the cache register would look something like this. So this is what we are trying and going to code. And this structure that we are going to code can also be imagined to be a data structure. So now we get it. There is nothing big about data structures. It is just a way to represent our data. Here you can see that we have a custom data structure of the type of cache register. In the next video, we will actually start writing the code and I will see you then. Now let's get going. What I've done is I've created a folder called as 09 projects. And inside this folder, I've created one more folder called as project one cache register. And I also have this file 
inside my project so let me open up this project in a new window so i can say code and here it is so now let's start writing our code let us see our outline here you can see that we have four different objects that are required so let's start with one of them at a time let us create the first file for our customer so it's going to be customer.py this is going to be class of customer and let me define my init method it's going to be self and let us go back to the document and here we can see we already know the instance variables and the type the two variables would be first name and the last name let me just collapse my sidebar so let's create the init method for the first name and the last name so let me go over here so my first name is a string my last name is also a string and this returns nothing here i can say that my self dot first name is equal to my first name and then my self dot last name is equal to my last name let us create an wrapper method for this as well so let me say self this always returns a string and uh, this can return a very simple string saying that this is a class for customer let me add some documentation for the class as well okay so this is the class for the customer details now let us create the str method so this takes in a self and returns a string so we can say i simply want to return self dot first name and i also require my self dot last name let us go back and see which is the next item so the next object that we want to create is for an item so let me open up my sidebar let me create a new file called as item.py and uh, let's see what are the different parameters required so item requires four different instance variables id of the type of integer name string price float and measurement unit which is going to be a string so let me go back to my file of items.py and i can say my class of item let me add some documentation then let's create our init method so i can say my init self the first one was the id the type is integer the next one was name the type is a string next one was price the type is a float the last one was measurement unit this is going to be our string this returns nothing let us create the instance variable so self dot id is equal to my id then self dot name is equal to the name self dot price is equal to my price and self dot measurement unit is equal to my measurement unit let me add a small comment over here so our measurement unit could be a kg or ml or so on next let us create the repr method so i can say wrapper self returns a string and i can say return that this is a class of item next let us create the str method so str self this returns a string and you can say return then we can put the name of the item and let's display the price so let's say it's going to be dollars and uh, it's self dot price per unit so we can say self dot measurement unit let's go to the document and see which is the next thing that we want to create so the next thing is invoice item things get a little more interesting from here if you see the instance variable the first one is an item but the type is an item so please keep that in mind and for this class we also have a method called as get subtotal and this method returns the subtotal after adjusting for the discount and for the quantity so let's create one more file right over here let me call it as invoice item.py let me collapse my sidebar and let's say this is going to be class of my invoice item let me add some documentation let's create the init file init self the first argument is for an item and the type is 
item but this is not going to work because we don't have item in this file let us import it from the module so we can just go right over here and we can say from the module of my item i want to import the class of item now this will work the next argument was for quantity and the type was integer the last one is for discount the type is a float here we can do one more trick we can assign the values right over here so that means if the user does not provide an argument for discount that means by default the discount would be assigned a value of zero so this is a very convenient feature of python now this is going to return none self dot item is equal to my item self dot quantity is equal to my quantity self dot my discount is equal to my discount now let's see what else we require so we also require a method called as get subtotal so let's create that method but before that let us create our wrapper and str method so let me write my wrapper takes a self returns a string and it can return saying that this is a class of invoice item the next is for my string takes the self and returns an str and let us create a nice string for this so we can say the item and uh, let us display the self now here i want to display the name of the item and we can get the name of the item through our type of item so we can say self dot item dot name so if you go to the definition of item you can see we have an instance variable of name so this is what we are trying to refer right over here next we can say the quantity and let us display self dot quantity then let us display the discount so we can say this is dollars and it is self dot discount we can also display the subtotal we have not yet created this but we will create it shortly so let me write it first and then we will create it so i can say subtotal would be self dot get subtotal remember we have not yet created this method but we will create it shortly and uh, let's do one more small trick over here let us display only two decimal places we can do that by using the syntax so we can say colon and we just want two decimal places for our float uh, now this line looks a little longer so let us try to divide it so let me take this line and let us put a bracket opening one and the closing one let me take it inside and uh, let me cut all of these things till here and let me go to the next line and let me paste it over here okay so this looks much better now this is complaining because we don't have this method till now let us go and create this method so we can say define get subtotal this just takes the self and this returns the float now let us see how we can get the subtotal what i'm going to do is i am going to use a very simple trick in fact i'm going to define a private member right over here so let me put up a comment saying that this is a private member let me call it as self dot underscore sub total now remember since i want this variable to be kept as private that's why i'm using underscore right over here now python does not have a concept of private and public but this symbolizes to other developers that we want to keep this variable as private now let's just calculate the subtotal which is pretty easy so we require the price from the item multiplied by the quantity and minus the discount now let us go back to this method get subtotal and we simply have to return it so i can say self dot subtotal the reason why we are doing all of these things is i don't want any other developer or any other user to accidentally change my subtotal i want it to be kept as private that's why i'm using this method you can also create a property called as subtotal which is also a valid solution you can definitely do that but right now for the sake of simplicity i'm just creating a private member let us go back to the document and see what is next so the next one that we want to create 
is for the cache register itself. So this is the cache register. Note the types that we have over here. Customer is of the type of customer. Then we have the next instance variable items. The type is an dictionary. Then we have the purchase date. The type is date time. And we have a couple of methods on this as well. Let us create a new file right over here and call it as cache register.py. Let me collapse my sidebar and we can say my class of cache register. Let me add some documentation that this is the cache register for each customer. Then we can define the init method. So self. So as we just saw, the first argument is for the customer. The type is customer. We also need to import customer, which we will do shortly. We also need to have one more for the items and uh, that is a dictionary and we need one more for the date. But before we can finish all of this definition, let me first go and import customer. So I can say from the module of customer, I want to import my customer. Now let me go down over here. This returns none. Here I want you to wait and think how to create the instance variable in this case. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to accept items over here. Instead, let us create an instance variable directly. First, let us say self.customer is equal to my customer. Here we can say self.items is equal to an empty dictionary. Just imagine before purchasing anything, the basket is always empty. So that's what we are saying. This has to be items. So that's what we are saying. Since we don't have any items inside our checkout, that's why let us assign an empty dictionary to it. But here, how do we define what are going to be the keys and what are going to be the values of this dictionary? Let us write the type hint right over here. Items is my dictionary, but what are the types? Which is the key and which is the value? Let us go back to our design document and try and see what we exactly want. This is a small trick right over here. If you see the design of items, items is actually a dictionary. And inside this dictionary, we have the key is of the type of a string. So let us go back to our definition right over here. And we can say the key is going to be of the type of string. Now let's see what is going to be the type of value. So let us go back. The value is of the type of invoice type. So if you remember inside the invoice item, we have fields for the discount, name, quantity, and we are also calculating the subtotal. So what we can do is inside the cash registry, we can have the value, which is of the type of invoice item. So I can say invoice item. Let us go up and let us also import so that we can use it. So I can say from my module of invoice item, I want to import the class of invoice item. So remember, whenever we are creating these items, the key is always going to be the string. So if we just go back to the design document, here it is inside the items, the key is always going to be the name of the item and the value is always going to be of the type of invoice type. Let us go back to the class. The next one that we want is for the purchase date. Now we have already seen it earlier. We can automatically create the purchase date by using our date time library. And that's what we are going to do in this document as well. First, let us go and import. So I can say, I can say from date time, I want to import my date time and let us create an instance variable. We can call it as self dot purchase date. And we can generate this automatically by using date time and we want today's date time. So we can just say now let us go down and let us create the wrapper and the str method. So I can say um, this is my REPR self returns a string and I can say return that this is a class of cache register. Let us also define an str method. We can say self, it returns a string. Here we can just return and here we can say first I want to display my customer. So let us display my customer. Now what's going to happen right over here is we are simply calling self.customer 
and if you go to the customer so let me open up my customer file the str of customer file returns a string in this format first name and the last name so whenever we are printing this customer by default we will get the first and the last name together we don't have to say customer dot first name and last name it's not required next let us also display the total number of items so we can say total items and we can get that from the length of our items so let us go back to the document here it is so items is a dictionary we have three keys apple egg and milk so that means we have a length of three till now we have been using length with list but we can also use length with dictionaries as well and when you use length with dictionary it's always going to count the number of items. So that's what we want right over here. So total items is the length of my self dot items. Let us now implement the different methods for this one. Let us see which methods we require. So let me scroll a little up. So we require methods to add, update, remove and so on. First, let us see how we can add items to our cache register. So let us go back. Let us create a new method called as add item. By default, the first argument is self. Now let's see which are the arguments we need to accept. If we have to add an item, we need to know what's the item. So the first argument is going to be an item. The type is going to be an item. Let us go and import item as well. So I can say from my model of item, let me import my class of item. Let us go back to this method. Now, since we know which is the item, we also need to know how much is the quantity. So this is going to be an integer. And we also need to know how much is a discount. So discount is going to be a float. We can do one more trick over here. If quantity and discount are not given, we can set some default values. So by default, the discount would be zero. And by default, the quantity will always be one. So this returns a none. So let me write none over here. Let me add some documentation and let us see how we can write the body of this function. Now, the first thing is we would like to add an item to a card only if it is not existing. If we already have this item inside our cache register, we can simply update it. We don't have to add it. So the first check would be for this one. So I can say so I can say if my item dot name not in my self of items first let us type it out and then i will explain what's happening so let us go to the next line here i want to create a new item but if you scroll up the key is a string the value is an invoice item so that's what i am going to create right over here if you find it a little confusing just go with the flow and after we are done typing this function i will explain what's happening so here i want to create a new item is equal to the type is an invoice item so create an instance of my invoice item and let's see what it takes it takes an item quantity and discount that we already have right over here we just need to pass all of those inside so the first is for the item second is my quantity third is my discount the next thing that i want to do is i want to set the key and value pairs again let us first type it out and then i will try and explain so i can say my self dot items now here the key is going to be a string so this is the part that we are working on the key is the string and the value is the inverse item so if you refer the document i want the key to be the name of the item so that's what we are going to do right over here let us go down and we can say that the key has to be the name of the item and the value is the new item which we just created now let us go to the next line what happens if this item is already existing inside our registry so we can say else we simply want to print out we can say item dot name already in cart you want to update instead let me take out one more extra comma we don't require this one 
Now let me try and explain what's happening right over here. Let us go back to this document. Now let's see how the logic goes. So suppose this is my IPython shell. Let me create my cache register. For now it can be an empty dictionary. So this is all good. Now let us go to this line. Our cache register has one key which is called as item and the value is of the type of dictionary itself. So let us do that over here. So we can say for my register, I want to create one key which is called as items. Sorry, it has to be items. And this is an empty dictionary. Let us try to print it out. So this is how our register is looking right now. We can also use the if and in syntax when working with our dictionaries. Suppose we want to check if our dictionary has one key which is called as items or not. So we can say items in register and that is true. Let us check for customer in the register. So that's false because we don't have a key called as customer inside the register. We can use the same syntax when referring to items as well. Remember items is also a type of dictionary. Let us assign some values to these items and then we can check for the if and in conditions. Let me copy all of this. I just want this one and we can say for my directory of register, I want you to go to my directory of items. Now what we can do is since this is a directory, we can also create new keys and new values over here. So here I can say I want to create a new key for my apple and the value is this one we just copied right over here. So let me just paste it over here. So this is the value and that's it. Let me just clear all of this. Let us try to see how the register is looking right now. So this is how it is looking. Inside the register, we have a key called as items and inside the items, we have Apple as of now. Let us copy and paste one more product. This one, so let me copy this. And we can use the same syntax. So I want to say register is a directory. I want you to go and find the key of items here. Let us create another key by the name of eggs and let us assign a value of this thing to it. And that's it. Let me clear it and let us see how our register is looking now. So here we have it. First we have an apple which is right over here and then we have an egg. Now let us check if a particular product is inside our items or not. So we can say apple in my register. I want to access my dictionary of items and in this dictionary. So from year to year, we want to see if we have any keys called as apple. We do have. So the answer of this one should be true. And that's it. We have the answer of true. Let us try to search if we have milk inside our items or not. So let me just go and change this from apple to milk. False. We don't have milk inside our items. Now if I just flip the statement. So if I say milk not in. Now let's see what we get as the response. So the response is true. Milk is not in my registry. Now since my milk is not there inside my register, only then I would like to add it. If it is existing, then I would simply like to update it. Now let us go back to our code and try to relate what's happening. So let us have a look at this line at line number 24. I am just trying to check if an item is existing in our items or not on line number 26. So items is our dictionary. The key is going to be the name of the item. So that's what I've taken right over here. And we are assigning this item to the key that we just created. And we have a beautiful structure in place. But this function is not yet complete. The moment we add one item, we also need to update our total 
otherwise our logic would be wrong so let's see how to do that in order to store the total inverse value we would also require one more additional instance variable so let us create one private this time so we can say this is a private member and i can say self dot invoice total initially let us set it to zero i want the type to be a float instead of an integer now what happens right over here whenever we are adding an item we also need to increase the invoice total that's pretty simple so we can simply say self dot underscore invoice total plus equal to and we can say my new item dot get subtotal remember when we created this invoice item we implemented this method to calculate the subtotal and why do we need this method because we have to adjust for the quantity and discount and that's what we are using right over here so this method gives us the subtotal for the new item which we simply want to add to our invoice total but the issue is this method is not reliable what happens if we have a typo instead of plus we have a minus or we need to do some other validation logic before we can increase the total the answer is let us create one function that will increase the subtotal so let's create one method right over here so we can say increase the invoice total the first argument would be obviously the self now let's see what argument should we take if we go down we can get the subtotal if we have the access to our new item the type of this new item is an invoice item so that's what we need to get right over here so this function accepts an item which is of the type of invoice item and this returns nothing let us add our documentation saying that this increments the total invoice value each time an item is added let us go down and let us take this line this is what we are exactly doing right over here let me paste it and let us change the name of the variable because the variable we are calling it as just the item over here so this is the item let us go below and use this newly created function here we can say i want to self dot i want to increment my invoice total and i simply need to pass the new item inside of this so new item the last modification that i want to do over here is i want to keep this method as private i don't want any other developer to accidentally change my logic let us go down and let me update this syntax as well now we have a beautifully typed and a much more stable code and while we are here let us create one more method to decrease or decrement the invoice total whenever we are deleting an item from the register we would also need one method to decrease the subtotal so let's do it right now let me copy and paste all of this the name changes from increment to decrement this also changes to decrement and this becomes removed and this becomes minus equal to and that's it let us create the next method to update our card the logic is somewhat similar to this one so let me copy and paste all of this this has to be update let me change the documentation so this becomes to update an existing item and this one becomes not in the card and do you want to purchase instead now let's see the logic for this one we can update an item only if it is existing so let's do that right over here so let us change from not in to just in so if we have that item only then let us try and update it but before we can update that item we need to get the old item back and we also need to decrease from the invoice total so here we can say that my old item is equal to my self dot items and i want to retrieve a specific item and this item would be my item dot name so let us go back to our ipython and let's see what's happening over here we are just trying to retrieve a data so this is our existing register 
and suppose we want to get all of the details for X. Suppose we want to update the discount or the quantity and so on. Before we can update, we need to retrieve it first. So I can say my egg details. First, I want to go to my register. Now, since this is additionally, I want to access my key and the name of my key is items. And inside items, I want to access another key. This time, the name of the key is X. You can see right over here, we have a key called as X. So this will retrieve the value for this one. Let us see what's happening. Oh, there is a syntax error. So this has to be a square bracket. Let us try to print the egg details now. And we have the details in place. And that's what we are doing right over here. We are simply trying to retrieve an item from its key. Now remember, the keys are always string values. So if you go right over here, you can see item is a dictionary and the key is a string. This string is the name of the item. So that's what we want. After we have the old item, we also need to decrement its value. So we can say self, I want to decrement the value and I simply need to pass an item. So let us pass just the old item. On the next line, we are going to create a new item with the updated quantity and discount. And we are going to add that item back to our register. So all of this logic remains the same. Let us go to the next part and let us see how we can delete an item. But first, let me go back to my IPython shell and let me show you how to delete an item from a dictionary. Let me clear all of this and let us print our register one more time. So you can see register has a key of items and inside these items we have two other items. One is for apple and one is for our X. Suppose we want to delete apple. Let's see how to do that. The way to do that is by using a keyword called as delete. And after this, we simply need to specify which key we want to delete. So I want to say I want you to go to my register. From register, I want you to access my items and once inside my items, I want you to delete my key of Apple and that's it. Now, if we try to print a register and you can see we have deleted Apple. Let's use this syntax right over here to delete an item from our register right over here. Let me copy and paste all of this. Let me take a little up. The name is remove. We don't need the quantity and the discount. We just need to know the item that we are supposed to delete. Let me update the documentation. So this is going to be removes item from our cache register. We don't require this as well. Now let's see the logic. We can delete an item only if it is existing. And that's what we are checking over here. So we need this logic in place. Since we are not creating any item, we can delete all of these things. Here we are retrieving an item. The next line, we are decrementing the invoice total. Now we simply have to delete it from our dictionary. And we have already seen the syntax. So we can say, I want to delete from my items. And the key would be my item dot name. And let us see what else is remaining. Let me go back to my document and uh, we have to implement these two methods get invoice total and display which are pretty simple let's create the first one we can say get invoice total this takes a self and this returns a float let me add some documentation and here we simply have to return self dot underscore invoice total the last one is to display our invoice. So let us create some pretty looking output. So I can say display my invoice takes the self and it returns nothing. Let us try to visualize how our invoice would look like. Now, this is the code from my GitHub repository. I'm inside my projects and project number one. If I run this file, I have a output and uh, 
this is how our invoice would look like so on the first line we would like to have a nice separator followed by the customer details and followed by the date of the purchase so let us go back and let us do all of these things here we can create a nice separator line by using a print statement and i would just like to say that this is my separator multiplied by 70 times so what this is going to do it is going to repeat this symbol for 70 times uh, before this let us insert a blank line so we have a nice spacing in place next let us see what we want we want the customer details and the date so we can just go back and here on the next line i can simply say i want to print self and if you see our str method that's what we are doing right over here so this is our string method customer and followed by the total items and uh, that's what we want right over here the next line is for the date so let us go down and on the next line we can say i want to print my date and we already have it so i can say self dot purchase date now remember in some of the earlier videos we formatted this date and time according to the month day and the year that's what we are going to do right now as well so i can use the method called as string format time and let us give us a format so this format stands for the month the day and the year let's see what we need next next we require one separator and after the separator we require all of the items so let's get back and let me copy this line from here let me change the separator from plus to a dash and the next line we want to print all of the items that's pretty easy so i can just say for my item in my self dot items dot values let us print out the item and this has to be brackets because we want to get the values out of our dictionary next let us see what we want so we require one more separator total price and one last separator so let's do that let me copy and paste this right over here on the next line we can see that my total price would be in dollars self dot get invoice total and let us display only two decimal points so i can say colon and i want two decimal points for my float and uh, that's it let us go back and check oh no we require one more separator so let me copy this and paste it right over here now we have a way to display our invoice as well we are using multiple print statements but if you want you can use a template or you can also use a multi-line string as well but this is much more simple for now now let's get back to our document so we have everything in place let us check what's remaining so code we have cash register in place now we just need to find out a way to interact with our cash register so that means we just need to create a client that can interact with our register so let me create a new file let me name it as register.py so this would be our client file and here obviously first we need to import our cache register so let me collapse my sidebar and i can say from the model of cache register i simply want to import my cache register then we also need a customer so i can say from my model of customer i need customer the last thing i want is the item so i can say from item let's import item let's create the first item so let us create milk so we can say milk is an item let's give it an id of 100 the name would be just milk price could be 4.5 dollars and the measurement unit can be a liter let us create our customer as well so i can say my customer one is my customer the first name is lewis 
the last name is Zappa. Now this customer is going to the store and making a an purchase. So let us create a cash register for Lewis. So we can say this is my cash register number one. We simply have to give the customer and that is our customer number one. Let us try to print out our cash register right now. So I can say print my cash register one. Let me save it and let me try to run this file. So right now the customer is Louis Zappa and the total number of items is zero. And that's true because we have not yet added any items. So let's get back and let's make Louis purchase something. So here we can see that my cash register one, I simply want to add an item and the item I want to add is my milk. Now we can give some additional arguments as well, the quantity and the discount. Right now, let us go with the default values and let us try and save and run this file. Now we can see we have one item on our invoice. Let us go back. Let us create some more items. Let us create one as egg so i can say item the id could be 101 the name is egg the price could be 99 cents for one egg the measurement unit is for a piece then we can make one for rice we can say item id could be 102 name is rice price could be four dollars for a kg Let's create one last one, maybe for an apple, we can say item, ID could be 103. The name is apple, maybe it is for $5.67 for a kg. Now let us make Louis purchase some other items as well. Suppose Louis also wants to purchase eggs, so we can say cr1.addItems. So Lewis wants to buy some eggs. Suppose this time he is purchasing 12 eggs and for a quantity of 12 eggs, there is a discount of 50 cents. That's it. Let us save the file and let us try to run this. So this time we can see we have two items in our invoice. A little better way to display the invoice could be by using our inbuilt function. So let me take it out and let me say CR1 dot. I want to display my invoice. Now let us try to run this file. So this time we have a much better output. So we can see the customer is Louis Zappa. There are two items. This is the date of his purchase. And these are the items. Remember for the egg, we specified the quantity was 12. And there was a discount of 50 cents. That's what we have over here. Here you can see we have only one item. So the subtotal is 450. For this one, we have 12 items minus the discount and so the subtotal is right over here and right over here we have the total price as well let's try to play a little bit more with this one let's try to update one item so suppose Louis thinks that 12 eggs are like a lot and uh, he wants to buy only 10 eggs so we can say i want to update my eggs and this time the quantity is 10 but fortunately the store is in a good mood and the store is offering a discount of say one dollar so let us save it and give it a try so you see we have an updated quantity of 10 discount of one dollar and we also have an updated subtotal as well and automatically the total price also gets updated let us go back and let us try to add one more item suppose this time lewis wants to buy some rice Maybe he wants to buy three kgs of rice and there is a 75 cent discount on this one. So let me save this and let us run the file. So this time we have three items and we also have rice in our items as well. Let us go back. Now let us see if we try to add an item which is already existing, then what happens? So let me copy and paste this one, save and let us try to run the file. So here you can see we get the prompt saying that rice is already in cart. Do you want to update instead? So you can see all of our code is working beautifully. And if you see right over here, nothing is changed. Everything is just as before. Let us go back. Now what happens if we try to update an item which does not exist? So suppose we say that 
we are trying to update an item maybe we are trying to update for apple and the quantity could be 10 the discount could be zero so let me save it and let me try to run this one so again we get a nice message saying that apple not in card purchase instead and if you see the invoice it's just as before there are no changes to our items so let us go back so right over here we can say that we want to remove eggs and let us try to display our invoice after removing as well so let me copy this and let me paste right over here let me run this file so here you can see this is the earlier invoice in this invoice we have eggs and and this is the next one when we remove we don't have eggs in our invoice so you can see we can also remove an item from our invoice i also wanted to show one more trick right over here we can also create an alias for customers suppose there is a big application and there are two files and inside both of the two files we have a class of customer then we can create an alias so we can just say that i want to import customer as my customer and we simply have to update one line over here so this instead of a customer this will be called as my customer just save your file and if you try to run it everything works smoothly let us go back and let us create one more customer just for the last time so we can say my customer 2 is my customer and uh, first name is chico her surname is neutron let us create a cash register for this one as well so this is going to be my cash register for my customer number two suppose she is purchasing some milk and the quantity could be four liters here i can also use my keyword syntax so i can say my quantity would be four and uh, suppose we have a discount of ten dollars let us try to add one more item so this time she wants to buy some eggs and the quantity is 25 next she decides to update the quantity of eggs so next time the quantity is 48 now fortunately the store is offering a discount of 12 dollars on the quantity of 48 uh, chico also wants to buy some apples so let us buy some apples as well and let us display in the invoice that's it let me save the file and let me try to run this file so here we have the invoice for chico so chico has three items milk egg and apples for the milk the quantity was four liters the updated quantity for eggs was 48 and for apples it was eight and this is the total price now we have a beautiful program in place let us go back i wanted to mention one point over here if you see the code inside my github so this is the code downloaded from github my github file has a couple of more methods for example if you go to cache register i have a couple of extra methods so all of this is extra and i had to create these methods because i wanted to see the output in a dictionary format so if you go to this document i wanted to have the output in this format so that is why I had to do a couple of more work and that's the reason why you can see all of these methods but I am not going to explain all of these methods inside this tutorial if you want you can give it an attempt and try and study what's happening but to just give you a short idea I am converting everything to a form of a dictionary and finally I am exporting that dictionary to a JSON format that's why I can have a nicely formatted output now if I go to this file register so this is on my github code so here i'm using this method to json to have a nicely formatted output now if you run this file i can get the output in the way i desired i hope you learned something new in this video now this video had a lot of concepts and it was very densely packed so if you don't understand any concept you are not to be blamed it's quite natural that it will take you some time to understand maybe you have to go through this video a couple of times you will also need to have some better understanding of how to work with your dictionaries before you can understand what's exactly happening in this code. 
So this project is going to test all of your basic understanding of Python up till now. Now the next game would be much more easy to implement and I will see you in the next video. I am so happy to see you in the last part of this entire tutorial. The last part is all about our game saving Zotan and in this final project we would be actually implementing how to think in layers. First we will write all of the code and then I will try and explain why we did what we did. So for starters, I have created a folder called as project 2 saving Zortan. As you can see, it's all empty. So let me go and let me copy my file. It's right inside my section number 6. Let me copy this and let me paste inside my project number 2. Let me open up the project in a new window so I can say I want to open my project number 2. And that's it. We have a nice and clean slate to work with. And this is our existing code. Now let's begin. Till now we have seen how to organize our code in different modules. But for this game, we are going to create a package of game and that package will contain all of the logic and everything that goes for creating a nice game. So here I'm going to create a package called as game. And as you know, making a package is very simple. It's just like creating a directory. So let me create a directory. Let me call it as game. And let us create our init file. So that Python knows that this is a package. Now let me drag and drop this file inside my package. Yes, I am want to move. Now let's begin with our code. So let us get started. Let me open up this file. And let's see the first one we have for the character type. So what we want to do is we want to make our game as modular as possible. So what we are going to do is we are going to take out everything and everything goes inside its own module. So inside my package of game, let me create a module by the name of character type dot pi. I simply have to copy and paste everything. So right from here, I need the imports. Let me take all of this. Let me cut it out go to my character type and paste it let us see what's next the next one is our character so let's create one more module inside our package of game and let us call it as character.py again i simply have to cut all of this so let me take everything from here let me cut it out and go and paste right over here let us go back the next is for the superhero. So again, let us create a new file superhero.py and let me take everything from here. Let us cut it out. Go to our superhero file. Let me paste this and we can see we have a couple of errors and that's because we need to import character and character type. So let me go to the top. Now here, since we are working inside a package, we need to say that from the current package, the module of character, I want to import the class of character. The same thing for character type as well. So from the current package, I want you to go to my module called as character type. I want you to import my character type. Now, if you save all of the errors will go away. Let us go back. The next one is for a villain. So again, go back right over here. Let us create a new file called as villain.py and let us take all of these things. Let us cut it out and paste it right over here. Also, let us do our imports. So from character, import character. From character type, import my character type. Let us go back. So the next one is for the life. Let us create a new file called as life.py and let me take all of these things till, till the last, till here. Let me cut it out and paste it right over here. Let me save it. Let's go back to this file. And if you see this file is pretty much empty now. So let me delete all of the blank lines from here. I don't require all of these things. 
let me take out the documentation as well because we already know what it's all about we don't require this as well so let me go on the top so we have a much smaller file this time and let's see how we can improve even further but before we can go a little further i wanted to add a couple of more classes the first class that i wanted to add is for a player it would be so nice to have a player so let's create a very simple class for player so let me say my player dot pi this is going to be my class of player i can define my init the first is obviously the self next could be for the first name this is string next for the last name this is also a string and this returns nothing i can say self dot first name is equal to my first name and self dot last name is equal to my last name let us create the wrapper method so i can say repr and self this returns a string and it can return saying that this is a class of player let us create the string method as well so our self this returns a string so let me just return the first name and the last name so i can say self dot my first name and self dot my last name that's it and this time we are going to have one more class and that class is for the game state just imagine when we are just starting with the game we can have a different state maybe initializing when we are playing the state changes from initializing to in progress and at the last the state can change to either win or lose so we can keep a track of the state by creating a new class so let us create a new module right over here so this is going to be called as my game state dot pi for this i am going to use the enum so i can say from my enum i want to import enum and auto then i can say my class of game state which inherits from enum let me add some documentation first one we can call as initializing so set it to auto next one for in progress again set it to auto the last two would be for the win and the lost let's take a moment to review what we have done up till now we have created a module for each of the objects inside the game but if we have a look at all our modules they are basically structures for something for example character this is a structure for something character type again a structure for the types of characters game state the types of game state that we can have for player again we just have a structure the same thing for superheroes so this is just a structure for superheroes and so on so technically we can call all of these structures as schemas so schema simply represents a structure and that's it so let's create another package inside the game of package called as schemas and let us put all of this functionality inside that package so inside my game let us create one more folder by the name of schema and to make this folder a package let me create file inside of this it has to be again in it underscore underscore dot pi so let me collapse all of these things on the top level we don't have anything we just have a package of game inside the package of game we have another package called as schema now let us move all of the schemas into the right package so my character type my character game state life player superhero and villain all of these things will go inside my package of schema yes i want to move everything so let me collapse my schema right over here so inside my package of game we have three things first one is an another package of schema then our init file and last one is our game file now let us go back to our game file let's see what's next here we can see that we are retrieving all of the superheroes or we are retrieving a single superhero normally in an application you would have a database where you will store all of the superheroes and all of the supervillains 
and that database could be controlled by something which is called as a models. So just to get a feel of models, let us create one more package inside game. So inside game, let me create a folder called as models and inside this folder, let us create a init file to make it an package. Let us go back to my games file. Now what happens in an application whenever you want to interact with a database? So you can imagine all of these things to be a part of the database because this is a place where we are storing all of our data. So normally a model would do all of these things for us. So let's go into models and let us create one model for our superheroes. So this becomes my superheroes.py and let us create one more model for our villains. So this would be my file for villains.py and let us start writing our code inside of this. So first let me go to my superheroes. So let us declare a class called as superhero model and let us create the init method. Now this init method does not take any argument because we don't need anything and this returns nothing. Now for the instance variable, we can simply return all of the superheroes or a single superhero. So let's see how we can do that. We can declare an instance variable called as self.all and we can return all of the superheroes. But let's see how to do that. For now, let me assign it a blank list. Let me go back to my file of my game. Here, I just want to cut out all of this functionality for get all superheroes and get superhero. Let me cut it out. Go back to my models file and let me paste everything right over here. Now, since this belongs to the class, I want to take it inside. So let me take it inside the class. And since now these are members of the class, the first argument has to be self and here as well, the first argument has to be self. Now let's see what to do next. Now this method called as get all superheroes, it returns a list of superheroes. So this means that this is the schema of the superhero. So let's import it. Let me go to the top. Now what happens is we are inside the package of models and the schema of superheroes resides in some other package called a schema which is right over here. So here we can say from my package of game, I want to go to the package of schema and from here I want to go to the model of superhero and once over there, I simply want to import my superhero. Now you can see all of the errors are gone. Let me save this. The next thing is this is complaining because we have not given the types for this one. So self.all is going to be a list of all my superheroes. Right now it is blank, but we can easily get it from this method. So I can say this is just my self.get all superheroes and that's it. So what this method is doing is it already has the data for all of the superheroes. On this line, it is creating a list and on this line, it is returning that list. So we have access to all of the superheroes. Now what happens here is since we have an instance variable called as self.all, we don't have to expose this method to everyone. And so we can make this method as a private method. And you know, the way to make it private is by putting an underscore. So this syntax has to be updated right over here. So this also becomes my underscore. Now let us go to this one. So this has to be my self dot underscore get all superheroes. And in fact, we don't require this line at all because this time we already have a class and we already have access to all of the superheroes inside our instance variable called as self.all. So what we can do is we can take out this line and here we can simply check for the length of self.all and this also gets updated to self.all and everything is looking beautiful. Let us also create the string method right over here. So we can say define my str it takes self and it returns 
a string as well. Now let's see what we would like to display. Now since this model represents our data, we can simply print out a list of our superheroes. So let's do that over here. So what we can do is we can simply print out the names of our superheroes inside a list. Let's see how to do that. First, let us create a list for all of the names. So this can be a list of string and let me assign it to a empty value. Then let us just populate this list with all of the names of the superhero. So I can say for my superhero in my self dot all, I simply want to append to my list of names. So I can say name dot append and each time I want to append the name of my superhero. So I can say my superhero and his name. And let's see, we have an error missing written statement. Oh yes, we are not returning the list. So we can say return my list of name. Now we have one more error and this error is because the return type is a string, but we are returning a list. So let's do one thing. Let's use our formatted string so I can use my formatted string and let me put this inside my curly brackets. Now everything is looking good. Let us repeat the same thing for our villains as well. So let me copy all of these things from this file, go inside my models, then to my villains and let me paste over here. So this becomes my villain, this becomes my villain, this also becomes my villain, everything changes, this also becomes my villain, again here we have a villain, let's change this one as well and this also needs to change, so this will be villains. We don't have this method as of now, but let us go to the games file and let us copy everything right from here. So let us cut all of these things and go inside our villains model. Let me paste everything over here and let me take everything inside my class. Now, since this belongs to a class, let us add self then this becomes a private method then we need to add self over here this line needs to go this line becomes my self dot all same thing over here this also becomes my self dot all and uh, this is just for our super villains everything is looking really good so till now what we have done is we have segregated our code as per its functionality Wherever we had only the structure, all of those files went inside my schemas and where I have to interact with my database or my data, those files went inside my models. Now let us go back to our games file. So this is my game file right over here. Let us start deleting all of these things which are not required. So let me take it up. If you see, we would have a bunch of errors. Now let's try to work on this file. Now this file is all about the game and the actual logic. So this is the place where we are actually implementing the game. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to rename this file. Now since this file is all about implementation, I like to call this file as just IMPL. So which stands for implementation. You are free to name this file whatever you want. You can call this file as your logic, your brain or anything that you want. But for me, implementation makes much more sense. Now let's see what we can do inside this file. First, let me close this folder and this one as well. And let me only open this file. So this is where we are working right now. Our implementation is all about a game. So the first thing that we require right over here is we require a class of game. This class will keep a track of everything. It will keep a track of which player is playing the game. What is the game state? Is the game in progress or someone has won or someone has lost? What is the state? Who are the superheroes and who are the supervillains? And this class is also going to control all of the methods that we have defined over here. So it's going to control our attack and our win or lose as well. So let's create a class. So this class is like the implementation of the entire game. Let us create a class called as game. Let us define the 
init method it takes a self now this init method only requires a player we will just take one player and we will initialize a blank game in return so let's accept one player the type is a player now remember inside our schemas we already have a player which is right over here so let's go and import the player from our schema and we need to do one more change so this is not a single schema this is schemas so let us add an s yes we want to make some changes now since we have changed the name of the package let us go to our models so by default visual studio code is going to do this for you but if it is not happening inside your ide then make sure this is schemas and for villains this also needs to be schemas so let me go back to my implementation file so here on the top i can say that from my current package so remember right now we are directly inside our package of game so let me collapse my models and schemas so you can see our file of implementation is at the same levels as our models and schemas and game itself is a package so we can say from the current package i want you to go to the package of schemas then go to the model of player and import our player let us go to this line right over here so our init method returns nothing now let's see what kind of instance variables do we require first let me write all of the instance variables and after that we can populate them the first one would be for the player and we already have the data that's right over here self.player next i want to keep a track of the game state so i can say self.state would be my game state we will import that shortly let us create the next variable first we also need to keep a track of all of the superheroes and all of the super villains so let us create an instance variable for all of the superheroes let me get my spelling right this has to be my superheroes and we need one more variable for our villains now let's see how we can populate all of these things for the state we already have a game state defined inside our schemas so we can say from the current package go to schemas go to my game state and import my game state now let's see the first time we don't have any data so we can assign the state to initializing so we can just say my state would be game state dot initializing now let's see for the next one we can get all of the superheroes from our models so let's go and import our models as well so i can say from my current package go to my models go to my superheroes and import my superhero model let's do the same thing for our villains as well so dot models dot villains import the villain model and here we simply want to initialize it so this becomes my superhero model this becomes my villain model now just remember when we created the model so if you go over here and if you see the superheroes you can see the constructor does not accept any argument so that's what we are doing over here we are not giving any arguments because it is not required and with this we can easily have access to all of the superheroes and all of the super villains as well let us create the wrapper and the stream methods for this as well so we can say my wrapper method takes a self this returns a string and let it return that this is a class of game next let us create an string method as well this returns a string now let's see what we would like to return maybe we would like to return all of these details on separate lines so let's see how to do that so i can say i want to return a formatted string let me collapse my sidebar for a while now and let me take it up so the first thing that we want to display is obviously in the player and you can say self dot player now we want to display the state on a next line we can use a small trick over here we can say backslash and n so this is going to create a new line for us automatically and on the next line i would like to display my state so i can say the state would be my self dot 
let me put a comma here as well so on the next line i would like to display my superheroes oh i need a quote right over here so i can say my superheroes would be my self dot superheroes let me get my spelling right let me put my comma and we require one more line now since this is getting a little long let me split this so let me put a brackets and let me take it down and let me add one more formatted string right over here and this would be for our villains so we can just say that self dot our villains let us go below and let us take all of these things inside our class of games let me copy all of these things the method of attack the method of simulate attack and we also need this method of win or lose till this point i want everything inside my class so let me take it inside let me save the file and uh, now we don't need all of these things because right now we are just creating a package and we will see how to use this package in the future so let me take it out and you can see we have a bunch of errors so let's try and work with our file so let's work with this one so this is the place where the attack is taking place so i can just say this block is for the attack now since this belongs to the class of game we can write self same thing will happen with our simulate attack as well so i can just write self right over here so let me save this again this one this also has to take myself looks good now let us go back now let's see how the attack is going to take place now let's fine tune our attack logic let me put some documentation so whenever we start an attack we can change our state from initializing to in progress inside this we can say self dot state so when we start an attack it changes to my game state dot in progress then let's print out a nice line saying that start in attack and if you want to check the state we can simply print out the state as well so you can just say my self dot state so let us go down now let us have a look at this line at this line we are trying to get a single superhero but now we have this method inside our model so let me open up the file inside models if you go to our superhero now we have created a class called as superhero model and inside this class we have a method called as get superhero so let us try to reference this method right inside our implementation file so what we can write here is we can simply say that we want to go to the self dot our superheroes so remember this superhero is actually the superhero model let me show you one more time so you can see this superheroes is actually the superhero models so we can access this method right over here get superhero and that's the way we can get our superhero let's do the same thing for the villain so i can say my self dot villains dot get villain let me collapse my sidebar now let's go to this line line number 43 so since this method belongs to the class it has to be self dot now what this method is doing it is actually doing the attack so we can have a little better naming convention so we can just change the name from simulate to do the attack let me change right over here also and we can do one more thing we can mark this method as private because this is all about our internal logic no one has to know how we are doing the attack it's up to us how do we implement the logic this also needs to be my double underscore you can write a single underscore it's up to you so this simply means that this method is just private to this class now we have a bunch of other errors for superhero villain and life as well so let's import all of this and all of the errors will go away let us go to the top and here we can say from my schemas from my superhero let us import my superhero schema the same thing we can do for the villain as well so from dot schemas dot our villain let us import the villain schema and we can do the same thing from dot schemas dot my life let me import my life and let's see what's happening next
so you can see a lot of the errors have gone now this is a pretty easy error to fix we just have to import final and that's it but let's not do it right over here let us create a new file called as constants now let me explain why do we require a new file called as constants there may be times where we can have multiple constraints for our game for example let us go right over here in this method of attack you can see that we have hardwired the value right over here three so we have three over here because we have four superheroes and we have two over here because we have three super villains so we can think that all of these are simply constraints for our game but we can make our game much more modular what happens if you want to attack four times five times or what happens if we have multiple superheroes or multiple super villains we need to have a very easy method of doing all of these things so for this convenience let us create a new file inside our game inside my package of game i want to create a new file called as constants let me add some documentation you can imagine this file to be just a helper module and that's what this is doing the first one was for the number of attacks so we can just say the number of attacks and we can assign a value of 3 over here now let us go back to our implementation file and instead of hard wiring 3 over here let us import that and let us use that constant over there so we can say from current package go to the module of constants and import my number of attacks so let us go down and let us use that right over here now we can increase and decrease the number of attacks as desired let's go little down over here let us do the same thing for this one let us take it out so these values are never going to change they are going to be constants no matter what so let me cut it out let me go to my constants let me paste over here let me fix the indent now you already know that we don't require a final keyword because when we name all of this in uppercase by default my pi or our ide is going to treat them as constants so we can take this one out and this one as well and in fact we don't require string as well because our ide would be able to infer all of those things let us go back to our implementation and let us import it so let me go to the top so from constants i also need to get my winning message and also my loss message let us go down now since we already have access to winning and the losing message we don't have to do anything let me take out this line this is not required now let's see what's happening right over here here we also need to update the state of the game suppose we are winning then we can say self dot the state would be my game state dot win and in case we have lost then we can say game state dot lost so now we can keep a track of the state of the game at any given point of time there is one last thing to do in this file and that is right over here so here if you see we are using three and two because we have four superheroes and we have three super villains but what happens if we decide to add a couple of more superheroes or a couple of more super villains so let's try to make this code a little bit more modular as possible so what we want to do right over here is we can simply say i want to have the length of my self dot superheroes dot all minus of one now remember your index is always one less than the length and that's what we are doing right over here let us do the same thing here as well so i can say the length of my self dot my villains dot all and i want to minus of one the last thing to do inside this package is to create a file and let us create a file let us name it as game dot py now this file will have a single line of code so first let me write it and then let me explain what i'm trying to do so i can say from the current package I want you to go into my implementation and I want you to import my game as well as my player and that's it. So what we have done is we have created an API which means your application programming interface. So whenever some other developers have to interact with your code or if they want to play your game they simply needs access to just this one file game.py. They don't have to import 
any of these things model schemas constants implementation nothing of those things are required all of those things are our internal implementation the clients don't need to know all of the logic they simply have to consume our logic that means they simply have to consume our api so now we are getting the logic we have been creating our application in different layers so this was a layer just for our schemas models was just a layer for our database or rather data in our case and this game this file acts as our api now let us create a client file and let us play our game so outside the game let us create our client so let me call it as main.py so by convention main is always going to be the most important file or the place where our program starts and as a convention we require a function which is called as main so this is the place where python will start all of our execution so this file can also be thought as your client let me put up a documentation so this file or rather this model is just as a client it is going to consume our api game and that's it let us import our api so we can say from my package of game i want you to go to the model of game and from here i simply want you to import my class of game and player now this looks a little odd game dot game but what we can do we can improve our design with a small trick so let us go back to our package of game and let us go back to the model of game let me copy this single line and let me put it inside the init file so this init file is for the game so i can just put my init file right over here now i don't require this module let me take it out yes move to trash let me add some documentation over here so since we have this inside our init file we can simply write from game import game and player it becomes so simple now let us go back to our api file which is this one now the beauty of creating apis is with time your game is going to evolve and sometimes you may have some breaking changes so this was our first version maybe you can have a version 2 or maybe you can have a version 3 but at that time the client does not need to update his code we can refactor all of the code inside but just keep this api file the same so you see we have a lot of advantages of breaking our application into multiple layers now let's get going to the last part and let us create the main method where we can actually play our game and fortunately this is the most easiest part let me collapse my sidebar so this is returning nothing so i can say none let me put some documentation this is the place where our game begins let us create the first player so we can say my first player is my player and louis the last name is zappa now let's create a game for louis so we can say we want a game for our player number 1 here let us just check the state of the game and since we are just starting the game our state would be initializing so let us just check if that's the case or not i want to see the state of my game 1 so game 1 dot state and the last thing to do is we need to invoke our main method so let me save the file and let me try running it beautiful so as you can see we have the state of initializing and that's what we expected right now let's start with the attack so here we can say i just want to have my game one dot attack but before that let us try to print the game itself so let me say print i want to print my game one let me comment this for a moment run the file and uh, this is how your game looks like the player is luis zappa state is initializing this is the list of all our superheroes and these are all our super villains beautiful isn't it let us go back and let us have the attack first so we can say i want to have my attack and after the attack i want to see if i have winning or if i am losing let me save it and let me try to run the file amazing so we have a very beautiful output unfortunately we lost and thanos killed our avengers but it is such a beautiful experience let us go back and i want to make one last small change 
what we can do is we can create something which is called as method chaining that means what if we have a syntax like this game one dot attack and here we can just say dot win or lose so this will look so neat and nice let's see how we can do that and it's very easy to do it let me open up my sidebar now remember all of the implementation happens in a single file so it becomes very easy to find out where do we need to make our changes and all of the changes happens in this file for implementation now since we want to have method chaining we simply have to return the game so that means on our method of attack we simply want to return the game itself so i can say this method is going to return my game let me collapse my sidebar and i also need to return so at the bottom right over here let me go on the next line i simply have to say that i want to return self now in order for this syntax to work we need to import one more thing so let me go to the top the first thing that we want to do is from future i want to import my annotations now we can use this syntax let us do the same thing for our method of win or lose so this returns a game and at the bottom let me just say let me return self beautiful let me close this file and let me go to my main file we can assign the game back to our variable so i can say game1 is equal to my game1 now let us print the state one more time right over here so what's happening is we are starting with an attack and then we are checking if we are winning or losing initially the state would be initializing and after the game it could either be win or it could either be lost let me take this little up so the first thing that we want to do is we want to print the game then the status then we play the actual game and let us have the state back again so let me save this and let me play this game so here it is so this is our game right here the player is lewis state is initializing superheroes super villains beautiful then we are starting the attack after we start the attack the state changes to in progress this is how the attack is taking place but unfortunately thanos has killed avengers so our final status is game state lost let us play one more time let us see if we are winning or not no lost no lost again lost 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 oh this time we are winning it's so amazing so here you can see that when we won the game our state is game state win it's so damn amazing let us create one more player and let us play the game for the last time so let me go right over here and let me create one more player this player would be chico neutron and let us go down over here now just for the sake of nice print out let us print a blank line before the next game so here we can say my game number 2 would be my game and this time we can say my player is going to be my player number 2 and we can start playing the game here itself so we can say dot attack and after the attack i simply want to check if i am winning or if i am losing this method chaining makes our game so easy to use so let me save the file and let me play the game for the last time oh i think both of us lost chico also lost the game and uh, luis also lost the game let us play the game one more time no oh yes at least this time luis has won the game before we say we are done let us have a look at the last time now there is no more coding left i just want to show this file and this file is called as thinking in layers so let me collapse my terminal my sidebar and let me put this in my preview mode so this is the last thing that i wanted to show you let us try to conceptualize what we have learned so far in this video by making this game so what we did was we divided our application into multiple layers now let's see what we exactly did you can imagine the first layer was our data layer and the packages who are responsible for our data layer live inside the folder or rather the packages of models and schemas the visibility is private and the role is internal so what happens is whenever we want to interact with the database whenever we want to create a structure all of that code will go 
only in this packages the advantage is when we have multiple people working on the same project all of us can know where to find the data the next layer can be thought as our business logic layer and this layer is represented by our implementation and we have all of our implementation inside this file impl.py again the visibility is private and the role is internal that means we as the developer of this game or of this library only we can handle this file the next layer can be called as an api the package of game can be thought as our api remember we added a couple of files to our init method and our client can simply import all of those things from our package so essentially what is happening is our api is acting like an interface between our internal logic and our consumer so the visibility of our api becomes public and our main.py file can be thought as a client because the client simply consumes our api and i hope this gives you a much better understanding of why we divided our code so much and why we created so many packages now that was such an amazing amazing effort and i would like you to congratulate yourself this was a pretty tough and a very intense course for beginner and you definitely deserve much needed appreciation you have done an amazing job wow that was one really awesome journey and i am so happy to see you at the end of this course now remember that the course is just ending but your journey is just starting and you have to do a lot before you can really understand python the first thing that you need to do is you need to solve a lot of problems and i also have a couple of topics that you can see if you want to progress in python so and here they are so this is what you should be learning next have a look at how to handle files and folders iterators and generators form a very important part of python especially when you are working with classes and you want to create iterables so make sure you have a look at them then list comprehensions are also very useful the next point about data serialization and deserialization now this is very important when you are working with web applications where you have to convert your json data or if you are working with some other data types such as if you want to convert your csv file or excel files to pandas data frame and so on the next is decorators we already had a small look about decorators but decorators is a pretty big topic the next is about your object oriented programming in which i would like you to have a look at abstract base classes and also oops in this tutorial we saw how we can inherit from a single class but in practice you can inherit from multiple classes you can also create classes that act as an interface so there is a lot more to learn about oops as well the next point is about multi threading and multi processing and the next one would be your concurrency and async io now python has been a little notorious when it comes to concurrency but lately there have been a lot of development especially with the async io syntax so if you want to make concurrent applications in python i would suggest you to learn a little bit more about concurrency the next one is testing now without testing none of your applications are going to be complete python ships with a testing framework which is called as unit testing and there are a couple of other testing frameworks such as pytest the next would be web frameworks if you want to create web applications or if you want to create apis then i would suggest you to have a look at django flask and fast api and last if you are interested you can always try learning machine learning and deep learning so this itself is a very huge topic in python and again i can't stress enough that you have to solve more problems and finally before i say goodbye i would really love to hear from you you can visit my website or you can tag me on twitter or obviously you can check me out on youtube as well see you and let the power of python be with you